Want to speak real French from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at FrenchPod101.com. Hey guys, this is Pierre from France, and welcome back to a new lesson about French. Today's lesson is about faux amis, which is false friends in English. There are many common words in English and French, but sometimes there are some tricky ones that you have to remember. The purpose of this lesson is not to be exhaustive, but to show you the main words that you have to remember. Of course, there are many others, but here are the main ones. Let's start with the adjectives. Here, sensible versus sensible. Sensible means raisonnable or judicieux in French. You have to use those words. But for sensible, it means sensitive or receptive. So be careful. When you say, je suis sensible à l'art, je suis sensible à l'art, you have to say, I am receptive to art. When you say, mes dents sont sensibles, mes dents sont sensibles, you have to say in English, my teeth are sensitive. So to translate sensitive, you have to say sensible. And here, if you want to translate a sensible solution, you have to say une solution raisonnable ou judicieuse, which is the feminine form for judicieux. Une solution raisonnable. So try to remember this one. Next, this one is a bit more tricky. Ancient versus ancien. It's almost the same meaning, but sometimes if you try to translate ancient with ancien, it's really awkward in French. So here, you have to say antique for ancient, which means really, really old, like in English. But ancien, it means just old, like an old car, an old house, une vieille maison. So here is a kind of order between all the words that you can use in French to say old. Vieux, ancien, and antique. Vieux is old, and ancien is really old, and antique is super, super old, like an ancient history. So here, c'est une ancienne maison. You can say, this is an old house. I forgot the he, here. This is an old house. You can also say vieille instead of ancienne. But here, cette antique peau a été créée par les Égyptiens. Cette antique peau a été créée par les Égyptiens. I wrote it like in English here, but here it's like that. Cette antique peau a été créée par les Égyptiens. There is no accent. Cette antique peau a été créée par les Égyptiens. This ancient pot was created by the Egyptians. So here, be careful with antique and ancient. Let's move on to the next one, and this one is a bit complicated. Terrible versus terrible. Ce gâteau n'est pas terrible. It means the exact opposite that in English. This cake is not really good. Ce gâteau n'est pas terrible. This cake is not really good. But here, if you use c'est un terrible accident, it is quite the same meaning than in English. This is a terrible accident, a dreadful accident. Same meaning here. And there is one case that is not common anymore in French. When you say just terrible, just this word, terrible, it means terrific. But this is quite an old way to say it. You don't say it a lot in French. And maybe you will find that in French comics or in old books. So not really common with your friends. Let's move on to another one. Excited versus excité. Excited means enthusiast in French. But um, although excité can mean sometimes excited, excited nowadays, it means also horny. Like originally, the original meaning is horny. But due to the influence of English, now we also use the same meaning, the same word for the translation of excited. So when you say, je suis excité, je suis excité, je suis excité, it means I am horny, but also I am excited. So this can lead 
to a kind of confusion. So if you want no confusion at all, you have to use the word enthousiast instead of excited. Il est enthousiaste à propos de son voyage. Il est enthousiaste à propos de son voyage. He is excited about his trip. Il est enthousiaste à propos de son voyage. So here, you can also say, je suis excité à propos de mon voyage. But if you say that, it would be, because of the, the end of the sentence, everybody will understand. But if there is no context, it is better to use enthousiaste instead of excité, because there is this confusion that can happen. And speaking of confusion, here is another one. Preservative, which is an adjective in English. And preservatif, which is not an adjective in French, it's a noun, and it means condom. So please be careful when you want to say, for example, a preservative measure. If you say, une mesure preservative, it doesn't make any sense, and you will look a bit ridiculous for French people. Like, they would maybe have a smile, because they understand this meaning. So if you want to say, Preservative, please use the adjective conservateur. So here, a preservative measure, you have to say une mesure conservatrice. Conservatrice is the feminine form of conservateur. Conservateur, conservatrice. Une mesure conservatrice. Let's now move on to some other kind of words. Here are some verbs. Adjectives is the main category, but here some little categories. So verbs. When you say attendre in French, it doesn't mean attend. It means wait. I'm waiting for you. Je t'attends. But if you want to translate attend, you have to use the word assister à. There is a space between here, between assister and à. Assister à. For example, assister à une conférence. You have to say attend a lecture. Assister à une conférence. So please be careful with that. And here is another difference that personally when I first started to learn English I had really uh, had a lot of trouble learning this. Passé versus pass. When you pass an exam in English it means that you in French you have to say réussir un examen. But if you say passé an examen in French, it means that you have an exam. So this is quite difficult and please remember, so passer an examen, I forgot the R E, I forgot the R here, but it's the verb, like here it's like je passe an examen, but you have to say passer an examen with the infinitive form, so passer an examen, to have an exam, and réussir an examen, to pass an exam, so be careful with that. And then, here are some adverbs. Adverbs. There is this adverb, which is sometimes a noun in French, personne. Like, when it's a noun, it means like in English, a person or people, when it's plural. But sometimes it's an adverb in French, and it means the exact opposite, kind of opposites. Meaning, like, it means nobody. Nobody's here. Nobody's here. You have to say, il n'y a personne. So be careful, because sometimes you will be confused. But it's quite easy to know when it's a noun or when it's an adjective. If there is une personne, you know that it's a noun, because there is une. But here, there is nothing. So it means that it's an adjective. And please note that there is always this negation here. Il n'y a personne. Like it's a couple, n and person. So here, usually it's ne, but here, because of the Y, you have to say n, just n. But sometimes when you speak French, you get rid of the n here, and you just say, il y a personne, il y a personne, il y a personne. So this is a common way to speak with your friends, but the proper way to say it is with the n here. And here is another adverb, actuellement versus actually. When you want to say actuellement in English, you use currently. But when you want to translate actually in French, you have to say en fait or réellement. So here is uh, an example. En fait, 
C'était une blague. En fait, c'était une blague. Actually, it was a joke. Actually, it was a joke. And here, another example. Mon état d'esprit a réellement changé. Mon état d'esprit a réellement changé. Mon état d'esprit a réellement changé. My mindset has actually changed. So here, réellement, actually. And when you start with actually in a sentence, it's better to use en fait. En fait is a lot used at the beginning of a sentence in French. And in the middle of a sentence, maybe you would prefer to use réellement. So, en fait, c'était une blague. Mon état d'esprit a réellement changé. So now, I'm going to show you some nouns. Let's end this lesson with some nouns. When you say librairie in French, it doesn't mean li library, but it means bookshop. And library, it means bibliothèque. When you say journée in French, it's not the same as journey. It means day or daytime. But when you say journey, it means trip. So, voyage. Location in English and location. Same writing, but different pronunciation. Location is, in French, position or emplacement. But if you say location in French, it means rental. So be careful with that, especially when you read it. Then you've got this one, you probably know it, money versus money. Money is argent in French, easy word. But when you say money, it has also a meaning in French, but quite different. It can mean currency, for example, euro. L'euro est une monnaie. L'euro est une monnaie. L'euro est une monnaie. It means euro is a currency. But it can also mean change, like give me the change for the money. So here you can say donne-moi la monnaie. Give me the change. Donne-moi la monnaie. But in French you can also say sometimes change. You can translate change with change. Donne-moi le change. Give me the change. And here is a last one, but a bit tricky, but be careful. Interview, in French, with the French pronunciation, interview, versus interview. When you say interview in French, it means interview. Quite easy, right? But that's not always the case. The opposite is not true. Interview, when you say it, sometimes it means you have to say entretien. So what the difference? Interview in French, it's only for journalistic interview. So when you interview someone, like an actor or someone, or something like that, you have to use the word interview. But for other kind of interview, you have to use the word entretien. Like when you have an interview for a job, you say entretien. J'ai un entretien d'embauche. I've got an interview. I've got an, an interview. J'ai un entretien. Pour un emploi. I've got an interview for a job. J'ai un entretien. J'ai un entretien pour un travail. J'ai un entretien pour un travail. J'ai un entretien pour un travail. So be careful with that. This is, I think, a common confusion. But many French people would understand if you use, if you misuse the words. But it's better to know, right? Well. This ends our lesson for today. It was not exhaustive, but here are some examples of faux amis. I hope you really like this video. Hey guys, my name is Pierre and I'm from France and welcome to this lesson. Today's lesson will be about what not to pronounce in French. You know, French is really annoying. The way you say it and the way you write it, it's really different. And I'm here to show you that it's not that hard if you know the basics. So first, I would like to introduce you to the common silent letters. First, there is this letter, H. This is maybe the most common one. In French, H has no pronunciation. There is no aspiration, unlike English. When you see H alone, it's always silent in French. For example, in 
homme, which means man, you don't say the H. Same for haricot, which means beans, or for E, which is the French way to say um when you're hesitating. Then there is this combination, CH, and when there is this combination, you have to say it. It's almost never silent. For example, cheval, which means horse, and then échec, which means chess. But of course, in French, there are many exceptions, and there are those two words are exceptions. Echo, which means echo, like in English, and choral, which means choral, like in English. H is silent here. You have to say just the C, echo, choral. Don't focus too much on those exceptions, because um, usually it's always never silent, but if you really want some examples, just try to remember those two, because maybe they are the most common ones. But don't focus too much on exceptions again. Then, let's move on to the next letter, which is OR. This letter is quite like never silent, but in some cases, like when you see the combination ER in verbs, you have not to say the OR. It's always silent. For example, in the verb manger, which means eat, or parler, to speak, you have not to say the OR. It's always that for the verbs, which are with ER. Then you've got some other words that are using the same rule, like premier. Just try to remember this one. It means first. And here, you don't have to say the OR. Let's move on to the next letter, which is X. This one is really easy. There are three patterns that you have to remember. And then, after that, you're done. It's really easy. Those patterns are wa, o, e. You see, I don't say the X. Wa, o, e. It's always silent. Here are some examples. Voice, voix, in French, no X. Oiseau, which is the plural for birds. So, like many birds, usually you don't have X, but here it's like a plural, the plural form. And then heureux which is the adjective for happy. Many adjectives have this termination and you have to say it and you have not to say X. Let's move on to the next category, which is STPD category. It's almost always silence when it's at the end of a word. To remember that, here is a kind of little trick for you. You can think that French is stupid. And in this word, you see all the letters that are almost always silent. S, T, P, D. Stupid. So here is an example. Le petit loup est méchant, which means the little wolf is nasty. So here there is petit, you don't say the T. Loup, you don't say the P. Et, which is kind of an exception. Uh, here you see S and T. And you don't have to say it just for the verb to be. So just remember that when you see EST, this is a common question. Don't say the S and T. But usually when you see the word EST, which means EAST, you have to say it. So this rule is only when you see one letter at the end. When you see more than two letters, this is different. And then there is MÉCHANT, T. You don't say the T. But of course, there are exceptions. And here are the two main exceptions that you have to remember. When you say son, fils, you have to say the S. And then there is this little tricky word, plus. Sometimes, plus, you don't say it. You don't say the S. But when you say the, the, when you say the word plus, as more, you mean more, you have to say it, plus. So when there is the S, it means more. When there is not this S, like when you say just plus, but it's the same writing, you don't. It means less. So this is a kind of tricky word. And then there is this combination with S. S is, of, is often the mark of the plural, but sometimes it's not, and you also don't have to pronounce it. When you add it after P, 
T or D. So here are some examples. Temps, which means time. Debout, which is the plural form for um, pieces. Debout, you add the S because of the plural and you don't say, ni, you don't say T or S. And then there is D. Tu prends, which is uh, you take. And always when you conjugate verbs, you often have D and S and you don't say it. So these are the main letters that are silent. STPD, French is stupid. Then you've got some letters that are sometimes silent, sometimes they are not. So you just have to remember which words are like that. Those letters are B, C, F, G, J, L, Z. So here are some examples, like maybe the main ones, just try to remember them and then only experience will help you to know which word or not silent. Plomb, which means plumb, you don't say the B. Like the B is quite rare, usually you don't have words with B at the end of the word. Then you, you have pork, which means pork or pig. There is the C and you don't say it, pork. Then this adjective, gentil, with the L, you don't say it. But usually words that ends with an L, you have to say it. So this one is really a big exception, gentil. Clé et serre, qui and dear. There is an F, but you don't say it. But many words, you have to say the F. So remember that. Then for J, long, it means long. So in English, you have to say the G. In French, you don't say it. And then this one, Z, you often not say it in French, but sometimes you have to say it. Here, you don't say it. Che, which means like, I'm going to my place. I'm going to your place, to, translation for to. Ne which means nose, ri for rice, and assez for enough. So here are some examples that you have to remember. So, so far we've seen five different patterns, H or X if you see H alone or in ER only in verbs and in the, in the adjective premier and X in those three patterns, wa, o, e. You have to be silent. You don't say those letters. So this is the first, the three letters that are important for you to remember. And then there is S, T, P, and D, the, which is almost always silent. So this is the main one that you have to remember in addition to those ones. S, T, P, and D. French is stupid. And then you've got those letters that are more tricky, B, C, F, J, L, Z. And you have to remember some examples. And if you really have to remember one category, I think you should really remember with the D. Because there are many words with these exceptions. Let's move on to the training part. Here are some sentences. I'm going to read them and you will see which letters are not or are silent. Try by yourself before I'm going to say it. So here is the first one. Did you try? Okay. The answer is, ils ne sont pas assez grands. Ils ne sont pas assez grands. So here, there is this S that is silent. And there is this T. And this S is not silent due to the liaison, which is introduced by the, this vowel, A. In the next lesson, I'm going to deal with the French liaison, so don't worry about that. For now, it's only common silent letters. So you have to say it here, but usually it's silent, so don't worry for that. And then there is the, the Z and the D and S that are silent. Ils ne sont pas assez grands, which means they are not big enough. Ils ne sont pas assez grands. Let's move on to the next one. Did you try? Okay. The answer is, je suis heureux d'être amoureux. Je suis heureux d'être amoureux. So here, again, 
there is a liaison. Because H is silent and here there is a vowel, but don't worry about that. Here X and X, you don't have to say it. Je suis heureux d'être amoureux. It means I'm happy to be in love. I'm happy to be in love. Je suis heureux d'être amoureux. Next one, this one, is a bit longer. Try by yourself. The answer is, les chevaux courent plus vite que les bœufs. Les chevaux courent plus vite que les bœufs. Les chevaux courent plus vite que les bœufs. Here, there is an S. You don't say it. Here, there is an X. You don't say it. The T here, the S here. Even though it means more, you don't say it. Because here, there is an adjective after that. And when you say plus with an adjective, plus with an adjective, if there is no vowel, you don't say it. So here, plus vite. This S, and then B. You don't say the F, and you don't say the S. But please be careful. When there is no S at the end of B, you have to say the F, Buff. But here, you don't say it. This sentence means, the horses run faster than the cows, which is in French, les chevaux courent plus vite que les bœufs. Then, there is this sentence, try by yourself. The answer is, mes cheveux sont trop longs. Mes cheveux sont trop longs. It means, my hair are too long. And here, all the words have a silent letters. Mes cheveux sont trop longs. Mes cheveux sont trop longs. And this one now, try by yourself. J'ai pris plus de temps que prévu. J'ai pris plus de temps que prévu. So here, there is this silent S. But here, you have to say it. J'ai pris plus de temps, more time. So you have to say it. It's different, even though here it's more, but it's with an adjective. Here, it's plus alone. So you have to say it, because it means more. Then there is temps. P and S, you don't say it. And this is fine. J'ai pris plus de temps que prévu. I took more time than expected. J'ai pris plus de temps que prévu. Then the last one. Try by yourself. This one is a little bit tricky. So the answer is, à l'est du parc, il y a des noix qui ont poussé. À l'est du parc, il y a des noix qui ont poussé. So here, you can see that I have to say est, because it's not the verb to be. It's not the verb être. It's east. So in French, you have to say s and t here. So à l'est. À l'est du parc. Here again, there is a c, but you have to say it. This is not one of the words I wanted you to remember. So, parc, you have to say it. Il y a des, you don't say it, noix. Here, again, there is the pattern O-I-X, so you don't say it. Qui ont, here there is this silent T. And then, pousser. À l'est du parc, il y a des noix qui ont poussé. At the eastern part of the park, some nuts started to grow. À l'est du parc, il y a des noix qui ont poussé. So, did you try and did you manage to do it? It's okay if you don't have a perfect score. Just, it's practice. You need to learn and it's like, it's, it's normal to fail. So, you can watch this video again and try the sentences again and remember all those patterns. Bye, guys. Hey guys, welcome back for more French lessons. Today's lesson will be about la liaison française, which means the French liaison. Last time I talked a bit about it, and now we are going to get further and see all the information about the French liaison. So you know, there is only one rule. The main rule to remember is 
a silent letter. We've seen that before. A silent letter is sometimes pronounced when the following word starts with a vowel sound. This is the rule. Here is, like here are two examples. Un grand arbre, a big tree. Un grand arbre. You see there is a D which is supposed to be silent, but here you have to say it because there is an A. It's a vowel sound, A, arbre, arbre in French. So you have to say un grand arbre. So the idea is, you say this word normally, like as if this, this letter was silent, un grand arbre. Then you have to add the sound before the beginning of the next word. Here is another example, un petit oiseau, un petit oiseau, a small bird. So here you have to say petit, silent T, and then oiseau, un petit oiseau. We're going to see all the different letters that are concerned with this French liaison, la liaison française. So first, let's start with the most common letter that is involved in a liaison. This is S, X and Z. But the tricky thing is that the sound created is Z. So with a Z, like if it was a Z in French. So you have to remember that those three letters, when they're used as a liaison, they are like Z. So here are some examples. Les arbres. Les arbres. The trees. Deux oiseaux. Two birds. Deux oiseaux. Then you've got faux amis. You remember last lesson it was about faux amis. Faux friends. Faux amis. So here you have to say it. And then here is an example with a Z. Venez ici. Venez ici. So here you have to say it. Venez ici. So in those four cases, you always have to do the Z sound. But of course, we are in French, so there are exceptions. And here are the two main exceptions, and they both, they both concern the letter S. So when you use a verb and there is a final S that is added, for example, at the second person singular uh, for the present, for example, tu manges une pomme, tu manges une pomme. Here, did you hear it? I didn't do any liaison. Tu manges une pomme. You're eating an apple. I'm not going to make the mistake not to disturb you. So here you have to say, tu manges une pomme. There is another example with an S. Here it's when you, like there is a plural, so you need to add an S here. So you say, ils sont allés au cinéma. Ils sont allés au cinéma. Here, by the way, there is a liaison. But here, there is no liaison. Ils sont allés, like it's not an exception, but here, because there is a final S added to the verb, you have to ignore it. Ils sont allés au cinéma. Ils sont allés au cinéma. They went to the theater. So this is the first case. And then there is this inversion. You know, when you ask a question in French, sometimes, and like when you want to be polite, you have to do an inversion between the subject and the verb. So here, when you say, sont-ils arrivés? Sont-ils arrivés? Did they arrive? Did they arrive? Sont-ils arrivés? Here you do the liaison, no problem. But here, between the subject and the, the rest of the sentence, you don't have, you don't say it. So here it's, you don't say it. Sont-ils arrivés? Here you have to do the liaison, like classic, not an exception, but here it's an exception. Let's check another example. Avez-vous essayé ce numéro? Did you try this number? Avez-vous essayé ce numéro? Here again, there is the subject, vous, you, and the next, uh, the remaining sentence with an E, but you don't have to say it because there is an inversion. So here, sont-ils arrivés? Avez-vous essayé ce numéro? Because there is this inversion, you don't have to say it. So that's all for those three letters and yeah, S is a bit more tricky than the two others, but be careful. Then let's move on to the next sound. This is quite an easy one, P, and you have to say it like a P. So no, no tricky rule here. But um, usually words are not that common, that en words that ends with a P. 
The main example is trop, which means like too, in too much. It's too much. So here are some examples. Trop aimable, trop aimable, which means too amiable. When you say here, you have to say it. Trop aimable, trop aimable. And here there is another example. Trop heureux, trop heureux, which means like I'm really happy. So here again you have to do the liaison. But you have to be careful because when you say trop heureux, it sounds really like when you say trop peureux, which means like too sissy. Trop peureux, trop peureux. Like there is no difference even for a French speaker when you say those two sentences. But be careful because you can sometimes be confused due to the li liaison. This is not the first, the only example. This is not the only example where you can find this homophony. So be careful. Sometimes when you hear someone, you will think of another word. But here, it's um, important to know that with the context of the sentence, that trop heureux means heureux and not peureux. It depends. So that one was an easy one, P. But here is another tricky one. TD sounds like a T when you do la liaison française, the French liaison. TD sounds like T. You remember un grand arbre. I said un grand arbre. So here is like a T. So here are some other examples. Un grand éléphant, quite similar to that one. Un grand éléphant, like a big elephant. Un grand éléphant. Un grand éléphant. You can try to say after me, to repeat. It's a good training for you. Then, another example. Un petit abricot. Un petit abricot. A little apricot. Un petit abricot. So here, you do the liaison. Can you hear it? It's exactly the same sound. Un grand éléphant, un petit abricot. It's always like T. Téléphant, tabricot. And here is another example. Like, again, there can be a confusion of homony, homophony. Like, il a tout à gagner. Il a tout à gagner. Il a tout à gagner. Here, you do the liaison. Because there is a vowel. And he, it means like he has everything to gain. And when you say that, it sounds like when you say tout with an E, like in toute la journée, like the whole day, toute la journée. But be careful because it's not the same word. So even for French people, that's a really common mistake. Like sometimes when they write, uh, they add a T here because when they say orally the, the sentence, they, they, there is like, like if there is an E, but there is not. Il a tout à gagner. Il a tout à gagner. Here, it's just the liaison that makes it sound like tout, but there is no e. So be careful with that. Toute la journée, the whole day. And again, exceptions in French. TD. Two exceptions you can find. First one is with the words E, which means end. End. Un chien et un chat. Un chien et un chat. A dog and a cat. Can you hear it? I didn't do anything here. Un chien et un chat. No liaison, neither here nor here. Un chien et un chat. Like E is like it cuts the sentence. So you don't say anything related to the liaison with an E. And the other exception is interrogative adverbs. So when you ask a question like, how are you? Like how, in, in French, you have to say comment. Comment, comment est-il? How is he like? Question. Comment est-il? So here you can hear that I do the liaison, but here no liaison, because this, comment, comment, this is an interrogative adverb. So you don't do the liaison here. Same with quand. Quand arrives-tu? Here, no liaison. Quand arrives-tu? When do you arrive? Quand arrives-tu? No liaison. You can hear it, right? Next, the letter R. This one, the main word is premier. When you say premier, you have to do the liaison if the next word is starting with a vowel sound. So here, le premier enfant, le premier enfant, the first child, le premier enfant. Again, it's like if it was the feminine form of um, 
le premier enfant, la première, le premier, la première. But here, um, you have to do the liaison like if it was a feminine form. Le premier enfant. So here, there is the liaison. But there are also an optional case when you can do the liaison, but it's not mandatory. It's when you use verbs with ER at the end. When you say aller au cinéma, like to go to the theater, usually French speakers don't say aller au cinéma, but you can say it. The most common way would be to say just aller au cinéma. But I personally, I don't do the liaison here, but like, don't be surprised if someone say it. So here, you can choose both. But I advise you not to do it, like, just for or just remember premier, which is probably the main words that is related to this category. And then there is the last one of the um, common silent letter, which is F. And here you have to say V, the sound V, which is a bit tricky. And the main word concerned with that is neuf, like nine. Nine. <laughs> neuf. Neuf heures. Neuf heures, which means nine o'clock. Nine hours, like it means both. Nine o'clock or nine hours. Neuf heures. Neuf heures. So here there is this V sound. And there is, even though there is an H here, because the next letters of vowels and H is silent, it means like in ER, the, um, the word starts with a vowel sound. It's not a vowel, but it's a vowel sound. So you have to do the liaison here. Neuf heures. Neuf heures. Next, here is a new letter. Last time we didn't mention anything about N, the letter N. But here, this letter is concerned with the French liaison. And this one is a bit more tricky than the other ones. There are two ways to say the liaison with this letter. The first one is, like for the other cases, a kind of delay of the sound. Like if you say mon enfant, it's like mon. So you say this word, mon. And then you do mon enfant, mon, mon enfant, mon enfant, mon enfant, mon enfant. So this is like the others. But the second case is a feminization, which is quite similar with the R, but there is some sort of a nuances. You have to say bon appétit, like if the word bon was written. Bon appétit, bon appétit, which is quite different. It's not a delay of the sound. It's like if you say the feminine form, bon appétit, bon appétit. Same with this example, certain plus ami. It's quite difficult to say it, but you have to say certain ami. With experience, you will be able to say it properly. Don't focus too much on that. I, was, I wanted just to, to show you that there is a slight difference, so don't be surprised. But um, that's quite difficult to understand when you're not uh, a native speaker. Then, I would like to show you some forbidden liaison. Three rules that applies for all the letters and that are three important, really important cases where you don't do the liaison. This is really important, so remember them. First case is between a nominal group and a verb. So here in the example of les enfants arriveront par ici, and here there is les enfants, the nominal group, and arriveront, which is the verb. And did you hear it? I didn't say anything here. I did a liaison here, like it's come on. But here I didn't do anything. Les enfants arriveront par ici. The children will arrive from here or from over there. Les enfants arriveront par ici. Because here there is the nominal group and here there is the verb. You don't say it. Then there is this second rule. Singular noun followed by adjectives. Maybe it's a bit tricky, but you, will, you might get it. Un sujet intéressant. An interesting topic. Here there is a silent T, but I don't do the liaison. Un sujet intéressant. Can you see the difference between un sujet intéressant and un grand arbre? 
Here, this is the noun, this is the adjective. Adjective, noun. And here, this is the noun, and here, the adjective. So here, you don't say the liaison in that case. Un sujet intéressant, no liaison. Same here, un enfant anglais. Un enfant anglais. Here, there is this liaison, but here, there is no liaison. Like an English child, un enfant anglais. Liaison, no liaison. And the last one is really famous in France. Like sometimes with H, you have to ignore it. And the main word is probably the most famous word among French people is haricot. Like there is a kind of debate about that word. <laughs> J'aime les haricots verts. J'aime les haricots verts. Here there is an H and you don't say it. J'aime les haricots verts. I like green beans. Even though there is a kind of new rule that allows you to say it, I advise you not to say it if you want to sound like uh, a correct French guy. So here are the three rules you have to remember. Some words with H are also like that, but um, haricot is really the most famous one and you need to remember that one, I think. Let's do some training. Training is a good way to express and to train yourself, like to improve. Like this is theory and now training, practice. So I'm gonna read the example, but before that, I would like you to try to say the sentence and see if you can manage to find where there is the liaison. So here, first sentence. Did you try? Okay, the answer is, ils ne sont pas assez grands. Ils ne sont pas assez. Here there is the Z sound. Grand. So here, no liaison. So here, only here. Ils ne sont pas assez grands. It means like, it means like they are not big enough. Do you remember it was a sentence from last lesson? Ils ne sont pas assez grands. So here you know why there is this liaison now. Okay? Next sentence. Try to say it. The answer is, les adultes et les enfants aiment manger une glace. Les adultes et les enfants aiment manger une glace. Les adultes et les enfants, so here you don't say it. Les adultes et les enfants aiment manger une glace. Here you can say manger une glace, manger une glace, but it's not mandatory, you don't have to do it. So I'm just gonna keep it like that. Les adultes et les enfants aiment manger une glace. Children and adults like to eat ice cream, like eating ice cream. Let's move on to the next one. Try to say it. The answer is, le premier animal que j'ai eu était un oiseau. Like the first pet I've ever got was a bird. Le premier animal que j'ai eu était un oiseau. Le premier animal, here you have to do the liaison, this is this case. Le premier animal que j'ai eu était un oiseau. So here again, two liaisons. Était un, était un. So this T sound. Était un oiseau. Here, this is N. Un oiseau. Le premier animal que j'ai eu était un oiseau. You have to say it here. Next one. Try to say it. Tu te lèves à 9 heures. So here, there is this S, which is at the end of a verb, based on this rule. You don't say it. Tu te lèves à 9 heures. Even though there is this A, you don't say it. And here, you have to say it. You remember it? The only example with F, which is V sound. Tu te lèves à 9 heures. Like you wake up at 9. Tu te lèves à 9 heures. And the last sentence is, try to say it. The answer is, les petits haricots verts sont aussi bons que les grands. Les petits haricots verts sont aussi bons que les grands. And green, the small green beans are as good as the biggest ones. Les petits haricots verts sont aussi So here, you do the liaison, 
sont aussi bons que les grands. Aussi bons que les grands. So that's all, that's all for this sentence. Les petits haricots verts sont aussi bons que les grands. Here, I strongly advise you not to say it. Les petits haricots verts sont aussi bons que les grands. Did you manage to find all the liaison? If you did, that's really good. But if you did not, it's not, it's okay. Like you will get used to it. So, so far we've seen the, this main rule, like when there is a vowel sound, a silent letter might be pronounced. And here are all the sound, S, X, and Z for Z sound, P for P sound, T, D for T sound, R for R, and F for V. So remember that. And then there is also this N, which is in, involved in a lot of liaison. If you can remember that and those three exceptions rules, that's really good. Like, remember three rules, sometimes with H, when a singular noun is followed by an adjective, and between nominal group and verbs, les enfants arriveront, nominal groups, verbs. So remember those three rules and all those different sounds and the, those two exceptions among those two categories. And if you remember that, that's perfect. Like there are some other rules, some other exceptions, but that the main ones. And that's really important if you can memorize it. You will improve with, with experience and that's a good basis for learning how to do the French liaison, la liaison française. Hey guys, it's Pierre from France. And welcome back for a new video, this time about French food. Top 10 French dishes and related vocabulary. This is today's topic, so it would be less about grammar, but more about like food and good stuff. So without further ado, let's get started with some food. And the first one, the most famous food here is fromage. Le fromage, cheese in French. This is really important in France. We eat a lot of cheese and it's not like um, any kind of cheese. You know, when you do, um, when you eat in France, there is, you can do a full course, which means you do entrée, plat, fromage, dessert. It means like first course, main dish, cheese, dessert. So this is quite common to do that in France. And personally, um, with my family, I do that every day. So you start with some entrée, like uh, salads or um, tomatoes, and then you've got the main dish, and then some cheese. And that's what is interesting here. You can eat like any kind of cheese. Usually you add bread with it, but you eat your cheese like that. And there are many, many different kinds of cheese in France. And usually it's original stuff. It means like, depending on where you are in France, so this is a super nice map of the France, nation and then depending on where you are you will find some famous cheeses and like the most famous one you can find them everywhere but some of them are really difficult to find sometimes so there are many different kind of cheese here are some adjectives that you can use to describe cheese le fromage est dur like the cheese is hard sometimes the cheese is hard it's dur sometimes it's soft Le fromage est mou. C'est un fromage mou. Mou. Or sometimes it's creamy. Fromage crémeux. Un fromage crémeux. Creamy. And also, you know, cheese, French cheese is sometimes really smelly. And you have to say in French, le fromage sent fort. Like a strong smell. It's smelly. You say that usually in France. Le fromage sent fort. Le fromage sent fort. And I would like you to know more about two different cheese that are quite famous and the first one is personally my favorite. Le Comté. Comté. Comté is from this region in France, Franche-Comté, which you can notice is the name of the region. Franche-Comté. Comté, same. So here is a map of France and Franche-Comté is somewhere here. So. 1A it's for, stands for this, Comté. So this is really good. And this is a hard cheese, un fromage dur. Um, 
And then you've got this one, Camembert, also quite famous, which is from Normandy. Normandy is over there. This cheese is more um, creamy than uh, Comté, like the, um, around the cheese it's quite hard, but when you cut it, it's creamy inside and really good. And the more smelly it is, the more creamy it is. So here are for some cheese. Of course, there are so many cheeses. You can check by yourself for more cheeses. Let's move on to the next one. Bread, or in French, pain. You probably all know this cliché about France, baguette. Like all French people are always with their baguette under their arms. But it's not a cliché. <laughs> Like personally, I used to buy a baguette every day. Like not all French people are doing that, but personally, I do that. So yeah, um, that's the most common bread in France and my favorite personally, baguette. This, like you, I guess you all know what is a baguette. So this, and usually you go to a bread shop called boulangerie in France and boulangerie, you can find them like almost everywhere in France. It's really common. And that's why I can buy my bread every day, by going there. But uh, in boulangerie, you can also find some croissant or um, other kinds of bread. Here are two other kinds of breads that are quite common. I guess this one is the m second most common. Pain de campagne. Pain de campagne. It's like a kind of bowl, you see? And in English, maybe you would say farmhouse bread. So in French, pain de campagne like campagne, pain de campagne. So this is, those two are quite famous and you can find them in almost all boulangerie, all bread shop. So this is quite common. And here is like what you can call sandwich bread in, in America, but um, in France you have to say pain de mie. And it's quite different, like th those two are really hard. Like you remember, we can also use this adjective for bread. Uh, like this is quite hard. But here it's really soft and you all know, you can find that everywhere in the world. Like when you say that, like to me, it's not like real bread. Like for, uh, for me, when you say bread, those two breads appear in my mind. So this is not bread and usually you can do sandwich with that. But in France, you use usually baguette or pain de campagne if you want to do some sandwiches. And I really like uh, doing uh, sandwiches with a baguette. This is so good and you should try it. So this is bread and maybe you wonder how we eat the bread. So first I said like sometimes sandwiches, but that's not the most common way. We eat it during the, um, the fromage step, like we eat cheese and, and bread, like it's classic. You have your piece of cheese and a piece of bread and you eat them together. But um, you can also eat them for breakfast and you put some jam and some butter and you eat that. This is quite common in France. Or sometimes we, you, you, you drink that with your cup of coffee, you've got your, your bread and your coffee and you just eat them together. And also, when it's the time for the main dish, for the plat, you have some pieces of bread usually like uh, on the table and you can eat them like that, like it's really common. Like, I think it's a bit similar to rice in Asian countries. Here bread, you eat, like, you can eat, the, eat bread at any moment during your meal, especially during the main dish. So this is bread. Those two were uh, quite general food, but no, I would like to talk about more regional food. That's why I decided to draw a map. So here are some other foods that are regional, regional food. Like French food is really regional. So let's first start with Bœuf Bourguignon. Bœuf Bourguignon. It's from the region called Bourgogne. You probably know this region. Like in English you say Burgundy. And this is quite famous for uh, white wine. And it's over here. So here is the Bourgogne region, Burgundy, and like this plate is quite famous over there, but you can eat that everywhere in France, but originally it's from this region. So it consists in a beef stewed in red wine. So if you want to explain that in French, you would say bœuf mijoté au vin rouge, 
bœuf mijoté au vin rouge. Bœuf stands for beef, mijoté is like stewed, and vin rouge, red wine. Bœuf mijoté au vin rouge. And usually you add with your beef, you add some other ingredients like pommes de terre, which is potato, potatoes, potatoes, um, onions, like oignon, 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 and some carrots, carrot, carrot. So these are um, the main ingredients that you can find when you cook a bœuf bourguignon. Um, this is quite uh, famous in France. And next one, let's move on to another region, which is, this region is called Lorraine, and this food is called quiche, or sometimes quiche Lorraine. Quiche Lorraine is a specific kind of quiche, but probably the most famous one. And Lorraine is this region. So here you can find quiche, or quiche Lorraine. It consists in a tart, like that, and you cook the tart with eggs and cream, and you add also on top of it cheese and uh, some bacon, but you can choose other ingredients, but that's the common uh, recipe. So in French, you would say tarte avec des œufs, de la crème, du fromage et des lardons. Tarte avec des œufs, de la crème, du fromage et des lardons. So here, tarte, tarte, quite easy. Oeuf, eggs, cream, cream, cheese. I forgot to write it here in English, but you have to say fromage is cheese. And here, lardon, bacon, some sort of bacon. It's not like the exact translation, but in France, it's a really specific kind of um, bacon. Like, usually it's uh, some, some matches of meat. So here is um, like this, uh, the quiche. And usually you can eat that um, like when it's hot, but you can, after cooking it, you can just wait and eat it cold. And it is, it is quite good as well. So it's up to you, you can choose. So let's move on to the next one. This is Gratin Dauphinois, like from the southeast region. And maybe if you know the name of the city, Grenoble, which is close to Lyon, over there, you can, um, you can find this plate quite famous. But personally, I'm not from this region and I can eat uh, like Gratin Dauphinois. It's quite a common plate. So you don't need to go there if you want to try a Gratin Dauphinois. It consists in some pommes de terre, so you remember, potatoes, and you slice them, like tranché, pommes de terre tranché, sliced potatoes, and you cook them, uh, you bake them in, uh, in milk, like dans du lait. Pommes de terre tranché et cuite dans du lait, cuite dans du lait, baked in milk. So here is some kind of drawing. Um, you see this, the plate, and here are all the sliced potatoes, and you just add uh, milk and of course some uh, salt and sometimes peppers and it's up to you but this is the classic recipe you add milk and then you just bake that and you've got your meal gratin de fino it's quite easy but quite good and um, you should try it if you can um, have the opportunity to find it let's move on to the next one which is ratatouille you probably all know the movie ratatouille the disney movie but it's a name, this is the name of a plate in France. And uh, it's from Provence. Provence. Provence is a region over here. So number six is over here. Six. Mm, like it's close to Nice, if you know the name of the city. Nice. Ratatouille is like something you eat more in summer, but it's hot. Um, it consists in some stew, like it's a stewed vegetables dish. So in French, you would say ragout de légumes. Ragout, ragout de légumes. So ragout, uh, sorry, ragout stands for uh, stewed and légumes stands for vegetables. And here are the classic vegetables you're going to use if you want to do like a classic and uh, like an authentic uh, authentic uh, ratatouille. You need to know all those uh, ingredients if you want to be real French, like for uh, your own ratatouille. The five main ingredients in ratatouille are those ones. First is 
tomate, tomato, tomate, tomate. Then courgette, which means zucchini, courgette. Then aubergine, aubergine, eggplant, aubergine. Then onion, we've seen this one before. Onion, in French, oignon, oignon, oignon. A bit different. And then garlic, which is in French, aïe, aïe, short word, aïe. Okay? So those five ingredients are um, always in a classic ratatouille. So let's move on to the next one, which is, I'm sure you know it, crêpe from the, the region over there, which is Bretagne. Bretagne. So maybe you know like sweet crêpe, like you add some sugar or some jam or anything, but here is a bit different. This is crêpe salé, which is salted crêpe or crêpes, salted crêpes. Crêpe salé, crêpe salé. The main difference with like um, a sweet crêpe is that you use buckwheat, buckwheat, which is in French sarrasin, sarrasin. So you cook your um, your um, your crêpes with uh, this sarrasin, and you can call it as well crêpe sarrasin, crêpe au sarrasin, crêpe au sarrasin. So you can say that. And you eat that like as a main dish, and it's not a dessert, like it's a main dish. And the classic crêpe, like the, the classic crêpe salé, would be with jambon oeuf fromage, like crêpe jambon oeuf fromage, crêpe jambon oeuf fromage, which means like crêpe, like ham, egg, cheese, crêpe. So you can say that uh, like in restaurants, in many restaurants, like not only here, but like over there, that was really good. But um, in every restaurant uh, where you can have crêpe, there is always this classic, like jambon oeuf fromage, jambon oeuf fromage. So yeah, jambon is ham, oeuf is egg, and fromage is cheese. We've seen that before. And here is like a kind of drawing. Um, here is like the folded, the folded crêpe. And here is in red the yolk and like some ingredients over there. But um, like you can like there are there are some uh, specialized shops which are called crêperie, 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 crêperie. This is like a crêpe shop, and it's really common over there and even though in all France in the whole France. And over there, you can like have your main dish, your plat, which is a crepe, like a salted crepe. And then for your dessert, you can have um, your um, sweet crepe. And in those shops, like there are many different kinds of crepe. And there is this classic, but you can also find like with uh, salmon, um, with uh, chorizo or uh, mushrooms, you can find a lot of different kind of crepe. So you should try it. And it's not like a plate, a plate that you try once and that's it. That's a plate that you can try a lot of times because it's always different. And then let's move on to another one, raclette, which is not originally a French food. This is from Switzerland here. But uh, the influence of this plate was quite uh, important and it's really famous in France, in whole France now. But in this region it was really famous, like it's a um, plate that is uh, supposed to be eaten by people living in mountains. So over there, there is like it's really, there are a lot of mountains and this is a classic plate. So like if you ask French people, they would probably say that um, raclette is something French because we like eating raclette in winter. Um, raclette is the name of the plate, but also the name of the specific cheese that you use when you do a raclette. Like, it is um, the raclette consists in putting some cheese, like some melted cheese, on some potato. So here, it's your plate. There is 
this potato and you add this melted cheese on it. So this is like the base, but you don't eat like that. Usually you eat like a lot of potato, like it's kind of social activity where you take your potato, like there is a plate with potato, you each uh, person take the potato and then add the cheese on it and you do, you do that like a lot of times and you discuss with people. So this is like a really social uh, plate. And usually you eat that with charcuterie, charcuterie, which is a kind of like a lot of hams, like sausage or um, ham and like a lot of meat. Um, like uh, we have two different ways to say Sausage in French, you can say saucisse sometimes or uh, saucisson, which are two different kind of sausages. Um, and you can buy all that in a boucher. You can go to the boucher, and if you go there, you can buy all that. It it is called in English like butcher's shop, and yeah, like it's also quite common in France. And you can eat charcuterie. So charcuterie is of is like is almost always mixed with raclette. But um, like it's also something that we like eating like for um, as an entree, first course. Like you've got a plate with some, uh, some ham, some sausage, and you can eat that together. So yeah, that's quite common. And usually that's one of the most uh, favorite food for French people. Like it's not a real meal, like you don't cook a lot. But um, like it's a plate with a lot of different kind of meat and a lot of French people like it. And the last one, let's move on to the last one, which is from Paris and a quite recent dish. It is named Hachis Parmentier. At the end of the 19th century, the potatoes in France were supposed to be in in inedible, like you can't eat it. But someone called Parmentier, while he was living in Paris, decided to create a dish made of potato. And this dish would be so delicious that everybody is gonna will eat potatoes and will understand that um, you can eat potatoes. So um, it consists in uh, like a mix of potato and some chopped beef. So in French, you would say. Mélange de pommes de terre et de bœuf haché. Mélange de pommes de terre, potato, et de bœuf haché. Mix of potatoes and chopped beef. And you can add an S. Uh, you can add an S here. Et de bœuf haché. Mix of potatoes and chopped beef. Or you can also just remove the two S, like it doesn't really matter. Um, mélange de pommes de terre et de bœuf haché. So, haché. Parmentier. So you've seen that um, I presented a lot of dish, a lot of dishes from France, and here there is like a kind of big hole. Um, like it's not that I don't like this region, but um, I didn't have time to choose, uh, like to explain you all the different dishes that you can find in France. So, like here is really famous for the wine. This region is really famous for the wine, but there are also many plates that are famous, but I really wanted to talk about those tents because they are really important in France. Hey guys, it's Pierre. Welcome back for more videos on French learning. Today's videos will be about tongue twister in French, virelangue or fourchelangue. It's not exactly the same meaning like, tongue twister is only sentences difficult to say in English, but in French it's all, it also means sentences difficult to understand. And also, French people don't use those words a lot. It's not common. Usually we know the concept of tongue twister, but we don't use words to define this concept. So let's get started with sentences difficult to say. I think this one is the most famous, so I'm gonna read it and I will probably do a lot of mistakes. And here there is one S missing. Two S. I will probably do a lot of mistakes, but even for French people, it's hard to say those tongue twisters. So I'm gonna try. Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi sèches? So I did it quite slowly. And if I try to be faster, I will have a lot of difficulties. Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi sèches? 
Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches Ah, uh, not bad. But um, let's try to explain the meaning of this sentence. When you say chaussette, it means like socks. Sèche, it's like dry. Archiduchesse, it's archiduchesse. Arch 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 and archi-sèche, it's like super dry. In French, when you add archi, you can, it means like super in front of an adjective. But um, it's uh, quite used uh, in French, but not always. Like it's, it may sound not really polite. So the meaning of this sentence is, or the archduchesse sucks dry or super dry. Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches? So here the difficulty is mainly the difference between s and sh. It's quite hard to say. But this one, because it's really famous in France, like I think French people can do, th do that one. But maybe you, as a French learner, you have difficulties to say it. And no problem, even for French people, it's still hard. So one more time. Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches? Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches? Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches? So here it's like uh, I started to mix those two sounds. So even for me, it's hard. So this one, maybe the most famous, definitely, in French, like the most famous tongue twister. So you can try to say it, but um, don't worry if you cannot do that. But as you can see, the sound S and CH is quite difficult to distinguish, to distinguish in sentences. So that's why here I've got three examples, like the main tongue twisters in French are using this, uh, the similarity between S and CH. So let's move on to the next one, which is also super famous. I think those two ones are the main uh, tongue twisters in French. So here, I'm going to try to say it slowly first. Un chasseur chassant. Eh, I did a mistake <laughs> already, and I was slow. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. This one is much harder than this one. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Here I made again a mistake. So it's quite hard. Chasseur means hunter. And chasser, it's a verb like to hunt. So un chasseur chasse. A hunter hunts. Sachant, it's like uh, the, it's the verb savoir, like know, to know. But here it's um, a specific form, which means who knows. So here, un chasseur sachant chasser. A hunter who knows how to, end, to, to hunt. So this is quite hard to say because here you've got the CH and the S and there is this inversion. Here it's CH, CH and S and here S and then CH. And then the end of the sentence, doit savoir chasser sans son chien. So sans son chien, it means like without his dog. So the full sentence in English would be, a hunter who knows how to hunt should know how to hunt without his dog. So here again, chasser, savoir, there is a C here, and the CH in chien, and the S in sans, and in son. So this is quite hard. So I'm going to say it once again, like first slow. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. You see, like, my, um, like it's quite difficult for my muscle to say that. So I'm going to try to be faster now. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Here, like, I don't know if I did it correctly, but it's quite hard and I'm starting to confuse the S and the CH. But if you can do this one as a French learner, it's super cool because it's really hard to say. So don't worry again if you cannot do it, but it's fun to try. And the last one is also, as I said, uh, using the, the, the ambiguity between S and CH. Suis-je chez ce cher Serge? 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 It's really hard to say. Suis-je, like it's like am I, like question, like inversion. Je, I, suis, am, I am, am I. Chez ce cher Serge, ce cher Serge, it's like that dear Serge, you can say that in English as well, it's like the same meaning, that stands for ce, dear stands for cher, and Serge is the name. So here, uh, chez ce cher Serge, it means like uh, at that dear Serge's house. So the full sentence would be, am I at 
the dear Serge's house. So, once again in French, first slowly. Suis-je chez ce cher Serge? Suis-je chez ce cher Serge? Okay, so far it's okay. But no, let's get faster. Suis-je chez ce cher Serge? 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 Like, it's really hard. Like, I made a mistake. I don't know if you can hear it. But I'm doing um, like a confusion between the S sound and the CH sound. This one is also quite hard. So I'm gonna do one more time, one last time. Suis-je te cherche, suis-je te cherche, je suis-je te cherche. Really hard. So yeah. So here, so far we've seen three sentences that are using the ambiguity between S and CH. When you speak faster, it's easy to mix up to mix up all the, the, those two sounds. So that's why we have a lot of tongue twisters in French using this. But let's move on to some other sounds. Here, there is this one, panier, piano. It's just two words. There is no meaning, like it's not an, a special expression. It's me, it means like in English, basket, piano, like basket where you throw, you put away your stuff. Um, or you can also um, wear stuff in a, in a basket. So here it's the same meaning, panier, piano, basket, piano, basket, piano. So here, this is, as you can see, those three letters are the same here, but not the same order. Ani, Ian. So here, this is uh, the main uh, feature of this uh, tongue twister. Panier, piano. So if you say it just slowly, it's really easy. Panier, piano. But like for a French learner, it's, you, first have, you, you first have to, uh, to understand how to say those words like alone, and if you can do it, then you just say panier piano, it's really easy. But if you say a lot of times panier piano and really fast, you will have difficulties and you will not manage to do it. And I will not manage to do it. So I'm going to do it. Panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano. And it's really hard. Usually nobody can really manage to do it. Like you always saying pianier, 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 you add the E here. Or here you get rid of the E and you add an E here, so you're, you say panio. So panier piano, but you, if you say it really, if you say it a lot, you say pianier panio, pianier piano. Here, I, I, even for that, I made a mistake. Panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier. You see, I'm saying panio. Like it's really hard. So if you say it, like you will finally, uh, like you will eventually made a mistake and so this is quite short and quite simple and quite famous as well. This one is quite famous. Panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier Here, really hard. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This one is not really famous and it doesn't make any sense, like the meaning is quite weird. And this is blé, brûlé, brûle les blés. So, like even for a French person, the meaning is quite uh, obscure. Um, like blé stands for corn. And brûler, it's the verb which means to burn. So here, blé brûlé, it means like brûlé is the past form of blé, uh, of, well, sorry, to burn. So brûlé, like present, like infinitive, sorry. And here, brûlé, like um, it's um, imparfait, so it's a past tense. And here, brûle les blés, here this is a subject, and here uh, this is the verb, and brûle, it's like present, like the corns are burning, les blés brûle. But here there is this stylistic inversion, like there is no specific reason for that. Uh, like this sentence you cannot use it and it's like it's quite weird, it's just hard to say. So blé brûlé, brûle les blés, 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 okay. This is much easier, I think. Like first, you have difficulties to say it, but when you're used to it, you, it's quite easy to say, I think, for a French person. Like if you're a French learner, so it's, it may be hard, still hard. So here, the difficulty is, there is BL and BR, blé, br, blé. So bl and br. I think for um, Asian people, it would be really hard uh, to say uh, this. Uh, like if your mother language, uh, is um, if your mother tongue is uh, there is no differences between L and R 
this is going to be really hard to say. Blé brûlé brûlé les blé blé brûlé brûlé les blé blé brûlé brûlé les blé blé brûlé brûlé les blé. So this is quite easy, I think, for a French person. And here there is also blé and lé 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 ici again, here again, and here again lé. So this is also quite hard when you're not used to French um, to distinguish é and é. Blé brûlé. Can you hear the difference? É, é, é. Eh. For a French person, it's super easy to hear the difference, but when you, you're not used to French, it's quite hard. So I'm going to show you the difference once again. E, E, blé, brûlé, blé, brûlé, E, E. Once again, this is okay if you, do not, uh, if you don't really understand the difference, but uh, as you will get further in your French um, learning, you will have to see the difference, to hear the difference between those two sounds. So this one, like, it's not a really famous tongue twister and it's not a really difficult one for French people, but for you, I think it's quite interesting if you want to distinguish those two sounds and those two sounds, which can be sometimes confusing for a French learner. And let's move on to another one which is um, kind of funny, it's a question. Here, like what is in black is not hard to say, what is difficult to say is in red, but the full sentence, the tongue twister is like the full sentence. So the question is, doit-on dire seize sèche chaise ou bien seize chaise sèche? This is really hard, even for me. Like if I'm slow, it's okay, but if I say it faster, I will have a lot of trouble. So here, the meaning of that is like, should we say 16 dry chairs? So here again, you've got sesh. We found that sesh here. As you can see, this word is quite used in uh, tongue twisters in French, because there is, again, S and CH. So here, this one is also kind of this category, a member of this category, but there are some other difficulties in this. So should we say 16 dry chairs or 16 chair dried. There is an answer for that in French. But first, let me tell that again. Doit-on dire 16... Ah. Doit-on dire 16 sèche chaise ou bien 16 chaise sèche? 16 sèche chaise, 16 chaise sèche. Doit-on dire 16 sèche chaise? Well, I cannot say, like faster, it gets worse. Doit-on dire 16 16 chaise ou bien 16 16 sèche 16 16 sèche 16 16 chaise 16 16 chaise It's really hard, like, it's so hard for me. So here there is the Z sound and also the CH sound. The, here, like, se, this one, E, I, E with the accent, and A, I. This is the same sound in French, here. 16 sèche chaise I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm saying the same eh, eh. So here, no difficulty. But he, what the difficulty lies in the letters, like the consonants. So here, S, Z, S, C, H, C, H, Z. So it's really like, it's a kind of level up of like a, another category of this one, like a, an upgrade. So this is quite hard. Um, Doit-on dire 16 sèche chaise ou bien 16 chaise sèche? So there is an answer for that. One of those two is not correct. 16 sèche chaise, 16 chaise sèche. I think like both are, um, like you, we, you, you understood and uh, I think it's not like grammatically completely false, but one is more natural. And the one which is more natural is 16 chaise Sèche. Sèche. When you say like a chair which is dry, you have to say une chaise sèche. Une chaise qui est sèche. Une chaise sèche. The adjective is after the noun in this case. And here, like there is the inversion, like sèche, chaise. You, you are understood and it's not completely false, but um, like if you want to speak a proper French, it's better to say this one. But like, who would say this sentence, right? It's quite weird. Says, chaise, sèche. And even if you want to say that, like, 
it's super hard. You will not manage to do it probably because I cannot manage to say, to say this sentence. So yeah. So, so far we've seen like sentences difficult to say. Like the pronunciation of those sentences are quite hard. And it's mainly due to the, those two sounds. But also like the Z sounds is quite hard. And um, when letters are quite similar but in a different order, you've got also some tongue twisters. We've got a lot of tongue twisters in French, but I think those ones are really famous. And maybe this one. And then it's more like are, those two are more tricky. So that's good for sentences difficult to say. But no, let's move on to what is, what is a bit different from English. Sentences difficult to understand. To understand. So those, like, there are many different kind of, uh, like, virlang in this category. First, it's sentences, like, even for French people, if I say it, I will not manage to understand what the people uh, told me. So here, the first one is, like, it's not easy it's not difficult to repeat what was said, but it's hard to understand the, um, which word was a word. Because here you say samedi, 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 which is like same sound, samedi, samedi, samedi. Three times I'm saying samedi. But each time it's different. Samedi, like it means sam says, sam says. So sam, it's a name again. Samedi, like Saturday, you, have, you say samedi. Exactly the same pronunciation. And then this expression, which is kind of casual, samedi, 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 samedi. Like samedi, it's like if you say it properly, like full sentence, but sometimes you will shorten the word. Uh, so you will say samedi. And it's like in English, sounds good. Like, oh, sounds good, samedi. Like, let's go, let's go to the mall. Yeah, sounds good. Allons au supermarché, samedi. Like, supermarché, like supermarket, not mall. But anyway, so here, samedi, samedi, samedi. There is no, like, it's not really funny, and it's just like uh, you repeat three times the same sound, which is um, interesting, but not really hard to understand. Um, but if you say that, like, personally, if I hear this, uh, I will have, like, uh, what did you mean? Like, it's quite weird what you said. So this one, like, it's just to show that sometimes you've got different ways to say, like, different words can have the same pronunciation. Like, the combination of, of different words can have the same meaning. And here, this one is quite interesting, because when you hear that, cabula no lac, if I hear that, I'm like, you're not speaking French. Like, this does, does not sound French. When you hear that, cabula no lac, cabula no lac, you're like, whoa, is this real French? So if you're not like used to hear this sentence, which is kind of unusual, you would be kind of confused. So if you want to like impress your friends or uh, uh, I don't know, like just uh, say something weird in French, you can learn this one, cabula no lac. Like, can you, like if I say cabula no lac, do you, do you think I'm speaking French? Like it does not sound like French. Cabula no lac, cabula no lac. And the meaning is quite simple, actually. Like, que, it's like what? A, cabu, here, there is no accent. Cabu la no lac. What did the donkey drink at the lake? At the lake, au lac. Donkey, an, the donkey, lan. Drink, like, bu, like the verb uh, to drink, so, boire. And here it's like the past, so did drink, so abu. So, Cabu la no lac, cabu la no lac. So what is funny in this sentence is like there is the lac here and there is kind of inversion of the sound with ka, ak, ka, ak. Here la, 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 la. So cabu la no lac. So here you've got this and this and you've got also this and this. So this is kind of interesting. So we've got a lot of um, different kind of um, sentences like that. The next one is quite similar, and it's quite famous, I think. Simile tunes volet tu netron. There is no real meaning in that. Like this sentence is quite weird, but it's perfectly co correct. Like grammatically, it's correct, and um, there is a meaning. But um, this is quite weird if you hear it. 
Si vous les tunez, si mais les tunez, vous les tunez Si vous les tunez, vous les tunez. Si mais les tunez, vous les tunez It's not hard to say. Once again, it's just hard to understand. Si mais les tunez, vous les tunez So here, it means like les tu. It means like letus. Naître, it's the verb to be born. So here, it's like my letuses, letuses. Here, ness. So it means like uh, the present, like present form of naître. So ness, like plural, ness. And here, like vos laitus, like your, your laitus. And then naîtron, which is the future form of, um, of the verb naître, which means to be born. So here it's will be born, naîtron, naîtron, will be born. And if, like if and si. Si mes laitus vos laitus naîtron. If my laitus are born, your lettuces will be born. If my lettuces are born, your lettuces will be born. So like, as you can see, it's not, it's not really meaningful. But um, here, um, like usually in French, you don't use the verb naître. I think it's the same in English, to be born. You don't say that for, uh, for uh, lettuce. But like, you can understand the meaning if you say it. And in French, we understand. So here, What is interesting in this sentence is like there is no specific reason, like there is no peculiar reason why it's weird when you hear it. It's just weird. Like here you've got the repetition of those two sounds. Les tu, les tunais, les tunais. And les tunais is like, whoa, like a kind of weird sound in French. Um, like you cannot, you don't hear this combination a lot. Like, that's one of my explanations, but it's really hard to understand why this sentence is weird when you understand, when you hear it. Si mes laitunes, vos laitunes tron. Like, I, I, I feel like the sound tron is quite weird to understand. But anyway, so I'm gonna say all those sentences once again, and then that would be, it will be the end of the lesson. So, les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches Les chaussettes de l'archiduchesse sont sèches, sont-elles sèches ou archi-sèches Un chasseur chassant sachet doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Un chasseur sachant chasser doit savoir chasser sans son chien. Ok, I'm good. Suis-je, c'est ce cher Serge. Suis-je, c'est ce cher Serge. Suis-je, c'est ce cher Serge. Not really easy. Panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano, panier piano. Pas. Like here, I made, a, I made the mistake. Here, blé brûlé brûlé les blé brûlé 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 les blé. I made the mistake. Blé brûlé brûlé les blé blé brûlé brûlé les blé. Ok. Doit-on dire 16 sèche chaise ou bien 16 chaise sèche? 16 sèche chaise, 16 chaise sèche. Uh, really, like I think you cannot hear the difference because even for me, like it's really close. Doit-on dire 16 sèche sèche ou bien 16 chaise sèche? And here, so it was like the sentence. The sentence is difficult to say. And here, sentence is difficult to understand. Samedi, samedi, samedi. Samedi, samedi, samedi. Samedi, samedi, samedi. Kabul anolak. Kabul anolak. Kabul anolak. Kabul anolak. Like, usually for those two sentences, you have to say them um, like real fast. Kabul anolak. Kabul anolak. And here, si mes laitunes volaient une étron. Si mes laitunes volaient une étron. Si mes laitunes volaient une étron. So. That's all for today. Thank you for watching this video. Want to speak real French from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at frenchpod101.com. Hey guys, it's Pierre from France and welcome back for more videos on French learning. Today's video will be about casual French. Like, you know, maybe you've noticed that, but French people, when they speak as a casual way, The way they speak is really different from the way you've learned French at school. So here I'm going to explain what are the three, three main rules that are um, used in casual French. So first, this is the elision of the negation. This is really common and more and more French people are doing that even in non-casual situation. This is, you get rid of the ne and the n. So, for example, here, je ne sais pas, je ne sais pas, like, I don't know. So, you've learned that when you add the negation, you have to add ne and then the negation, like pas. But in, in practice, we get rid of it. So, here, you say, je sais pas, je sais pas. This is casual. 
Um, like if you want to stay polite, stay, like um, remain more polite, it's better to say that. But je sais pas, like I used that with my parents, with my family, with my friends. So this is uh, really common. And same when you have the N, which is the same word, just because here there is a vowel, you get rid of the E. So il n'y a personne, il n'y a personne. So I, again, like here, this is the negation and you've got the N, like the couple negative word and N. Il n'y a personne, il y a personne, il y a personne. So here, nothing, il y a personne, just this negation. The meaning is nobody's here, nobody's here. Il y a personne, il n'y a personne, il y a personne. So this is really easy, like you just get rid of that, no, no specific rule, like really easy. And I think this is really easy to get used to it. So this was the first one. The second one is the non-inversion. When you ask a question in French, you have to do the inversion and it's quite similar in English. But usually in, a casual, in casual situations, you don't do the inversion. So when you say, es-tu arrivé? Like, did you arrive? Es-tu arrivé? You just say, tu es arrivé. So here, like if it was not a question, tu es arrivé. So like to make the distinction between like an affirmative sentence and an, um, a question, this is the tonality and the context that will um, help you to understand if it's a question or not. Tu es arrivé? Tu es arrivé? Tu es arrivé. Like, this is quite subtle, especially here, because there is no con context. But um, usually it's not that hard to understand the difference. Tu es arrivé? Usually you go up at the end of the sentence. Tu es arrivé? Tu es arrivé? And yeah, you can guess with the context. So here you have that. But sometimes, you know, there is interrogative uh, words like comment, like in English, how. How do you make it? Comment fais-tu? Here, you can, there is two ways to become more casual. Comment tu fais? So here again, you don't do the inversion. But there is one other possibility, which is putting this at the end of the sentence. And of course, you don't do the inversion. So tu fais comment? Comment fais-tu? Comment tu fais? Tu fais comment? So here, you see that you can like, make uh, the order that you want for all these sentences, for, for this, like those three sentences, exactly the same meaning. Like those two ones are, like there is no subtlety of meaning between those two. Um, here it's more polite, but here it's like really equivalent. So you can choose what you want. And it's not only applicable, like you can also use that for, with other interrogative nouns. And you can also do that with um, other interrogative words, like combien, how much, or um, how old like quel age but there is one exception that you you need you need to keep in mind is que so the, when you ask a question you say que fais-tu which is quite polite what are you doing what are you doing que fais-tu in polite situation you cannot use uh, the non inversion you cannot say que tu fais no meaning in that it's totally wrong so what you can do is putting that at the end of the sentence. But if you do that, you don't use que, but you use quoi. Tu fais quoi? What are you doing? Tu fais quoi? So just remember that like que and quoi, it's quite different. Like there is uh, this little trick that you have to keep in mind. But basically, you don't do the inversion when you ask a question. And I think you can do that in English as well. So this is quite similar. So those two, two rules, Elision of the negation on and non-inversion are quite uh, easy to understand and like you will easily get used to it. But the last one is a bit more complicated because there are some rules. This is contractions, contractions. You know, like you can do some contractions in French, but in casual situations you can do even more contractions. So here there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven rules that I'm going to show you. And those, with this, you will be able to do casual contractions in French. So first, je. You know that when there is je and then a vowel, you have to do a contraction. 
but in casual situations, you can also do a contraction with a consonant. So in casual situations, with je, you always do a contraction. Je plus a consonant become j. So for example, je bois du vin, it means like I drink wine. I'm drinking wine. Je bois du vin. Je bois. Je bois. Je bois. Je bois. Je bois. So this is really casual. If you want to remain, like, if you want to be polite, it's better to say that. But with your friends, je bois will be way more natural. Here again, there is M, which is a consonant. Je m'appelle Pierre. Je m'appelle Pierre. Je m'appelle. So here you can see that there is two contractions. But uh, it's like it's not, as it is a common contraction, you, you don't pay attention to that. It's like the M, which is important. So you say just, je m'appelle. So here it's really easy and like it's better to say, je m'appelle with your friends than je m'appelle Pierre. But once again, if you say that, like if you don't do the contractions or even if you don't do those two, those two rules, like the elision of the non-inversion, it's definitely okay. It's just like if you really want to sound like a typical young French, it's better to know those rules. But like, who cares if you can speak like a young French? Like the, in a language, what is important is to be understood. So it, I'm just introducing you those rules like that you would be able to understand them. So this is with je. But there is one additional rule with je. It's when there is an s. So s is a consonant. So you can do either that, just that, or changing this sound into sh. So here, you remember that? Je ne sais pas, je sais pas. So here we are going to use the elision and also the contraction. So you can say je sais pas if you apply this rule. Je sais pas, je, ne sais, je sais pas, je sais pas. But it's quite hard to say je sais, je sais pas. Maybe you have difficulties to say it. So, usually, French people also say, je sais pas, je sais pas, je suis pas, je sais pas. I don't know if you can hear the difference, but um, it's way easier for the mouth and the tongue to say, je sais pas, instead of je sais pas. But you can say both. But um, personally, I use this one a lot, je sais pas. So here is an exa another example. Je suis perdu. I mean, like something like I'm lost. Je suis perdu. Je suis perdu. Je suis perdu. Or je suis perdu. Je suis perdu. Je suis perdu. Can you hear the difference? It's quite subtle. But anyway, this if you have difficulties to say that, just use the sound ch. And let's move on to the next one, which is with tu. So you know tu, there is no contraction usually, usually with tu. So here, in casual French, you can add one contraction when there is a vowel. Like you cannot do the contraction when there is um, a consonant, but when there is a vowel, you can do the contraction. So here, for example, tu as faim? It's a question, and you can notice like I'm doing again the non-inversion here. Tu as faim? T'as faim. Tu as faim, t'as faim. This is shorter, and we use that, this a lot. So here, there is a vowel, so we can do the contraction. But here, tu manges. You, ca you cannot do the, any contraction here. You have to say tu manges, even in casual situation. Tu manges. And let's move on to the next one, which is il. Here again, this is only with consonants. So, there is nothing you can do, no contraction you can do usually with il. It's like tu. But here with consonant and consonant only, not vowel this time, you can do a kind of contraction which is turning il into i. Like with a y, but uh, you say i. So when you say il mange quoi? Question. Again, like you can see that I'm using this pattern. What are you doing? Tu fais quoi? Il mange quoi? So I'm using this pattern. Uh, il mange quoi? 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 But here, if there is a vowel, il était malade, you cannot do any contraction. You have to say, il était malade. Il était malade. You cannot just use i. 
So, il mange quoi? Il mange quoi? And there is one exception, like, which is not really a kind of exception, but uh, like it's, like, it's not like a contraction, but it's an elision of il. It's when you hear il y a. For example, il y a deux ans, two years ago, il y a deux ans. Instead of doing il y a, you just say ya. Yeah. Like, you get rid of this and you add this to the, this letter and you say ya, yeah. ya. Yeah. Il y a deux ans, il y a deux ans, two years ago. Il y a deux ans, formal situation, casual situation, il y a deux ans, two years ago. So we've seen je, tu, il, like personal pronoun, but here is another form of, like the equivalent of je is me, the equivalent of tu is te, and the equivalent of il is se. So here, with that, there is also a contraction that you can do when there is, again, a consonant. Because usually, when there is a vowel, you do the contraction. But here, in casual French, you can do also the contraction with the consonant. So here, like the same rule is applied. Je me fais à manger. Je me fais à manger. Like, I'm cooking for myself. I'm cooking myself. Je me fais à manger. I'm cooking for myself. So you can say, je me fais, je me fais, je me fais. Je me fais, je me fais. But you see that there is also here, je, and a consonant. So you can also do, je me fais. But you cannot do both, because it's really hard. You cannot say the two contractions in the same time. The idea of a contraction is to speak easier, like to have an easy way to speak and a faster way to speak. Um, but here, it's really hard to say if you try to do the two contractions. So we don't do that. We never do that. So here you have to choose between one of the two. And it's exactly the same meaning. There is no, no nuance in the meaning. So, je me fais, je, je me fais, je me fais, je me fais, je me fais. Formal situation, je me fais. And then you can choose in casual situation, je me fais or je me fais. I don't know if you can hear the difference, but again, as long as you can understand when someone say je me fais, like you don't care which kind of contraction he used, what is important is you understand the meaning of the sentence. So here again with te, tu te promènes, tu te promènes, tu te promènes, tu te promènes, tu te promènes. Like, I think it's quite hard to hear my T sometimes. Tu te promènes. Tu te promènes. So this is a way to contract um, the, the, the te. Tu te promènes. Tu te promènes. Tu te promènes. Tu te promènes. So again, consonant here, P, you can do the contraction. And here, il se couche tôt. 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 Like he is going to bed early. Il se couche tôt. And here, you can also use this rule, because here there is il plus a consonant. Il se couche tôt. And here you can apply both rules. You can do this one and this one. And like in this situation, you can do with il, you can uh, tr transform the il into i. So, it means like you have to say, iskushto, 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 il skushto, iskushto, il se kushto, formal situation, il skushto, casual situation, and iskushto, even more casual, like it's like the same casuality, like the, the same casualness, il skushto, iskushto, so. Don't, like, don't focus too much on the difference. There is no real difference between those two. So here you can, like, just keep in mind that you can do the contraction with that, and here you cannot. Like the two contractions you cannot, and here you can do the two contractions. The reason is it's really easy to say when you do the two contractions here, and you, it's not easy to say when you do the con two contractions here. So if you want a real reason for what we can do two contractions here and not two here, it's because it's easy to say in French. Is couche Really easy, no, dif no, any, no, no difficulties. And let's move on to another one, which is again with E. 
which is that this time is le and de. And again, when there is a consonant, you can say l or de. Usually, you have to do that again when there is a vowel, but here you can also, in casual situations, again, you can do with a consonant. So, when you say j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, this is like formal, the formal form. You can say j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, okay. like formal situation, j'ai pas le temps, and in a, a casual situation, j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps, j'ai pas le temps. So here it's with le, but here is an example with de. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. Like the train goes from Paris to Mar Marseille, which is a city in the south of France. And here, I forgot to translate that, but j'ai pas le temps, like, I don't have time. Quite easy. I don't have time. J'ai pas le temps, pas le temps. So here, le train va de Paris à Marseille. 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 Usually, like it's, sometimes it's quite easy, difficult to say deep, the, those two sounds. So sometimes the D turns into a kind of T. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. So this is not exactly a D, not exactly a T. It's like a kind of in between, but don't focus too much on, on that. As long as you can understand again, this is quite fine. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. This one, like, I think, le train va de Paris à Marseille, I would use both. Like, even in casual situations, I think I, I might also say de Paris à Marseille. But uh, I guess it depends on the feeling. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. Le train va de Paris à Marseille. So, again, le de, with only consonant. Because usually you can do the contraction when there is a vowel. No need to be in a casual situation. And the last one is like a kind of, some sort of general rule of what we've seen. Because here you've noticed that there is e. Here again, e, 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 e. Like e in English, but e is the French way to say e in English, in French. So here, you, do, you can do a contraction when there is a consonant. But in fact, you can do a contraction with e, like you can always do a contraction with e when there is a consonant just after uh, e. So it's also something that is true in the middle of words. So here, when I say petit cheval, like a small horse, petit cheval, small horse, you can say petit cheval, petit cheval. Here, I get rid of the e here. And here again, because there is a vowel, uh, there is a consonant here, t, the T and the V, so I can say petit cheval, petit cheval, petit cheval. It's not like, you can say just one if you want, or the two, or even none of them, but um, like, it's quite common to say that, petit cheval. And here, I'm just going to do the contraction for cheval, petit cheval, petit cheval. So here, I just get rid of the E, of the E in cheval. Petit cheval. Petit cheval. So, petit cheval, full sentence. Petit cheval. And then, petit cheval. So here, I just did one contraction, and I'm going to do the two contractions. Petit cheval. Petit cheval. And here is another one, which is really common in French, even in non-casual situation. This is the verb acheter. Acheter, to buy in English. You have, because here there is an E and there is T, you can say acheter, acheter. But there is one subtility. You know that sometimes when you use the conjugations of this verb, you can add the accent. For example, when you say j'achète, here, there is an accent. So here, like this rule, you can only use it when there is no accent. Here there is an accent, so you cannot, like I don't know how you would manage to do it, because it's really hard. You cannot do the contraction here. But if there is no accent in the middle of the word, 
you can do this contraction. So this with the verb acheter, you can do the contraction sometimes when there is no accent. Acheter, acheter du pain, to buy some bread. Acheter du pain, acheter. Acheter, acheter. No contraction, acheter. With the contraction, acheter. So, here we've seen that this is kind of generalization of those rules. So, so far we've seen that we can do the elision of the negation. Ne, you get rid of it. You can also get rid of the mandatory inversion in questions. Es-tu arrivé? Tu es arrivé. With some exceptions that you have to keep in mind with que. And also contractions which are really important in casual French with all those rules. Je, tu, il, me, te, se, le, de, and e in middle of words. So now you know how to use that, but maybe you don't know when to use that. Like the distinction between casual and formal is not quite true. Like in many situations at shops and stuff like that, you will do sometimes the contractions. But what, what you have to keep in mind as a French learner is um, the less contractions and the less casual French you use, the clearer you are. So like sometimes when a friend don't understand what I'm saying, when I will repeat the sentence, even if it's a French person, I will use, I will get rid of all those rules. I will say the full sentences because it's clearer to speak with that. So if you're not confident with the French pronunciation, I think it's better not to use that. So why learning that? I think it's also important to learn that because when you speak to someone like a French person, he can sometimes speak with that. Like this, this person can sometimes use casual French. So it's good to know that to be able to understand what he is saying. But for you, the, what is important is to be understood. So just use uh, like full sentences instead of using contractions and stuff like that if you're not confident enough. Well, that's all for today. Hey guys, it's Pierre from France. Welcome back for more videos on French learning. Today's lesson will be about French numbers, les nombres en français, in French. So, French numbers are infamous for being really, really complicated. And I have to admit that this is quite true. But with this lesson, you will know all the details and you will know everything you have to know about numbers in French and they will not be as difficult as you may think. So first, on the whiteboard, you'll see all the figures between 0 and 99. And I will explain how you can say all those numbers in French. So on this table, you will see blue numbers and black numbers. Blue numbers are numbers that you have to remember and black numbers are just compositions of blue numbers. So if you remember all the blue words, you will be able to say all the black ones if you know the logic behind the black ones. So let's get started with the first ones, the units. This is quite easy. Like in a lot of languages, you have to remember all that by heart. So let's get started with zero. It's the same than in English, but you have to say zero. Zero. Zero in French. So this is the first one. And one is un. Uh, this is quite hard to say for a non-native French speaker. But this, un, you say it un. 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 This is quite hard. Don't worry if you cannot do it. Like it's, uh, as long as we can understand you, I'm always saying that, but as long as we can understand you, it's definitely okay. Try to do something that is that looks like a un, and as long as you can, we can understand you. It's fine. So un, un. The next one is deux, deux, deux. So here you see there is um, an X, and you don't have to say it. But there is a liaison in some cases, like if you have um, a vowel after deux, like de oiseaux, two birds, de oiseaux, you have to do the liaison with the X. Be careful with that. If you have troubles with the liaison, you can see one of the other videos I made. So, de. Next one is trois, trois. Here again, you, can, you have to do the liaison if there is a vowel. Again, three birds, 
trois oiseaux. But usually alone, you just say trois, trois, trois. So you don't say the S, trois, except if after that there is a vowel. But anyway, trois, zéro, un, deux, trois. Next one is quatre, quatre, four, quatre, quatre. Then you have cinq, five, cinq, cinq. So here you say everything. This one, six, is like in English, but in French you have to say six. This is quite unusual in French, but here the X is like an S. Six. Six. So be careful, here there is no liaison that you have to do, it's just the X you have to say S. Six. Six. So be careful with that. Six. Okay, you're good? Okay. Next one. Seven, it's set. Set. This one is a little tricky with the spelling because here there is a P and this P you don't say it, like not at all. Only the T. So you have to say set. Set. The next one is huit. Huit. So here like silent H and huit. Huit. And the last one is neuf. 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 So you know all the units so far. So I'm gonna say them once again. Zéro, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf. Okay. So now you know all the ten first numbers if we include zero. So try to repeat that by yourself and that would be a good practice. And you will remember, you need to get your tongue used to those um, words. So don't hesitate to repeat those words in front of your computer. It's really useful for a good training. So, this was quite easy. The second part is a bit uh, more tricky, but still not that complicated. So for the next, um, like from 10 to 19, you have, to, you have new words that you have to remember. And to be exact, it's only until 16 says. So here, when you want to say 10, you say this. And as you can see, or as you can hear, this, again, there is an X, like 6, but I said S. This. So this one, six, this. So you have to remember that with IX in, 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 in numbers, like six, this, it's always an S, this, this. So be careful with that. Then, the next one, 11, onze, onze. Then the next one, 11, onze, onze. So here, this is sort of a transformation of un, onze, un, onze. If you have trouble to remember, you can still see some Similarities, similarities between this and that, but uh, it's better to learn by heart. So, onze, onze. Next one is douze, douze, douze. So here you can see it's it looks like a bit like two, but still different. But what is hard is sometimes with de when you do the liaison like deux oiseaux. It's it looks like douze. So I'm gonna say 12 birds and two birds and try to catch the difference. Deux oiseaux. Douze oiseaux. Deux oiseaux. Douze oiseaux. Can you catch the difference? It's quite hard, but um, you will learn with practice. But don't hesitate to repeat again what I just said. I'm gonna say it once again. Deux oiseaux. Douze oiseaux. This is quite hard when you're not a native speaker. So be careful with that. If there is no liaison, de, douze, okay, you can catch the difference. But if there is the liaison, be careful. So next one is treize. Treize. So here again, there is the TR, which is kind of the three mark. So treize. Treize. Next one is quatorze. So here there is the quat this kind of Q, U, 
Q-U-A-T mark, 14, 14. As you can see, there is always this Z-E at the end of those figures, those numbers. So, next one is 15, 15. Again, this is more tricky, but you can still think of the Q, but don't mistake with that. So yeah, be careful with that. 15, 15. And the last one of this series is 16, which is says, says. So here the S and the S, but be careful not to confuse with the seven. So yeah, says, says. I'm going to say them once again. So, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, so you've got all the figures, all the numbers from 10 to 16, but then here it's a bit different. For 17, you have to say 17, 17. So here, as you can see, there is 10, 10, 10, and 7, set, set. If you add up 10 and 7, you get 17. This is kind of logical, but harder than in other languages. 17, 17, 17. So usually when you speak French, because here there is the dis, the s, that you, the x that you have to say s, and there is also the S here. So usually you just say once the S because it would be too hard to say both. This set. You can say that, but it's better and faster and easier to say um, this set. This set. So as you can see, I'm just saying this set. I'm saying the S only once, okay? So try again to repeat those um, numbers. Um, that's a, that would be a good practice for you. So, this set, 10 plus 7, this set. And don't forget to add the dash here. It's really important. And when you compound, you do composition with numbers, you always have to add the dash. So, be careful with that. This set, this set. Next one is 18, 18. Again, same logic. 10 plus 8, 18, 18. So usually, sometimes it's a bit like a Z, a Z sound. 18, 18, 18, 18. Can you catch the difference? If you just say this and 8, you hear 18, 18. But as it is more, it is easier and like faster in French, usually we say 18, 18. So the, the S sound of the this here become an, a Z sound, 18, 18. And the next one is 19. So here, no tricks. 19, 19. It's like you say this and that. 19, 19. So you say 17, 18, 19. Here, 17, remember it's S, just one S. Here, 18. So it's like a Z sound here, 18. And the next one is 19, 19. So here, same situation, you can say Z, uh, Z sound instead of the S, but you're not, uh, it's okay if you don't say it, it's just more easier, like easier and faster. And that's what uh, P French people say a lot. So let's sum it up. Here, you just say S, D set, D set just like if there, it was only one S. Here, you can say this, huit, and here, this, neuf, this, huit, this, neuf. But don't be surprised if you see here some sort of Z sound. This, neuf, this, huit, this, neuf, this, huit. So with an S, this, huit, this, huit, this, huit. So here, be careful. Maybe you cannot catch the difference, but it's okay. Just, it's good to know that you can hear some difference in the pronunciation, but be careful. So this was uh, for the, from 10 to 19. As you can see, from 10 to 16, new words that you need to remember. And here, 
like you just need to do some additions. So with 10 and 7, 8, 9. 7, 8, 9. So let's move on to the next one. And it's still not that hard. You need to remember those numbers. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So it's like 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. So this is kind of easy. You need to remember those figures. So again, you can see some similarity between uh, the figures. So here, TR, TR, 30, but don't, conf don't be confused with 13, so 30. Here again, 40. Here, really easy, you can see all the, like you can see 5, 5, you can see, so exactly the same, 5, 5, 50. And here, like the S and the IX, which is kind of close to the 6, 6 in French, 6. If you're sometimes confused with the first tense digit, just remember that for those ones, it's always with the E at the end. And for those ones, it's always with ot at the end. Even though here it's an E and here it's an A, it's always the same pronunciation, ot, ot, except for 20. But remember that when it's ot, it means like it's um, a multiple of 10. So, 30, 40, 50, 60. So you know how to say those figures, but maybe you want to say 21, 22, 33, and those stuffs. So here are the rules for that. It's quite easy. Again, you just add up numbers. It's like in English. There's just one little rule that you need to remember. The first one, the, this little rule is with one. You have to add this keyword, E. It's like end in English. So, 20, 21, 21. So here, some specificities of that. 20, when you say 20, this is silent. G, T, you don't say it, just 20, 20. It's like the drink, 20. Like it's like wine in French, 20. But here, if you want to say 21, you add 1, because you do the addition, 20 plus 1. But since it's a 1 in French, you have to say this end. So just remember that. And here you've got the dashes again, but as you can see here, there is a T and here there is a E. So T, silent T, plus vowel. This is a case of a liaison. So you have to say 21, 21. So here, this T is not silent and you have to repeat it. 21, 21. Here, remember, in the liaison, in the lesson about liaison, we said that you never do the liaison with a E. And here it's E. So you don't do the liaison. 21, 21. So this is the same for all those ones. So 31, 31. It's not written here, but for 41, you say 41, 41. Then, 51, 61, 61, 41, 51. So here, you have uh, always the E that you have to say. But, it's only with the one. For the others, it's really easy. You just say this, one of those, and then you add the unit. So, for example, 45. You just say 45, 40, 40, and 5, 5. Quite easy for now. So you can say that for all the numbers here. So let's get to the last one of this series. 69, 69, 69, 69. So you just put the 60 here, 60, and 9, 69. Quite easy. So, to sum, to sum it up for this part, you, you learn 20, 30, 40, 15, and 16. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Then you just add the unit, except in one situation, 
if, if it's, you want to add a 1, you need to add the E, the E. So here, it's like you learn this word, like for 20, if X is a 2 or 6 or 5 or 4 or 3. Here, you add, you use 20 and 1, and you add this E. And for the other ones, you just use one of those, and you add the unit. So for 22, 23, until 29, and again, the same for those ones. So quite easy. A new word to learn, and then you add up, except for one, where you add the E, the E. Okay, how do you find French numbers so far? It's not that hard, right? You just remember that, and it's okay. You just you do addition except for this situation that you have to do the addition for those three numbers, 17, 18, 19, it's not that hard. But this is way it starts to be more tricky in French. So let's move on to the next section from 17 to, se from 70 to 79. This is kind of weird. Here, for 70, you have to say 70 which is the addition of 60 and this, 60 plus 10. So as you can see, you take this and this, 60, this. So here, it's like you take this series, you use the 60 and you add up all the numbers. So 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, and then you keep doing that. 70. And then you do the same. 71. Here again, there is the one, so you have to add the E. 71. 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. So here, for, for this one, you have to keep counting until 19, until 19. So here you add up just from 1 to 9, but for 60, you need to add up until 19. So, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. Okay, so kind of weird because we didn't stop, we stop at 9 here and here you have to stop at 19. And then if you remember here it's already an addition, 10, 9. So here when you say 79, it's like an addition of 16, 60, 10 and 9. It's kind of weird, but for French people when you learn that at school, you just don't ask question, you're just learning that by heart. So you're just used to it. But if you think of the logic behind, it's kind of weird, even for me. So, just remember that for this one, you need to add up 10, 11, until 19, this until 19, 19. And the next one is like completely crazy. 80, 80, 80. 80, we don't have like a word to say 80. What we say, we, we say 80, which is like 4 times 20. 4 times 20 equals 80. But in French, you just say 4, 20. 80, 4. So here, 4, 20. So here, 20. Why? I don't know. You just need to remember that. 4, 20. 4, 20. Try to repeat again your numbers. So, 4, 20. Here it's like 4 times 20. Try to, re to repeat it. 4, 20. 4, 20. And here you can see that there is in red, there is in red this S. Because again, French is kind of annoying. I know, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but um, there is this plural. Here you do 4 times 20. And if you do 4 times 20, you need to add an S because there is, like, there are not just 1, uh, 20, but 4, 20, 4, 20. 
and it's like four twenties. So you have to add the S. But what is again tricky is like that's the only case where you add the S. Because if you move on to the next one, because then if you remember 80, you just need to add numbers again. So here 81, 81. So you just add, you take this 80 and you add one. But here, if there is if there is a dash after 20, you just get rid of the S. So the S is only for this case when you say 80. When you say 80, it's just here that you have to put the S. Then there is no S. There is no logic behind. I'm I'm, I'm so sorry for you guys because it's really difficult to learn. But if you get used to it, that's going to be fine. So 81. So here you do 4 times 20 plus 1. 80. 80. 81. And as you can see here, there is no E. In this specific situation with 80, there is nothing that you have to add. And here, there is no liaison that you have to do with, um, with the T. 80 is kind of really annoying. So 80 is like a unique word. There is no S, no S, if you add something after that. And you never do the liaison with this specific 80. But here, you had to add the E, and you have to do the liaison. But not here. 80, just remember that it's uh, like some sort of isolated word. But there is still the dash. So let's move on to the next ones. I guess you can say, if you know the logic, you, you understood the logic, so you can try by yourself. Just try by yourself before I try to say it. So the next one is 82. So 82. 80. So 4 times 20. 82. 82. And you do that, so on and so on, until 89. 89. So 9. But again, here, in fact, you don't stop until 9. You keep going until 19. So here, it's like here with 60, where you say 70. Here, you say 90. 90. It's like 4 times 20 plus 10. 90. 91. 92. 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. So, the, like, the last one is, like, completely crazy. You say 99, which is, like, 4 times 20 plus 10 plus 9. 99. Kind of weird. But if you have trouble with that, like, the math, we don't care about the math here. Just remember that 80. 80 is like um, the way you say 18. You don't care like it's 4 times 20. You just remember that it's 80. 80. And then, when you understand this 80, you just add the numbers, 81, 82. Just remember that you have to add that up until 19. So 81, 82, 83, etc. until 99. So here you just remember that, 80, you can try to remember that as like a single word. And then you add up. So if you can remember that, that's going to be perfectly fine. 80. When I was young, personally, I didn't realize that this one was 80. I just learned 80 as like a unique word, like 30, 40, 50, 80. I just thought that 80 was like some sort of unique word. And then what I had to do is just add up. So, to sum that up, here, you know the unit, right? Here, you remember that you have to, re you have those new words that are, you have to remember, and then these additions. Then, it's always the same logic. You need to remember, um, like, the first one, like with the zero, but then, you just add up with numbers. There is this little exception with the one, E. Then, here, you just remember 20, 30, so 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 
and you can remember 80 as a sort of number. So here, see that as a blue one. You should remember that as a blue one. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80. And you remember that here you count like from, one, from 0 to 10, uh, from 0 to 9, here again, here again, here again. Here you have, you have to count from 0 to 19. 60, 79. From 0 to 19. And the same for this one. If you remember that like 80 is some sort of unique word, you have to remember that you count from 18, from 0 to 19. So 20 from 0 to 9, from 0 to 9, from 0 to 9, from 0 to 9, from 0 to 19. And this one from 0 to 19. And here you know how to count in French. Maybe you want to know how to say um, like 100 or 1000. So I'm just going to give you that to finish. So here, this one is 100, quite easy. And for this one, it's 1000. Then it's really easy with those two ones. If you want to say uh, like 110, you just say 101. Uh, sorry, I said 10. So, 110, 105, 199, 199, 199. And then it's the same for 1000. Like if you want to say 1001, like 1001, uh, you say 1001, 1010, 1080. So you can remember those ones then the additions are really easy. You just need, if you want like to say 2000, you just put the two here and you add like de. Don't focus too much on the dashes. Some, like originally the rule is you don't put dashes, but nowadays you can put dashes. So don't focus too much on that. If you want to remember one rule, just remember that between all the numbers, there is a dash. But we don't write a lot of numbers in letters, so don't focus too much on, on that. So here, 2000. So now you know how to count. Those ones are not that important, just remember that. This is all for French figure, French numbers. This is kind of hard, I know. I guess, I hope that you managed to understood that. And if you didn't manage, you can try to see uh, the panel, like the whiteboard, and try to repeat again and again. It's a good practice for you. I was only presenting, like uh, I was only introducing you to French numbers from France. Because in Belgium, for example, you have some different rules, but this is like some sort of standard French. So remember that and you will be fine. That's all for today. And I really hope you liked this video. And if you did like this video, you can Uh, subscribe on our channel and click on the like button and leave a comment in the comment section and that's all for me it was Ma it was Pierre I see you on next time hey guys it's Pierre from France welcome back for more videos on French learning today's lesson will be about 10 casual questions that French people can ask you and you should know how to answer how to answer those questions that's important Because usually when you meet French people, they will, there, is always some, there are always some questions that they will ask you in a certain way that you don't learn in textbook. So, without further ado, let's get started with something quite easy. Like, what's your name? What's your name? Usually you, ner you learn at school that you say, Comment t'appelles-tu? Comment t'appelles-tu? But usually... French people don't say that and they say tu t'appelles comment or comment tu t'appelles. So this is for what's your name? Tu t'appelles comment? Comment tu t'appelles? What's your name? And the answer is like what you learn at school, what you learn in textbook. Je m'appelle Pierre. Je m'appelle Pierre. So here you can see that we don't do the inversion and that we can, play, we can put comment 
like here or here. If you didn't watch the video on casual French, you should watch it. This is explained there. So this one is quite easy, like it doesn't really count. Let's move on to the next one. This one doesn't really count because it's really easy. But this one is also quite easy. How are you? Like, how do you do? You know, it's like, comment vas-tu? Usually you learn that in textbook. Comment vas-tu? Comment vas-tu? But usually French people don't say that. They say, ça va? With like a question tone. Ça va? Or even, ça va bien? Ça va bien? Ça va bien? Ça va? So here, as you can see, there is um, this um, kind of question tone. Or you can say, comment ça va? Comment ça va? Or even, tu vas bien? Like question, tu vas bien? And for all those three questions, you can answer like, ça va? Or, ça va bien? Or even, je vais bien? So here, like, bien, you can just say ça va, you not, it's not like uh, something that you have to say, but here you have to say bien, you cannot just say je vais. So for example, you can hear that in French, ça va, ça va. So first person, ça va, the answer is ça va, ça va, ça va. So here is like, how do you do, how do you do, but it's quite common in French to hear ça va, ça va. So here, if you hear that, don't be surprised and just answer like, ça va or ça va bien. Again, this one is quite easy. This is not like something quite personal. Uh, but then let's move on to more personal questions. So here is one of the main questions that you can hear. Uh, it's like, where are you from? Tu viens d'où? Tu viens d'où? Or even more accurate, tu viens de quelle ville? Like, which which city or which country, quel pays? Tu viens de quel pays? Tu viens de quelle ville? So, which city? Tu viens de quelle ville? Which country? Tu viens de quel pays? Or, like more generic, tu viens d'où? Tu viens d'où? Where are you from? Où is like where. So here, you can answer with je viens, like the typical answer for either of those questions is like je viens and then you can add like the city or um, uh, the country but here in French it's a bit tricky as you may probably know nouns in French have a gender like feminine or um, masculine it's the same for countries and cities cities it's always feminine like Paris, London Paris, Londres, is always feminine. So, uh, but countries, you have to remember if it's masculine, uh, feminine, or not. Like sometimes it's even plural, like United States, Etats-Unis. So this is kind of tricky and you need to learn your country. So please check for your country. But if you're one of those countries, you have the example here, like Etats-Unis, it's plural. So with plural, for this answer, you have to say de. Je viens des États-Unis. Je viens des États-Unis. This is like the de here, and this is like the plural form. If the word is feminine, so for every city, it's quite easy, but also for some country like um, France or uh, Belgium, you have to say de. Je viens de Londres. Je viens de France. Je viens de Belgique. Je viens d'Allemagne. Like Germany, it's uh, feminine as well, and you have to say de. But here, because Germany starts with an A in French, Allemagne, you have to do the contraction. So, je viens d'Allemagne. So, here, like many countries are feminine, most of the countries are feminine in French. But there are some that are masculine. This is the case for Japan. And when the word is masculine, you have to say du, which is the contraction of de and le. Le is uh, the masculine uh, word in French. So here it's like de le, so it becomes du, du Japon. Je viens du Japon. Like if you come from Morocco, 
you have to say je viens du Maroc because Morocco is masculine. So this is what you can answer. Specific questions, more general questions. And always the same answer and please you have to check for your country. Um, if you are from England, je viens d'Angleterre, same as Germany. Angleterre is uh, something masculine, uh, Ang Angleterre is something feminine, feminine. So here, je viens d'Angleterre with the contraction of the D. So let's move on to the next one. Now, it's still about locations, but now it's where you live. Où est-ce que tu habites? Où est-ce que tu habites? This is quite common, and maybe you've learned that on textbook. I think I would probably use one of those two sentences if I have to ask a question to someone. Où est-ce que tu habites? Où est-ce que tu habites? Or, t'habites où? T'habites où? Or even, tu habites où? Here, as you can see, there is this unusual contraction. When you learn French, you don't learn this kind of contraction. Because uh, in the video I made a casual French, I'm explaining the rule for that, but I'm going to repeatedly, uh, uh, briefly say it again. Uh, so here, tu, like tu habites, in a casual way, you can just uh, do a contraction if there is a vowel sound here. So tu habites, like vowel, habite, so you can say t'habites où, t'habites où, où est-ce que tu habites, t'habites où. So one of those two questions, you can hear that, and if you hear one of, the, one of these, you have like uh, to answer with one of those questions. So here again, there is uh, gender for uh, like countries and um, and uh, cities. So cities is still like always feminine, uh, but you have to remember. So here, this is uh, the important to remember that you have a o o. So here, with plural, so Etats-Unis, which is plural, you have to say O, silent X, O. If it's feminine, you have to say A, A. So like London, like, or any other city, you have to say J'habite à Londres. J'habite à Londres. So here, um, this is kind of easy. Don't forget the accent on the A. It's not the verb. Avoir, like to have, it's uh, like a preposition, so not a verb. Be careful with that. To distinguish with the verb, you add the accent. And here, au Japon, it's like for all masculine words. Please note that this is the same pronunciation for O and O. But here, since there is a vowel here, you have to do the liaison. Again, there is a video on liaison that is important and you can check if you don't know the rules. So here, aux Etats-Unis. So I'm going to say uh, some other examples. So if you're from England and you live in England, you say j'habite en Angleterre. So here, it's another case. This is feminine and for uh, cities, it's always a. But for en, when you have to use en, it's when you have a country which is feminine. For example, j'habite en France. J'habite en Allemagne. I live in France or I live in Germany. So be careful. This is only for city. And with countries, it's en. So j'habite en France. J'habite en France. So only for city, the A. Here it's like feminine, but for country. So be careful, because for uh, city it's always A, but for country it's en when it's feminine. So be careful with that, it's really important. En France. But maybe you don't want to be as accurate, or maybe you're living in France now, and the, you're living in the same city than a friend, and this friend wants to know where you live, because he wants to visit you. So you can say, like if you live close to the station, for example, you can say, j'habite près de la gare. J'habite 
près de la gare, like close to the station, close to the station. Or if you live close to your university, because you are like an exchange student or like an international student, you can say j'habite près de l'université. Like university, it's like the same as in English, except that here it's the E with an accent. J'habite près de l'université, like close to the university. So this is quite common question and this is some sort of answer here more more um, general here and here more uh, specific like where in the city where in the city are you living so now we've seen like some classic questions uh, I'm gonna explain some other questions which are kind of important those two are quite easy like how old are you quel âge as-tu usually you learn that quel âge as-tu how old are you? But usually we don't say that in French. With it, we say ta quel âge? Or tu as quel âge? Here again, casual French. So contraction between the tu and the a, because here this is a vowel. Like this is the same than here. Contraction. Ta quel âge? Ta quel âge? This is quite common question. So here the answer is the same that in the polite way. J'ai 20 ans. J'ai 20 ans. If you are 20. Like you say, j'ai 20 ans. Here, another question uh, which can be useful if you're living in France and you have French friends and some relationships uh, with French people, you, can, you may have a phone number that you want to share with people or people want you to share your phone number. So here, c'est quoi ton numéro? Means like, what is your phone number? C'est quoi ton numéro? This is kind of casual with friends. You will learn that... Uh, Quite a lot. And the answer is C'est le 06 08 86 55 77, for, ex for example. But he, remember that in French, when you say uh, numbers, phone numbers, you, j you always say um, like two by two. So here it's like 06 08 86 55 77. So I put the dots here that usually you don't write when you write your number, but it's like a way to explain that you just take them two by two, okay? So, c'est quoi ton numéro? C'est le 06, 08, etc, etc. So, this is kind of common. And maybe you know, you've noticed, I forgot this one. This one is uh, kind of special. If you speak, like as a non-native French speaker, you can, sometimes, like, you will not be understood. And the person will ask, oh, what did you say? Something like that. And he would say in French, comment? Or quoi? Quoi is a bit more, it's like more, it's uh, ruder than comment. Uh, comment means like, oh, I didn't understand. I want you to repeat. But this is a kind of specific question. This is like a casual question. And the answer to this question is just repeat or rephrase your sentence. So comment? Quoi? And please note that it's not because someone, like some French people, ask you to repeat, like with a comment or quoi, that it means that you're like not good at French. It's like even for French people sometimes we ask this. So don't be worried about that. Uh, comment? So you just repeat. So for example, I said, je viens des états unis I said this sentence quite fast. So you didn't understand. And you want, to, you want me to repeat. So you say, comment? Or if you want to be clearer, you can just say, can you repeat please? So in French, est-ce que tu peux répéter? Est-ce que tu peux répéter? Est-ce que tu peux répéter? So this is equivalent, this is a question equivalent to comment or quoi. So if you hear that, don't be surprised and just try to repeat or rephrase your sentence. So that's all for that. Let's move on to some more um, specific questions and different formulations. Uh, so here, like concerning your birthday, this is a question that you can be asked. So here, like, 
this, this is the first way to say it, like tenecon, tenecon. So here again, contraction between tu and e, because there is a vowel, a casual contraction, ne, like born, and con, con, like when. You can also add the, uh, the con here, like contene, but it's more, like, it's more common to say tenecon. It means like, where are you born, when are you born? So, tenecon, this is quite a classic question. Or, if they want specific, like your birthday in particular, they would maybe say, uh, they, they might be, uh, they might say, c'est quand ton anniversaire? C'est quand ton anniversaire? C'est quand ton anniversaire? Like, when is your birthday? C'est quand ton anniversaire? Again, casual way. Maybe, um, you have, you, you've learned in your textbooks, um, quand est-ce qu'est ton anniversaire? Quand est-ce qu'est ton anniversaire? But here it's uh, like the more casual way to say that. And the answer for that is, like for any questions, you can answer any sentences. So you can say, uh, je suis né le 10 janvier 1990. Je suis né le 10 janvier 1990. I forgot to put the le here, which is really important. Je suis né le 10 janvier 1990. Or you can say, just like, take this C again and say, c'est le 10 janvier 1990. Even if they ask you, c'est quand ton anniversaire, you can still answer with, je suis né le 10 janvier 1990. Je suis né le 10 janvier 1990. Or maybe it would be more common to say, c'est le 10 janvier 1990. So here, like some classic answers, but be careful if you hear those questions and not what you've learned in your textbooks. And the last three ones are uh, like kind of long questions, but French people often ask those questions, so be prepared for that. So here, three ways to, say, to ask the same question. I'm not gonna say it in English, first I'm gonna read them. So, ça fait combien de temps que tu apprends le français? Ça fait combien de temps que tu apprends le français? Can you understand the meaning? Here, I didn't write always the, I didn't write the translation in English because it's a good practice for you to try to translate before I'm giving you the translation. So here, the question is... Okay, maybe you've found the meaning of that, but let's move on to the next one. T'apprends le français depuis combien de temps? T'apprends le français depuis combien de temps? T'apprends le français depuis combien de temps? So this one, like same meaning. Or here, t'as commencé quand à apprendre le français? T'as commencé quand à apprendre le français? I forgot the question mark just here, but like it's roughly the same meaning. This one, the, if you translate this one, you have to say, like, it would be something like, for how long have you been learning French? For how long have you been learning French? Ça fait combien de temps que tu apprends le français? Or you can even do the contraction here, que t'apprends le français. Like, I did the contraction here, but you can also just say tu. It's like the same than here. T'as quel âge? Tu as quel âge? So here, this one, those two sentences are uh, like exactly the same translation. Uh, like, for how long have you been learning French? Just uh, two casual way to say it, two different casual way. And the last one is a bit different. It's like, when did you start learning French? When did you start learning French? In a casual way. T'as commencé quand à apprendre le français? So here it's like roughly the same meaning. So here the answer would be like one of those two sentences, like for any of those questions, you can answer one of those two sentences. Ça fait deux ans. So here, you can see that there is a ça fait and the same than here. Even though you can answer for uh, um, any of those questions, here you can see that it's kind of the same pattern. Uh, it's quite difficult to translate in English, but the meaning is here, like I have been learning French for de, two years, deux ans. Ça fait deux ans. It's like kind of short way to say that. Ça fait. Here it's like the verb, uh, 
um, like uh, faire, which is like do, to do. This is quite common in French to say uh, ça fait like for uh, amounts or uh, distance or um, like time. You can say ça fait. So like if you want to say uh, the price of something, you can say ça fait deux euros. Ça fait deux euros. Like uh, it costs two euros. But in French you can say just ça fait. Ça fait deux euros. So here again is like ça fait deux ans, which is what you see here in the question. Like for how long have you been learning French? How ça fait deux ans. Ça fait combien de temps que tu apprends le français? Ça fait deux ans. Deux ans. But if you want to do something with like when you started, you want to use the verb start in French, which is commencer. You can say j'ai commencé il y a deux ans. So here, il y a, it's like ago. So here, two years ago. So in French, um, like you, the ago is before uh, the, the time. So here, j'ai commencé il y a deux ans. I've started two years ago. Il y a deux ans. Il y a trois ans. Il y a trois heures. Like three hours ago, but if you started French three hours ago, that's good. But uh, it's not that long, so you probably not you will probably not answer that that question with this. So j'ai commencé il y a deux ans. So this is kind of common way to answer those questions. And personally, when I meet someone, like I'm always uh, wondering when they start learning uh, the language they learn. And uh, so that's really common question that you will probably hear if you go to France. Here is something uh, also related to your French learning. It's like, how, do you, how did you uh, translate, how did you learn French? Okay. The next one is a bit like uh, the previous one, but it's focusing on uh, your French learning, but here it's not when, but it's how. Like people are sometimes uh, curious and they want to know how, you, how you've learned French. So here is two questions that you can hear. It's like, t'as appris comment le français? T'as appris comment le français? T'as appris comment le français? Here again, you can see that there is this contraction. T'as appris comment le français? T'as, a, tu, a. So here, if I ask you guys, t'as appris comment le français? T'as appris comment le français? You can answer like, j'ai appris à l'université. Your answer is like, j'ai appris à l'université. Université, you remember, we've seen that before, it's like in English, university, university with the accent. J'ai appris à l'université. So you've learned that university French. Um, but another question um, like can be asked is like, t'as appris où le français? Où? So here you can see that we can ask like with comment or où, but it's roughly the same meaning, like how and where. You can say that in French, but it's, yeah, roughly the same meaning, because comment, it's like, oh, I've learned at university, which is like, um, uh, I was uh, working at university. This is the answer for where, but it's also the answer for how, because you, like, when you say, j'ai appris à l'université, it underpines that you've learned with a teacher. So this, it was your method, kind of method. Um, but another question, another answer that you can ask, like maybe you, like you are watching those videos and you're learning by yourself without using a teacher. So here, j'ai appris tout seul, tout seul, like by myself or alone. J'ai appris tout seul. So this is a question, like where did you, learn French, t'as appris où le français? You can say, oh, nowhere, I've just learned by myself. So you can just say, j'ai appris tout seul. So here, even if it's où, you can say, j'ai appris tout seul. It's not uh, something really weird if you do that in French. T'as appris comment le français? Again, you can say, j'ai appris tout seul. Comment? Tout seul. So here, again, the comment would be, more related to tout seul, and the OU would be more related to à l'université. 
But if you guys don't do uh, the disambiguation, like if you answer with the other ones, it's perfectly okay. So again, two questions related to French learning. And the last one is related to your trip uh, in France. Like when you meet, like if you go to France and you meet some people, they might ask you, like if it's your first time in France or if you've ever been in France before or questions like that. So the way they can ask you that is, c'est la première fois que tu viens en France? Like the polite way to say that would be, est-ce que c'est la première fois que tu viens en France? Est-ce que c'est la première fois que tu viens en France? So this is kind of polite um, or also casual, uh, but um, this one is more casual. C'est la première fois que tu viens en France. C'est la première fois que tu viens en France. So here, if I ask you, c'est la première fois que tu viens en France, like you are, like uh, we are in France, you're asking, like I meet you and I ask you, c'est la première fois que tu viens en France? If it's your first time, you can say, oh yeah, it's my first time. So you just say, oui, c'est la première fois. Oui, c'est la première fois. But if it's not your first time, you can say, oh no, it's not my first time, it's like my second time. So you can say, non, c'est la deuxième fois. Première, deuxième. So, non, c'est la deuxième fois. Deuxième fois. I'm going to write deuxième, because maybe you want to know how to say that. De deuxième. So here... You can say that. Another question, which is kind of the same meaning, but um, like there is a subtlety, which is because it's the opposite. It's like when they ask you, t'es déjà venu en France avant? T'es déjà venu en France avant? Like here again, contraction. Tu es, t'es. T'es déjà venu en France avant. Have you ever been to France before? Avant, before. Ever, déjà. Have you ever been to France before? Uh, have you ever been? So, t'es déjà venu en France avant? Your answer is like, can be, oh, no, I've never been to France. Non, je ne suis jamais venu en France avant. Non, je ne suis jamais. The opposite of déjà is jamais. Déjà, jamais, venu en France avant. Non, je ne suis jamais venu en France avant. Or you can answer if you've been to France before. You've been in France before, you can say, je suis déjà venu il y a deux ans, for example. So here again, you see that il y a deux ans, two years ago. Je suis déjà venu il y a deux ans. Okay, so you've seen that French people can ask you questions in many ways. So you've seen like some classic questions. Do, don't forget that the contraction is really important. Then don't do the inversion. Here, tu viens, viens tu. And here, question that French people can ask you. And sometimes uh, you hear those questions a lot. And instead of just being uh, like confused, it's better to be used to that and just to answer those questions because you will know how to answer that. So now you will be confident enough to answer the questions. And that's really good uh, for your, um, like, uh, your determination. Because if you go to France and you live in France, like other international students or stuff like that, that uh, like I did, uh, you uh, will hear those questions. And if you can directly answer those questions without thinking about that, that's really good for your mind. Because you say, OK, I can speak with native people and answer questions really easily. So this is uh, kind of good for your self-confidence. So please read those sentences again and try to, to be confident with that. You can just read those questions out loud and make your own response, your own answers with your own birthday or your own, uh, like when did you start learning French or how did you, how did you, um, how did you learn French? So, this was only a small uh, amount of sentences, but uh, I hope it would be good for you. Hey everyone, welcome back for more French. It's Pierre from France. And today's lesson will be about three words, déjà, encore, 
toujours. Three adverbs that are often difficult to translate into English when you don't know the rules. So, without further ado, let's get started. I forgot the accent here. So, three categories. Déjà, encore, and toujours. Déjà is something that you can translate in two different ways. Like, even three. Like, the first meaning of déjà in French is like in the, the meaning of already or yet. It would depend if it's... Um, a question or if it's like positive affirmation so here this is the first case and the second case is like when you translate it with ever or already so here you've got uh, two different meanings and it will depend if it's a question and if it's positive or if it's negative this is typical with déjà and this is the case for the two different meanings so Let's start with the first one. Déjà has something that means already or yet. So when you say, es-tu déjà arrivé en France? Es-tu déjà arrivé en France? It means like, did you arrive yet? So I don't know why I put en France, but like, es-tu déjà arrivé? Es-tu déjà arrivé? Did you arrive yet? Es-tu déjà arrivé? Did you arrive yet? So here, déjà, it's yet. When you add the question in English and you use yet in the question, you have to translate it by déjà. Did you arrive yet? Es-tu déjà arrivé? But if you want to answer these questions in English, you can say, if, if like, yeah, you did arrive. You did arrive. You have to say, I have already arrived. So you use already. That's why you put already here. But if you didn't arrive yet, you use, as I just said, yet. But in English, it's a bit different than in French, because here in French, you have to use déjà for the positive one. So in English, you change, you use yet arrive, and in French, it's the same. But in English, you use yet, like in the questions, but in French, you have to use something different. You have to use one of those two, encore or toujours, but with the negative form. Je ne suis pas encore arrivé. Liaison. Je ne suis toujours pas arrivé. So it means like I have not arrived yet. This is the same meaning. Pas encore and toujours pas. It's almost the same meaning. So um, be careful with that. Uh, the opposite of déjà in French is pas encore or toujours pas. I will explain later the real difference between encore and toujours. But for now, just remember that one of the opposite of déjà, in the case when you use déjà as yet or already, the opposite is pas encore or toujours pas. So be careful with that. So this was the first meaning of déjà, like already or yet. But there is another meaning, which is like ever or already. Again, you can see already. So when you ask in English, have you ever been to France? Have you ever been to France? You can say, yeah, I have already been to France. Or no, I have never been to France. So let's get started with the question and the negative one. As you can see in English, to show that it's negative, you add the N at ever. Have you ever been to France? I have never been to France. But uh, in French, we don't have a word for ever. We just say déjà. Et tu déjà allé en France. And for never, it's easy to translate. You just use jamais. It's like never is always jamais in French. So here you ask the question, Et tu déjà allé en France? I forgot the verb here. Et tu déjà allé en France? Et tu déjà allé en France? Et tu déjà allé en France? Have you ever been to France? So, déjà, ever, as a question. But if you want to answer, like, the, the positive way, like, you want to say, yes, I have already been to France. You have to use, again, the same one. Je suis déjà allé en France. But the negative form would be jamais. So, here, we've seen that déjà 
like when you use a question or like a positive uh, sentence, you use the same, you use déjà. But like the opposite, the opposite form of déjà, the negative form would be different depending of the depending on the meaning of the déjà. So if it's like the meaning of already yet, it's pas encore or toujours pas. But if it's the meaning of ever or already, the negative form is jamais. So please be careful. The negative form depends on the real meaning. In French, you cannot uh, put like a negative form of déjà with uh, just pas. You have to choose between one of these, with one of these two, or one of, of this one, jamais, or pas encore. So déjà, again, two meanings, and depending on the meanings, different negative form. So this is all for déjà, but that's déjà suffisant. It's enough, right? C'est déjà suffisant. It's already enough. Next one, encore. Encore, like many meanings, three meanings. Encore can, like one of the meaning is again. So when you say il est encore en retard, it means like, oh, he is late again. So here, encore, again. So this is the positive form. And the negative form is like in English, you just put, he is not late again. You just put the negation. And in French, it's the same. Il n'est pas encore en retard. But be careful, because here, when you see the sentence, il n'est pas encore en retard, it's not the same pas encore. Je ne suis pas encore arrivé. So, be careful with this. Like, this sentence, when you see il n'est pas encore en retard, you have two meanings. This meanings, or this meaning. So, be careful, like, with just this sentence, you cannot guess the meaning, but with the context, you can guess the meaning. So, be careful, because this pas encore can be the opposite form of encore, but also the opposite form of déjà. So be careful with this. Il est encore en retard. He is late again. You, usually you don't use this form a lot. But it exists, so be careful. Usually when you see pas encore, it's mainly this meaning. So just to let you know. Usually the more common sentence with encore, like the positive form, is this one. This one. Not a lot, like even in English, he is not late again. You don't use that a lot, but you can say it. So here, encore en retard, he is late again. This is a kind of an easy meaning, right? Let's move on to the next one. Encore, when it means another or more. Like if you want some, like if you want more coffee. Je veux encore du café. I want more coffee. I want more coffee. I didn't put the English translation here because I have no space, but je veux encore du café, I want more coffee. Je veux encore du café. Here, more is encore. But here, there is another way to translate um, encore. Here, when you say je veux encore une tasse de café, you use another. Je veux, an, I want another cup of coffee. So here, encore, it's like another or more. What is the difference between this? It's because in English you have uh, like countable and uncountable objects. Like a cup of tea, you don't, you cannot count it. You can count it, but uh, like coffee, you cannot count it. So in English, it's more when you can't count the object, and uh, like uh, when you can't count the object is another. But luckily in French, for once, we have something that is easier than in English. No, here it's like just encore for the two in the two situations. So you don't bother another and more, it's like encore. No matter if you can count or not the object. Je veux encore du café, je veux encore une tasse de café. But what is the negative form of that? This is like in English, like not anymore. Like I want more coffee or I don't want coffee anymore. Like more anymore. In English, like uh, in French, it's like you use a completely different ver noun, like a verb. It's plus. Je ne veux plus. Plus, it's always coupled with ne. Like it's one of the negations, like 
Usually the negation is ne pas in English, or in French. Ne pas. Je ne veux pas travailler. Ne pas. But there is also other negations like with jamais or with plus. So plus, it means like not anymore. So if you want to translate not anymore, not is like ne and plus anymore. Je ne veux plus de café. So I want more coffee. I don't want, uh, like, I want more coffee. I don't want coffee anymore. Je veux encore du café. Je ne veux plus de café. So what about the case where, uh, like you say, I don't want another cup of coffee, uh, like in French, um, you have to say, je ne veux plus d'une tasse de café. But the meaning is a bit different. If you say, je ne veux plus d'une tasse de café, it means that you change your mind. Je ne veux plus une tasse de café. So here, there is this distinction between uh, like countable and uncountable objects. So just remember this one. Je veux encore du café. If you cannot count the object, like I want more, you say I don't want any more. I want more, I don't want any more. So this is only the negative form. This meaning is only for objects that you can no, you cannot count, but for an object that you can count, like the meaning, if you use je ne veux plus d'une tasse de café, you have to put the D, je ne veux plus d'une tasse de café, it means like you usually, like you want it, but now you don't want anymore. So this is kind of subtle, be careful with that. But remember, like je veux encore for countable object, the negative for uncountable objects, the negative form is plus, like like in English, more, not anymore, encore, ne plus. So this was one of the meaning, and another meaning is encore plus, or encore moins. It means like even more or even less. So if you want to say like it's even more interesting, you say c'est encore plus intéressant. C'est encore plus intéressant. It's even more interesting. And if you want to use like the opposite form, like this is the positive one, you can use also the negative one. So if you want to say it's even less expensive, c'est encore moins cher. Encore moins cher. So this is like encore, here it's even. And plus it's like more, and moins it's like less. C'est encore plus, it's even more. C'est encore moins, it's even less. So this one is kind of easy, no, tricky, no, no tricks with this one. Like encore, it's just even. Those two ones, no tricks. Like encore again or encore even. Here, there is like this nuance, like just one word for two words in English. So here it's for encore. And as you can see, there is also this situation where uh, like when you use the negative form of Encore. Sometimes it's this one, but more like in the most, like usually it's more this meaning, like the opposite form of déjà. So it's like not yet. So here you see that encore, 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 but pas encore, which is the negative form, like not, like pas encore, pas encore. One of the translation is not yet. So I'm going to add it, pas encore, it means sometimes and most, in most cases it means not yet. So this is one of the other meaning of encore, but sometimes pas encore, it means also not again. So you have to be careful of the meaning of the sentence. So that was for encore. Again, another or more, even, and sometimes not yet when there is pas before encore. So let's move on to the next one, toujours. Toujours, first meaning is kind of easy. It means always, toujours as always. So if you want to say, je suis toujours en retard, 
like in English, is like I'm always late. In English, the negative form would be like the opposite of always is never. So you want to say in French, you just use the opposite form of toujours, which is jamais. Never, we've seen that before. Jamais, never. So here, you can see that jamais is in the same time the opposite form of toujours, but also the opposite form of déjà. So usually the classic form of, de, of, uh, of jamais, the classic, uh, the classic uh, counterpart of jamais is toujours. But jamais is always translated by never in English. In these cases, it's in this case, it's never, and here again, it's never. So, je ne suis jamais en retard. Like, en retard, same. Je ne suis jamais en retard. But you can also say, je ne suis pas toujours en retard. And the difference between je ne suis jamais en retard and je ne suis pas toujours en, ta en retard is the same than in English, when you say, like, um, je, uh, like, I am never late, or I am not always late. Like, I am never late, like it means no way that can happen, it never happened before, like I'm never late. And you can say like I'm not always late, like sometimes, but it's not always. So like exactly the same meaning in um, like the difference between two, the two. So here, depending on the meaning, the real uh, opposite, the real uh, negation that you want to use, you have to choose between jamais or pas toujours, but it's the same than in English when you have to choose between never or not always. So here, it's an easy one, really easy one. Then there is another one which is encore, toujours, toujours, encore. Like here, you can substitute toujours with encore again, like same than here, and you have to tr translate it by still. So here, still, when you want to use, like, you want to say, I am still here, I am still here. You can say, je suis encore là, or je suis toujours là. So here it's like, this one is belonging to the two categories, so toujours and encore. Je suis encore là, je suis toujours là. It's roughly the same meaning, it's exactly the same than here. Pas encore, toujours pas. Encore, toujours, like it's roughly the same meaning. And here, it's yet. And here, it's still. So be careful. Je suis encore là, je suis toujours là. Je ne suis plus là. Is the negative form of this, like two positive form, but just one negative form. And again, it's like here, it's like not anymore. So when you want to say, I am still here, in English, you want to do the opposite, so you want to say, I am not here anymore, and in French, je ne suis plus là. So plus, again, even though, like plus, you can see here and here, like the negative form of encore, but also the negative form of toujours in some cases, but like, it's not always the same cases, because here, encore means like another or more, and here it means like still. But in English, it's kind of easy because in both cases, like I, je ne veux plus de café, I don't want coffee anymore. Je ne suis plus là, I'm not here anymore. So like this one is easy because plus is always like ne plus, ne plus, ne plus is always not anymore. So this one, it's not a problem. Plus is always uh, the same translation. It's like jamais, it's always never. So like the negative forms is not that complicated to translate. What is important is all the meanings of uh, the words here. And then you have to know the opposite form, but it's like uh, in English usually. So here we've seen that uh, toujours, two different cases, and also I didn't put it back here, but uh, here uh, you have uh, another meaning with toujours, which is like not yet. So toujours, three meanings. Always, still, or if it's negative, not yet. But if it's negative, it's sometimes also not always. So let's sum it up. Toujours, you can translate it by always, or still, 
and pas toujours, which is the negative form, you can translate it by not always or not yet. Toujours pas. Okay? So here, you've seen that we can use encore and toujours in this case. And here again, pas encore, toujours pas. Please note that pas is not in the same place, depending on the adverb, encore and toujours. Pas encore, toujours pas. So here, you have two different, um, like, it's almost synonym. Two cases, two adverbs that you can use, but just one situation. So you can wonder if there is a nuance, and there is a nuance. So here, usually, when you use toujours pas, so I'm just talking about the negative one. When you say toujours pas, instead of pas encore, it's uh, stronger, like you emphasize what you're saying. Usually it's the same, but um, if you want to say, je ne suis pas encore arrivé, it means like, oh, okay, I'm, uh, like you, someone asks you, like, uh, where are you? And you say, oh, uh, je ne suis pas encore arrivé. Like, um, I have not arrived yet, so I'm, I'm still not here. But if you want to say, je ne suis toujours pas arrivé, it means, it can mean, some, it can mean uh, something more uh, stronger, like you're tired or you have like plenty of tone. Like, you s like I'm still not here. Like, I'm, I have struggles with the, with the subway or something like that. So when you say, toujours pas, it's a bit more like you're not satisfied with the situation. Like, you're not here and you're not satisfied with that. So usually you, like the most common one is always encore, like you, is, you use encore. This is more common, but if you want to see uh, a, a more, plain, like if you want to sound more plaintive, you can use toujours pas instead. And if you hear someone saying that, maybe it would be more plaintive, but it's not always the case. Like it's really subtle and usually like, we, didn't, we don't really pay attention to the real nuance between those two. So this is the case when this is negative. Toujours pas, it's like stronger than pas encore, and maybe more plaintive. But here is another one. When you want to say, j'ai toujours faim, you can also say, j'ai encore faim. As I said here, it's the same, like, je suis encore là, je suis toujours là, here, like it's the same i'm using this toujours and this encore it's i'm using this one so j'ai toujours faim or j'ai encore faim it's it means like i am still hungry but be careful because just for this one j'ai toujours faim you can also translate it by i'm always hungry it depends on the meaning so here you have two meanings this one with only j'ai toujours faim you have two meanings but this one j'ai encore faim you have only one meaning, like, I am always hungry. So, I'm going to clarify that. This one, you can translate it like this. And for this one, it's only this one. So, as you can see here, in English, you have two different meanings. Like, you can understand the difference. But in French, j'ai toujours faim, like, those two sentences, you can translate them with the same sentence if you use j'ai toujours faim. But if you really want to make the disambiguation, you translate the first one by this one and you translate the second one by this one. But you can also translate the second one with the first one, j'ai toujours faim. So, this is just like to make you more attentive to, to this possibility. But here I want to explain the nuance between encore and toujours. So. I am using j'ai toujours faim as I am still hungry. So let's say we don't care about I am always hungry because it's not like the meaning that is interesting here. Let's say that I want to say j'ai toujours faim not as I am always hungry but I, as I am still hungry. What is the difference between j'ai toujours faim and j'ai encore faim? I am still hungry. Two ways to say it in French. And to be honest, there is no real nuance between this. J'ai toujours faim, or I am 
like uh, I am still hungry, j'ai encore faim, j'ai toujours faim, it's roughly the same meaning. But here, maybe one, uh, one subtlety would be, like one thing that is subtle is, j'ai encore faim, it means like I want more. When you say j'ai encore faim, I want more. But if you say j'ai toujours faim, it means like uh, the situation is still the same. So with like the positive one, toujours, emphasize the fact that the situation is still the same. And here, when you want to say j'ai encore faim, since encore, encore has a meaning of like again or more, like you want something, you, you want some like you want addition. So the subtlety, the 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 nuance would be like with this, you want something, you you want you expect some, something, you expect you know, an addition. But j'ai toujours faim. It's more like you constating that like you you study stating that the situation is still the same. So. We've seen that toujours, encore, and déjà have many ways to translate. Um, you can translate them in many ways. Déjà, like already, yet, or ever already. And if you want the negative form, it's like pas encore, toujours pas, or jamais. And here, uh, like for encore, you have three meanings. Again, or another more, like you want addition. Like encore like, implies that you want addition. Like encore plus. C'est encore plus intéressant, it's a bit different, like even more. And then for toujours, like there is the always, and there is like still, like which is kind of si similar to encore. But there is also this toujours pas, that you have to be careful with, toujours. So here, toujours, refer, please refer to this, this, and this. And for encore, refer to this, 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 and also this, and this. Hey everyone, it's Pierre from France and welcome back for more videos on French. Today's videos will be about 10 common mistakes that French learners make often in French. So, I'm gonna explain 10 different points and let's get started without further ado. The three first points are really easy, like a simple explanation will be enough to make you understand the mistake and I hope with this you will not make this mistake anymore. So first of all, Rendre visite à. This is a translation for the verb in English, to visit. There is two ways to translate to visit in French. First, when you visit a place, like I visit France, I visit France, you use the verb visiter. Je visite la France. The verb visiter. Je visite la France. I visit France. So this is kind of easy. Same verb, like it's not a false friend. But when you visit someone's place, this is more complicated. But not really complicated. Because you just use this expression, rendre visite à. So instead of using the verb visiter, you use rendre visite à. Rendre visite à. I visit my grandmother. Je rends visite à ma grand-mère. So it's like exactly the same sentence, except that you have to use rendre visite à. So here I conjugate it. So rendre, rend, je rends, je rends visite à. So kind of easy. You just need to remember that visite is different when you visit someone's place. Je rends visite à ma grand-mère. So this one is kind of easy. Let's move on to another one, which is kind of confusing, but really easy to solve it. Tu me manques. It means I miss you. So here you can see that I is a subject in English, but in French it's tu, which is like you. But here you have to use uh, me to translate the I. So here there is a kind of inversion. The subject is the object. And the object is a pronoun. So here, I miss you. Tu me manques. So this is the case for all the situations. So if you want to say, we miss them, you have to say, il nous manque. Il nous manque. So here, as you can see, um, the subject is il, like them. It 
it becomes a subject. So be careful not to confuse and to use uh, nu as the subject and il as the pronoun. This is kind of confusing, but if you know the rule, you will be able to, to do no mistakes with this. So the next one is something that you learn quite early when you learn French, but it's an easy rule to forget. It concerns capital letters. In French, we don't use capital letters with nationality, weekdays and months. So you just remember this with, with nationality, weekdays and months. So here, for example, when you want to say French people in French, French people, you have to use les in French. So les Français. It's like French people, but here you don't use any capital letter. In French, a capital letter, you use the, the noun for capital letter is majuscule. Majuscule. So here, no majuscule, no capital letter. Then for weekdays, it's the same like Monday, lundi, le lundi. You don't put any capital letter, no majuscule, just a simple letter. Same for months. Here, like May, le mois de May, the months of May. Here, you, as you can see, no capital letter. So this is kind of easy, not a big mistake if you do it, but just remember that it would make you sound, or maybe when you write, you will look more native. Because this is not like uh, something that you say, but something that you write. Okay, let's move on to the next one, the fourth one. So here, it concerns contractions. Although I think it's something that you learn quite early in French, this is something that is often forgotten by uh, French learners. So I'm going to explain this once again. First, this one. De le. In French, we don't say de le. We do a kind of contractions, which is kind of weird. So here, you take the D and yet you add a new, a U. So du. So de le, you never say de le, you say du. So this is for the masculine form, but you know the feminine form de, of de le is de la. So here, if you want to say some jam, jam in French, confiture, confiture, it's a feminine noun. So here, if you want to say, ah, I want some jam or I want jam, je veux de la confiture, de la confiture, feminine, so de la, de la. But if the word is masculine, like bread, for example, it's a masculine word, you have to use de le, but no, it's forbidden. You have to do the contractions. This is forbidden. You do the contractions, so you say du pain. Du pain. So this one is uh, kind of weird. Why there is a U, we don't know. But you have to remember that. You never say de le, but du. Okay? Next one. Um, is kind of easy. It's just like when you use le, de, or que, and then there is a vowel. Since it's quite hard to say the, this i with the vowel that is next to this word, you do a contraction so you get rid of the i and you add this to shorten your word. So here, like elephant, so in French, elephant starts with a vowel, a i. So this is a noun, and this is a masculine noun, so le, but here you get rid of the e, because there is this vowel. Same with de, here, il vient d'arrêter, like, venir de, vient de, it's like a common expression in French to say, oh, I just stop, I just stopped. So here, il vient d'arrêter, il vient d'arrêter, it means I just stopped. So here, there is de, il vient de, and then you add a verb. The, the expression is like that. You always add a verb after de. But here, since the verb starts with the vowel, a, you have to do the contractions. So here, elle, il vient d'arrêter. If you want to use like a verb that is not starting with a vowel, il vient de commencer, he just started. Il vient de commencer, you hear de, but here, il vient d'arrêter. There is the contraction because there is a vowel. And the, this one is often forgotten. I think this is the most problematic one because here 
uh, it's not often that you do the contractions because it's not common that there is Q and and then a vowel. But this is still occurring when you do like sentences that start with il dit que, like uh, he said that or stuff like that. Here, if the subject is il or elle, you have to do the contractions. So she, he said that he's here. Il dit qu'il est là. You don't say il dit que il est là. You have to say il dit qu'il est là. He said that he is here. Il dit qu'il est là. Same with elle. Il dit qu'elle est là. He's saying that she is here. Here in French, you have to do the contractions. So don't forget this. This is kind of important. So let's sum it up. Contractions. Le, de, que. You get rid of the E when there is a vowel. Like it's always with the E. Always with the E. So it's quite easy with the vowel. And you just get rid of the E and you add this instead. Remember, this one, que, is really important. Don't forget. And also, this one, de le, you don't say it, never. You always say du. So here, you know, all the rules. Maybe you knew it before, but it's a kind of like, uh, I'm just refreshing your, your mind. So yeah, remember this. Next one is kind of tricky. Ma, you know, ma, it's like a translation for my. My, you can translate it into two different words in French. Ma and mon. Here, like it's a feminine form and here it's the masculine form. You know, nouns in French have genders. And depending on the gender of the, the thing, you have to translate my in one of the, these two cases. But there is one, cases where, one case where you don't do the, the common rule. You don't check the, the gender of the noun. It's when there is a vowel and when the word is feminine. So when it's feminine and when it starts with a vowel, so you can say that whenever a word starts, a noun starts with a vowel, you have to use mon. This is kind of confusing. When you say mon ami, like my friend, in French, you can say my friend, like my, my friend, if she is a boy or she is a, if, if he is a boy or, or she is a girl, if she is a girl. So here it's a boy, so mon ami. But if she is a girl, you add the e here and you could think, okay, I have to use ma. But that's not the case, because as, as, as I said, here there is a vowel, so you have to say mon, mon ami, and don't forget to do the liaison, mon ami, because there is this vowel, and here also you do the liaison, of course. So here, mon ami, mon ami, so you cannot make the distinction, uh, like when you just speak, this is the same pronunciation either if it's a boy or a girl, but when you write it, there is this E to, that helps you to make the, the disambiguation. But here, uh, it's the same word. So let's get uh, further with another example. When you say une affiche, une affiche, like a poster, this means poster. And this is a feminine noun, affiche, feminine. So you say une affiche, but you can also say my poster or your poster or his poster, because in French this rule is not only for ma but it's also for ta and sa. So my, you, and his or her. So here, if you want to say one of these with affiche, you have to say mon, ton, son, mon affiche, son affiche, ton affiche. So here, even though affiche is a feminine word, you have to use the masculine word here, mon, ton, son. So this is just because there is a vowel. So just remember that ma or ta or even sa, when there is a vowel after, you don't think 
of the gender, you just use mon or ton or son. So this is kind of easy. Vowel, always the same. And you do the liaison. Always do the liaison. But it's not only for noun. It's also working with adjectives. So here, here is an interesting example. Sa découverte. Découverte. Like it means discovery. Sa découverte. Is, it means like his or her discovery. Here, découverte, it's a feminine word in French. Discovery is feminine. No reason for that. So here, sa découverte. You use sa. Why? Easy, because there is like a consonant and this is a feminine word. So no reason to use something else. Sa. But if you want to add an adjective like incredible, incroyable, incroyable, you want to add this adjective here between sa and découverte. But now, if you do this, you've got a vowel. So you have to do again son. You have to use son instead of sa, even though découverte is feminine. Son incroyable découverte. So again, it's not only with noun, it's also with adjectives. It's like for any kind of thing that you can that you can have. So if you have ma, ta, or sa and a vowel, even though it's a noun or an adjective, you just turn it into a mon, son or ton, and you don't forget to do the liaison. So, this is kind of confusing, especially since in English you have the distinction between his and her, but in French we don't do this, because we don't care of the owner of the object, we just care about the object, the gender of the object. So here, don't forget to think of the gender of the object, and just check if there is a vowel gender of the object and if there is a vowel. Next one, pronominal verbs and possessive pronouns. This one, I hear this a lot, even though the like French learners are really good at French, this mistake is quite uh, a big one. Uh, like, it's not that, that problematic, but if you hear it, like it sounds a bit weird. And I think it's something that you don't learn at school. So when you want to use a verb, like, I'm washing my hands, I'm washing my hands, when you do actions uh, with your body in French, usually you have, uh, you use a verb that is a pronominal verb. Je me lave les mains. So here, je me lave, I wash my hand, I'm washing my hands. Here, in English, you say, I wash my hands, my, because it's my hands. But here in French, since you have me already, you have to use les and not my. Like if you say je me lave mes mains, it sounds weird because there is me and me, so you're saying twice, like you're referring twice at yourself. And just once is enough. Je me lave les mains. So usually I hear a lot of uh, French learners saying, Je me lave mes mains, but you say, je me lave les mains. It's the same for any other pronominal verbs. If you say, il s'est cassé, like, he broke, he, he, he broke his leg, or she broke her leg. Il s'est cassé, les jambes, or la jambe, here. Um, so here. Same here, if you want to say, he broke his leg, or she broke her leg, you have to say, il s'est cassé, la jambe. You don't say, il s'est cassé sa jambe, you have to say, il s'est cassé la jambe. Because here, there is already this, that is referring to his leg. So here, il s'est cassé la jambe. So be careful with that. There are many verbs, and usually it's verbs that are referring to your body. Like when you like uh, brush your teeth. In French, it's 
se brosser les dents. So this is the infinitive form. So if you want to use like with je, je me brosse les dents. Je me brosse les dents. I'm washing my, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm brushing my teeth. So here, again, les. Same with like, uh, se coiffer les cheveux. Je me coiffe les cheveux. Je me coiffe les cheveux. Here I'm not saying mes cheveux, I'm saying les cheveux. I'm brushing um, my hair. So here, se coiffer les cheveux. Se coiffer les cheveux. So be careful with that. It's usually verbs with body, with the body, but it's always the case with pronominal verbs. So be careful. Let's now move on to the next one. This one is also something really common and a kind of weird in French. It's like when you want to introduce someone, you don't use il est, but you introduce the person with c'est. Because you know, usually you translate he with il, she with elle, or it with ça, or si with uh, this contraction. But if you want to introduce someone, like my friend, you don't say, you don't, because in English you can say he is my friend, or it is my friend. But in French, this is, there is only one way to translate the two sentences. He is my friend, or it is my friend. Just one way to translate it. C'est. You have to say, c'est mon ami. You cannot translate, he is my friend, with il here. And when you introduce someone, you always have to use c'est. Like, it's the same if you want to introduce, I don't know, your French teacher. Like, he is my French teacher, or it is my French teacher. In French, just one way to translate it. C'est le professeur de français, or it's c'est mon professeur de français. C'est le professeur de français means uh, he is the French teacher or it is the French teacher, but in French, only one way to translate it. C'est, to introduce someone, c'est. Always c'est. Just remember that. Let's move on to the next one with this letter that is an, uh, an, um, a word in French. Why? To replace a place. Because, you know, you can replace a noun sometimes by using it in, uh, in English. Like, I'm using a tool, I'm using it. It's the same in French, but you can also do that with, uh, for places. So, if you want to say, uh, je suis en France, but you want to, you know that, you don't want to repeat the word en France, because it's location. In English, you can also do, uh, you can avoid the repetition, the repetition by using I am there. But in French, you have to use this word, why. So here you say, j'y suis, j'y suis. And please note that here, uh, when you see je suis en France, like the place is after the verb, but when you do um, like the substitution, the why is before the verb, j'y suis. And since, and since Y is a vowel, you have to, to translate, uh, you have to do the contraction, like here, je becomes J, G. je becomes J, because there is a vowel, so J suis. I think this is kind of confusing when you hear this, because you're wondering, like, what, like why did they say J? But it's, it means, like, he is referring to a place. So, same here is another example, like, uh, she is walking uh, her dog, like, to, in a park, or something like that. Elle promène son chien au parc. Elle promène son chien au parc. So, here, you have to say, if you want to not, like, if you want not to repeat au parc, which is the location, like, park is, like, same in French. Parc. Elle y promène son chien. So here again, this is after the verb, like it's at the end of the sentence. But here, when you do the, like you avoid the repetition, the repetition, you have to use why before the verb. Elle promène son chien au parc. Elle y promène son chien. So here, be careful, before the verb. 
So this is how you replace um, like uh, a place in French. But you can also replace a thing. And sometimes in French, it's not enough to use just ça. Because in English, like as I said, you can like I'm using, um, you can say I'm using a tool. I'm using it. J'utilise un outil. Je l'utilise. In French, here it's like kind of similar. Um, instead of saying l'outil, which is the tool, I'm saying le, je l'utilise. But this is not the case when you want to replace a thing that is introduced with a, with this, a, o, o, or de, de, or de. Here, if it's a, o, o, you have to use instead of le, or la, or le, if it's plural, you have to use again y. So y is like to replace a place, or to replace a thing introduced by a, o, o. So if you want to say, je pense à mon avenir, like, I'm thinking about my future. If you want to replace à mon avenir, like you don't want to repeat it, you have to say j'y pense. Again, here after the verb, here before the verb. It's always like that in French. It's the same when you say, like, I'm using a tool, I'm using it. J'utilise un outil, je l'utilise. So here, again, you always do, when you replace a noun, you always do the inversion. You put it before the verb. So here there is a, so you don't use le, because mon avenir is like um, a masculine word. But here, since there is a, you don't care if it's masculine or feminine, because you don't have to use le, you have to use y, so j'y pense. And this is different when there is de, de, or de, you have to use en. So if you want to say je veux du pain, you don't say, like, when you say je veux du pain, it means I want bread or I want some bread. Je veux du pain. Je veux du pain. Jean veux. Jean veux. Here again, before the verb, you use this. And since there is a vowel, you do the contraction. We're only with je. Like if it's tu, you don't do it. Tu en veux. Tu veux du pain. Tu en veux. So here, um, you don't say, je veux du pain, je le veux. You don't say this. Because here there is de or du, like I forgot, but here it's not only with de, de or de, it's also with du. Je veux du pain, j'en veux. You don't say, je le veux, you say, j'en veux. Because it's du pain. And uh, here, you have to be careful, because it's only concerning things. So if you want to use like the same verb, je pense à mon avenir, but you're thinking about someone. Here, you want to say, je pense à Pierre. But Pierre, it's a noun, it's my, it's my, it's a name, it's my name. Je pense à Pierre. Je pense à lui. Here, since Pierre is like a name, a person, you cannot replace it with, um, so à, uh, with, with y. You have just to replace it like with the, the corresponding word. So here, since Pierre is a boy, you have to say lui. And je parle de Marie. So here again, like it's an example with de. Je parle de Marie. You don't use en, since Marie is a name, a person. So you say je pense, je parle d'elle. So here I, you do the contraction because elle is feminine. So be careful because it's not concerning uh, people, it's only with things. So let's just wrap it up for this. Why? You can use it to replace a place or a thing, but only a thing introduced by a, o, o. And when you do the replacement, you do it before, you put it before the verb. With uh, on, it used to replace a thing again but only when it's introduced by de, 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 or du. And when you want to replace something that is not introduced by a or de, like one of these or one of these, you, use, you just use le, la, or les, which is, um, which is the classic one. But be careful with persons, 
you don't use those rules. Now let's move on to the last one. The last one is like a kind of tricky one and I think like not a lot of people are aware of that and again it's like for the, the, the capital letters it's not something that you say but it's something that you write especially when you write emails. In French the, there is two symbols here like the exclamative like the exclamation mark and the question marks the question mark here in English when you put the like a, a word here you don't put any space between the word and the mark like hi or what but in French when you write it you have to use a space you have to put a space here hey if you don't say huh like what what huh in French there is a space here so just be careful with that uh, if you write an email or if you write French, uh, especially when you're using a computer, because it's not something that you can write uh, like here I put a big space, but like it's not something that you can distinguish easily. So be careful with that. Uh, it's like a kind of uh, bonus, because uh, usually it's not really bad if you do this mistake, but it's good to know it. Like you will maybe understand if some French people send you emails and they're putting spaces everywhere after the, their marks. It's because in French, you do that. Okay, so now we've seen 10 common mistakes. Here are some easy ones, like two common expressions. This rule about capital letters, nationality, weekdays, and months. Then some like classic contractions, really important but often forgotten. Here, this tricky rule with ma, ta, sa, plus a vowel that turns into like mon, ton, son. Then, pronominal verbs and processive pronouns when you using like a pronominal verb, so se laver, like especially when you're dealing with your body, you have to avoid referring to twice at your own body, at your own, like at yourself or at like twice at uh, your, like the person you're talking to, you don't refer it twice, here, just the pronoun verbs is taking the, the, the form of the subject. Then, this is uh, like set when you introduce someone, when you introduce someone, don't use il est or elle est, even though if it's a girl or a boy, you just use set always. Like, he is my friend, always, c'est mon ami. You don't think any, any of anything else uh, this is only what you have to remember and then there is to replace a place or replace a thing i or on depending on the situation so be careful with that and then this little trick with the space when you use marks so i know that there are a lot of common mistakes usually you also have the liaison or uh, like the false friends but since i did some videos on that before i'm not uh, mentioning that again so i guess that's all for today i hope you really enjoyed the video hey guys welcome back for more videos on french learning it's pierre from france and today's video will be about french gestures you know when you speak a language sometimes you use hands and in french it's sometimes the case and it's important to know what it means because sometimes you can have some confusion. So here I will show you 10 gestures that are used quite a lot in French and I think those gestures are not like universal gestures. So the first one is j'en ai par dessus la tête. It literally means I've got some stuffs above my head. And to do that in French you do this as well like I've got some stuffs above my head. So it literally means the same than the expression. And it means I'm fed up with this. So like when you're like annoyed by something, you can say, oh, j'en ai par dessus la tête. Or you can say, j'en ai marre, j'en ai marre, which is the same meaning that this. J'en ai marre, j'en ai marre. You do this. So here is an example. Il a encore oublié ses clés, j'en ai par dessus la tête. Like the meaning is, he forgot again his keys. Like I'm fed up with him. So in French, you could say, you can do like in a natural conversation, you can say, 
« Ah, il a encore oublié ses clés. J'en ai par-dessus la tête. » Or, « Oh, il a encore oublié ses clés. J'en ai vraiment marre. Hein. » So you can say that in French and you can do the gesture. So if you say « J'en ai par-dessus la tête », you can do the gesture as well. But usually, if you do that alone, it has no meaning. Like, it's better and usually we use it with this expression. So you say « J'en ai par-dessus la tête ». But you can also just use it without doing that. So you can just say, j'en ai par-dessus la tête, or j'en ai par-dessus la tête. If you do that, maybe it's like you emphasize that you're really um, like annoyed by the situation. So this is, it was the first one. The next one is when you're scared. Like when you, when tu as peur, like the verb, the expression avoir peur, like to be afraid, to be scared. Another way to say it in French, it's flipper. Like it's like when you freak out, freak out. So avoir peur, flipper, it's the same meaning, but here it's like really casual, like uh, not something that you use a lot, you use it with friends. Uh, so a way to express this feeling, like when you're scared in French, is to do this. Like it's not money, it doesn't mean money, although you can use it for money, but when you say, when you do this, like usually you have big eyes, you do this, it means, oh, I was so scared, or, oh, I'm scared. Or you can say, oh, are you scared? If you say that to someone, like, you, you do that, it means, like, oh, are you scared? Like, you teasing someone. So here, like, an example, when you, like, telling a story, you, you say, like, oh, I was in, a, in, the, in the street, and there were no light, and I was so scared. So if you want to say that in French, you can say, il n'y avait pas de lumière. J'avais très peur. J'avais tellement peur. I was so afraid. So here uh, you can say j'avais tellement peur and you can say that, but usually you will not do that. But yes, I think the most common case where you use it is when you do that to someone, like you do a, smi a little smile and you say, like it doesn't mean like money, but it means like are you scared? You can use the both hands and usually like you do that like not here, but here. If you do that lower, it means like you better understand that you mean, oh, you're scared. So you do that. Are you scared? Like this is quite common and you can use it to tease people. The next one is on y va. Like you want to leave somewhere, you say oh, on y va, on y va. Or you can say on se casse, which is like, like, not, not ca like really casual, like same than flipper. Same as flipper, you say on se casse, it means like let's go, like you want to leave, or let's walk off. Like on se casse is like let's walk off. So here is a situation like you, you are at a party with a friend and like the party is so boring that you want to leave. So you want to say that to your friend. So you say, ah, oh, j'en ai marre, like j'en ai marre, or j'en ai par dessus la tête, like same. You can mix the two expressions, j'en ai marre, on y va. So you can say, j'en ai marre and then do the gesture associated to on y va, which is this, or this. Like you use the side of your hand and you do that. You can also do this or this, but when you do that, it means like, let's leave, like you wanna leave. So you can say like, oh, I'm fed up with this, like, let's leave. Like you can use two, two, two gestures for like, two, two, for only two sentences like, but um, in French, it would be not that weird. So, oh, I'm fed up with that, let's, let's leave. And sometimes you can also use it to express that you want to leave, but you don't want people to understand that you want to leave. So you're just looking at your friends without saying anything and you say, if you say that, say that like in a discreet way, like it means like, okay, let's, let's leave. If you do that, like, okay, we need to leave, we have to leave. Like, this is quite common to express something. So this one, you don't use it. You, you can use it alone a lot. This one, you don't use it a lot. And this one, you can use it to tease people if you say that. But usually you say something. Here, you can just say that. Like, let's leave and quick. Like, if you're really fast when doing that, it means like, we need to leave really right now. Like, usually you've got also the look that is uh, like showing that you are hurry, like something like that, you need to leave. So this was the third one. 
The next one is really famous, associated, like something associated to the word, to the expression, the onomat onomatopoeia, oh la la. You know, in French, we say a lot, oh la la, in many, many different situations. And sometimes when you say, oh la la, you've got also this, oh la la. Like you've got your, like your hand and you're doing this, like this is, um, your hand is just waving like that. So if you say, oh la la, it means like, whoa. It can mean like surprise or uh, like you're annoyed or uh, you're happy. Like it means a lot of stuffs. You can translate that by oh no or oh my, oh my God or something like that. But it's a bit different. Like it's something difficult to translate and there is no meaning, oh la la. So you can say, oh la la. So here, three different examples. Like if something is really incredible, you can say, oh la la, c'est incroyable. You can say, oh la la, c'est incroyable. And usually when it's like astonishing or incredible, you don't do that a lot. You can say, oh, c'est incroyable. And usually you, you even don't do it. You can just say, oh la la. But for those two, like this is important. Like, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés. 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 Usually you, do, you don't do that a lot. You just do a bit like, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés. Like, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés. Sometimes you have like a sorry face, yeah, like you look sorry, like, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés, something like that. And you do just a small waving, like, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés, which means like you're uh, like sorry for uh, the inconvenience. And here, like if someone told you, oh la la, j'ai oublié mes clés, like he looked guilty, he looks guilty. The answer of the friend can be, oh, it's always happening to you. And he can also use, oh la la, he can say, Oh la la, ça t'arrive tout le temps. Oh la la, ça t'arrive tout le temps. Oh la la, ça t'arrive tout le temps. And usually here for this, it's like just one. Oh la la, ça t'arrive tout le temps. Like in most cases, you don't do that a lot. Like if you do that, it definitely means like oh la la. Like this is definitely oh la la. But in like nowadays, we don't do that a lot. We just do one or something like that sometimes two, but like, it's really brief, like short. So here, oh la la, ça t'arrive tout le temps. You can do that, like just one. So you do that. So this is a way, oh la la is this. The next one is, je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas, like literally, I don't know. But it means more that I have no idea. When you do this gesture, when you do this, like it means, I have no ID. We do that a lot. I have no ID. But you can, like, I think, like, it's not only French people that are doing that. But in French, you can add something different. You can do this with your mouth. Like, you can pout. You do that. You, you do. And usually you can add also the sound, like, like, I don't know. And you can also, uh, like move your shoulder, your shoulders, like I have no ID. But you can also say, uh, you can also just do this with your mouth, like just pout. If you do, it means like, I don't know. We do that a lot. Like you don't want to say, so with this you don't say anything, but it means like I have no ID. Sometimes in French you say, like sometimes it's just like you do that, you just flip your hands and you do so here are many different ways to say it, to express like I don't know you can say or or it depends but the most important thing is it means like I don't know when you do that it's quite common in French you don't know like you definitely have no idea like someone asks you a question uh, where is, uh, like, usually you, do, you don't do that with strangers, like in the street if someone asks you uh, his way, you will not say, <laughs> like, it's really rude. But with a friend, like a friend told you, like, uh, do you know when, um, when the class is starting? You can say, <laughs> or just, <laughs> like, you, you, like, you're doing something, you just say, because <laughs> it's a fast way to, to express that you don't know. The next one is, c'est pas moi, like, c'est pas moi, or c'est pas moi. 
This is more like je ne sais pas. But if you do that, it's like c'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. So it means like it's not me or I didn't do anything. Like it's not my fault. Like if someone uh, did a mistake and someone is blaming you, you say c'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. It's like you're raising your hand. Like please raise your hand. It's like kind of similar, but in French you can do that in like um, common situations. So for example, someone told you who qui a cassé le vase? Who broke the vase? Who broke the vase? And you can say, c'est pas moi, c'est pas moi. And usually you do like, um, you move your head, like if you do no, you do, c'est pas moi. Like you're adding like a kind of no with your head. C'est pas moi. Like, uh, but you can use it in more common situations, like someone told you like, um, who and the cake? Like, who ate the last piece of cake? You say, c'est pas moi. You can just say, c'est pas moi. You don't need, oh c'est pas moi. You don't need to, to do that like, a, like this. You can just raise a bit and you, c'est pas moi. But it's quite, kind of common, like we do that a lot. When you want to say, oh it's not my fault. Like, oh no, it's not me. C'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. So this one is quite, quite common. The next one is like, we don't use it a lot uh, nowadays, but the expression um, is the same than the gesture. When you say mon oeil, it means my eye. And when you do this, like you stretch the skin under your eye, it means like mon oeil, when you do this, mon oeil. And it's like, I don't believe it, or I don't believe you. We do that a lot when we, like, when, when we are young, like children in France, they do that a lot, like mon oeil, mon oeil. It's a bit childish if you do that, uh, or old fashioned. So if you say like someone is telling, like you, someone told you that he's sick, and then you're like, il est malade. You, you, like you want to say, he's sick, I don't believe it. Like he said he's sick, I don't believe it. In French you can say, il est malade. Mon oeil. Il est malade. Mon oeil. If you, do, you can say the expression, but if you do the gesture, it's really childish. But you can see a lot of child doing that, like a lot of children doing this. Mon oeil. It means like, I don't believe you, or I don't believe, I don't believe what he said, or I don't believe what you are saying. So this one, not really used nowadays, unlike the others, but it's still interesting to know this one. The next one is j'ai du nez. It means like I have flair. Like you do this because nez, it means nose. So you just do that. You touch your nose. If you do that in French, it means like, oh, I'm proud of me. I managed to guess this. So you can do that. And usually you've got like a little smile, like j'ai du nez. Or you can say to someone like he has some nose. Il a du nez. Il a du nez. But it's not that common. Usually it's better to use it for j'ai du nez, like for yourself. J'ai du nez. Like you're proud of yourself, so you just um, raise your eyebrows and you do a little smile and you say, like that, j'ai du nez. So here is a situation, like an example. Like someone, like you want to say, oh, I told you she was pregnant. I have flair. I know those things. So if, in French, you can say, je t'avais dit qu'elle était enceinte. J'ai du nez. You can do that. Or you can just do it without the gesture. You can say, je t'avais dit qu'elle était enceinte. J'ai du nez. Or you can just say the first sentence, like, I told you she was pregnant. Je t'avais dit qu'elle était enceinte. You can say, je t'avais dit qu'elle était enceinte. If you do that, like, you underpin that you're good. Because you manage to guess that. Je t'avais dit qu'elle était enceinte. And usually you've got this satisfying smile with that. So here, this means I told you something like that. Like I told you or I'm good, I'm good at guessing or like I have flair. I can guess stuffs. So this one, we use it uh, sometimes. The next one is il est fou. It means he is crazy. What you can do to express that is just this. You just tap your head like, he's crazy. 
it's not like I'm smart with the smile, like you're satisfied. It's like you have got a mean look or a despiteful look and you say, you're crazy or he's crazy or do you have a problem with your head? Are you okay? Something like that. But you can also do, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? If you do that, like, it more like it's more like related to the ears. Like, can you understand what we say? Like, peux tu comprendre ce qu'on dit? Peux tu comprendre ce qu'on dit? Like, are you crazy? Do you have a head problem? You can say that. But there is also like a really childish version that we do a lot. Uh, like French children do that a lot at the playground. Um, it's doing this. You use your finger and you just tap with one finger your head like this and the most childish version of that is then to point the person that you think is crazy you do that like two times and then two times you tap two times your head and then two times you point the person you can also like children also just tap two times like you're crazy you're crazy but sometimes they also point the person so you don't do that like if you're not a child because it's really weird if you do it now but you can see sometimes children doing that it means like you are crazy and usually you do that like directly in front of the person because when you're a child you don't care about the opinion of people so you just do this and this it's just like uh, a game a small game so not nothing much not, not much so don't use it uh, just prefer to use this or this but it's just a, a funny things to know the last one is motus et bouche cousue or sometimes just motus you can get rid of that motus et bouche cousue it's like a french expression which means keep it under your hat so in english it's like keep it under your hat but you don't do that right but in french you've got a gesture associated to this Motus, it's like, an, um, like, it doesn't have any meaning. When you say motus, it's like, don't talk. Don't tell anyone about it. Like, don't talk with, don't, don't talk about that. So no meaning. Et, it's like, and. And when you say bouche cousue, it means like, stitch mouth. So the gesture you can do is stitch mouth. So you do this. Just like that. You don't stitch it. You just do one. It's like you zip it, you zip your mouth. So you say motus et bouche cousue. You can say that. So you can say motus or motus et bouche cousue. Motus et bouche cousue. Motus et bouche cousue. But you can also say this. If you want to stay discreet, like you told a secret to someone, but someone is, another person is coming into the room and you want to express quickly that, oh, I just told you a secret, don't tell anyone, don't tell the person that just came in. So you just say, like, it's discreet, and if the person didn't see you, uh, it's good, because you avoid using words, so you're silent when you do that. So when you do that, it's a good way to express that, don't tell anyone. Because usually when you say, motus et bouche cousue, motus et bouche cousue, it's more like you say it, but you don't do the gesture. But you can also say that do the gesture to express uh, the meaning. But modus et bouche cousue, it's more, it's a bit childish the way you say it, but you can say it, it's like we, a lot of teenagers and adults still say it. So, we've seen 10 different gestures. I'm gonna show them once again. J'en ai marre, j'en ai par dessus la tête. I'm fed up with something. <sighs> You can say, you can do that. Avoir peur. Like, flipper. You're afraid? Or you're afraid? Or, I was afraid. Then, on y va, let's go. If you do this, it means, okay, let's go. Next one, oh la la, oh la la, or just oh la la, oh la la. Usually when you say oh la la, it's like that. But when you do like a full sentence, you just say one, you do, just do it once and you, then you do the sentence. Oh la la, oh la la, oh la la, je suis en retard, I'm late, oh la la, I'm late. So you can do that. Next, je ne sais pas, 
Je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. But you can also do that. Like a pout. You pout. Like you do that, just the pouting. Or you can also do with your hands like... I don't know. Je ne sais pas. C'est pas moi. It's like, well, it's not me. Like usually you do that with your head in the same time. Like, c'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. It's not me. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything. Like, c'est pas moi. C'est pas moi. And you can use it in uh, everyday life. Not if, not only if you're arrested. You just say, oh, I don't know. Like, like it's not me. If something happened, like some, someone is telling you it's your fault. No, it's not my fault. Then, mon oeil. Mon oeil. You do that, but it's a bit childish. Be careful. J'ai du nez. You do that. You're satisfied, so you smile. I have flair. I know. I knew it. I knew it. Then, il est fou. He's crazy. So this or this. He's crazy. He's crazy. Or you're crazy. You are crazy like a mean look. I'm talking to someone. You're crazy. And the last one, motus et bouche cousue. Motus et bouche cousue. Well, I hope you like this video. Hey guys, it's Pierre from France. Welcome back for more videos on French learning. Today's video will be about genders in French. I know it's really annoying genders in that language, but it's something that you really need to master if you want to sound French and to speak uh, real French. But um, we think that usually it's really random the way that a noun is feminine or masculine. But in fact, there are some rules that you can remember. And if you do that, you will be able to guess if a noun is feminine or masculine. But of course, experience is better than just learning rules. So just you need to, when you learn a new word, try to remember uh, the gender. So let's get started with Feminine ending. Da, if, you, if you see one word ending with this one, yon, you are like 99% sure that it's a feminine word. And if it's with sion or sion, like same pronunciation but different letter, here it's with a T and here it's with an S, this you're sure with 100%. So here, You've got this example, la construction, la construction. So I will always put uh, an article here to show that it's feminine or masculine. So here it's feminine, la, you know, the equivalent, the masculine equivalent is le, but here it's la. La construction, like in English, construction. And here, like uh, traduction or translation, traduction, la traduction, T-I-O-N. It means it's a feminine word. So just remember that. And some examples with uh, Sion. La télévision. Television. Again, it's uh, a similar word in English. And here, la décision. La décision. Decision. So as you can see, for those words, usually it's the same than in English. Like almost the same here. There is the accent in French. And here as well. But it's the same ending. So, if you, account, if you see those two endings, it's feminine. And usually, it's the, the English equivalent of the word is kind of similar, because these endings exist in, in English as well. So, this is for uh, Sion and Sion. So, same pronunciation even for French speakers. Um, here is another one, T. Like, for example, la beauté. La beauté, beauty, and la réalité, la réalité. So, as you can see in English, beauty, beauté, réalité, reality. T is the equivalent of T in English. So, like, when you see a word that is um, ending with a T, T-Y t in English, there is a high probability that Uh, the translation would be with T, and if it's the case, the word is always feminine. 
some other examples like clarity, clar clarté, la clarté, clarity, la clarté. So here it's a bit different, but you see T and T en français, in French. So here, those two endings are really important, but the next category is most of the words ending with E. E, you know, it's the feminine mark. Like when you have an adjective, you have to, you have to change the, the ending of the adjective depending of the noun, if it's a masculine noun or a feminine noun. And usually, and it's like always the case in fact, you add an E to prove that it's a feminine, uh, to, to, you add an E at the end of the adjective because the noun is feminine. So E is the mark of the, um, of the feminine form. But uh, not all the words, all the nouns ending with E are feminine, but a lot, many, many of them. And for those endings, it's always the case. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six different endings. The first one is et. Et, like when you say a word with et for French, an H speaker, it sounds feminine. Et is really feminine with double T E. For example, cigarette, la cigarette, cigarette, la cigarette. Same than in English. Here, feminine. Then here you have trumpet, la trompette, la trompette, la trompette. Again, feminine. You have E double T E, E double T E, feminine always. Here, you've got two similar ones, en, ans and ans, like same pronunciation, but sometimes it's with an A, sometimes it's with an E. So here, you have la ressemblance, ressemblance, similar to the English word, resemblance, except that in French you need to add two S here, you have two S, in English you have only one, la ressemblance, la ressemblance, it ends with A-N-C-E, so definitely it's a feminine word. Same with this one, la chance, like chance or luck. C-H-A-N-C-E, A-N-C-E, feminine, always feminine. The next one is with E-N-C-E, so same pronunciation, as you can see here, la différence, similar to the English word, difference, la différence, here, there is an accent, but in English it's the same except that. La différence, difference. So here you can see when I say ressemblance and différence, this is the same pronunciation. There is even for native French speakers, there is no difference in between those two sounds. So don't be afraid. Uh, don't. This is quite normal for native uh, French speakers not to distinguish that. The only way you can distinguish it is when you write it. And here is another example, l'intelligence. L'intelligence, like smartness or the fact of being clever, cleverness. L'intelligence. So here again, E-N-C-E. But for this one, there is one big exception. This is silence. Silence, like quietness. Le silence. Here, even though it's E-N-C-E, -E, you need to be, to, to use um, like le, which is, mas which proves that it's masculine. So le silence, masculine word. Be careful with this one. Then there is another one which is U-R-E. U-R-E. Here is an example. La peinture, like painting. La peinture, la peinture. So here, U, R, E, so again, feminine. Another one is la culture, la culture, culture. Here, it's U, R, E, so definitely it's feminine. So this is for this one. No, let's move on to the next one. E, double S, E. As this one, E double T E, when you hear that as a native French speaker, it sounds really feminine. 
So almost all the words with E, double S, E are feminine. Same for this one. There is like no big exception for this one. La sagesse, like wisdom. La sagesse, sagesse. It means that it's feminine because E double S E. In French, the E double S E uh, ending is quite similar to the ness one in English, like cleverness. Um, it's a way to make an adjective, to turn an adjective into a noun. So here you can say sage. Someone is sage, like wise. And if you add E double S E, it becomes a noun. So here, la sagesse. Here is an ex another example, la promesse, in English promise. La promesse, here again, e double s e, so definitely it's feminine. And the last one is i n e, like in la cuisine, kitchen, or cuisine, you can also say cuisine, because in French cuisine means like the fact of cooking, and uh, the activity of cooking and also the room, the kitchen. So here, cuisine, I and E. And here, l'origine, the origin. So here, as you can see, and you can see that as well in intelligence, l'intelligence, there is a vowel. So with this, you cannot say if it's feminine or masculine, if you just see the L like that, because there is a contraction. But this, um, if you use like un or une, you would say une origine, or here une intelligence. You have to be careful because here, um, when you say it, you need to know if it's masculine or feminine. But here you know it's feminine because it's I-N-E, or here it's E-N-C-E. -E. So be careful with that. So it was like six examples, like the six biggest categories of nouns that are always feminine and nouns that end with an E. Because as you can see, it's always ending with an E, with an E. So here, always feminine, except in this case, and maybe they, they are some more, like there are some more, but don't focus too much on that, because in 99% of the, of the cases, it's always feminine. So this is uh, the good ones. And sometimes there is also there are also some masculine e ending, but we will see that later. But if you don't know if a word is feminine or masculine, but the word ends with a he with a e, there is a high chance that this one is feminine. And if it's this one, it's definitely feminine. Let's move on to masculine endings. The first one is en. When you see a word that ends with en the sound en, I know it's a difficult one for non-native non French speakers, but this one is really important. En, 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 same pronunciation for the four words. So here, as you can see, there is an E and an A, but it's the same, and here you've got a silent T. You don't say it, so for those four endings, it's en. It's a bit similar to this en, en, like same pronunciation, even if it's an A or an E. So here, en, en. There is a high chance that if it ends with an en, it's masculine. And if it's with M, E, N, T, you're sure like 99%, almost like almost 100% that it's masculine. So here is an example, le paiement. Payment, like it's the same than in English, meant. If a word, usually a word uh, in English that ends with meant, you can translate it into a word in French that ends with mo. And if you do it, it's always masculine. Masculine. Le paiement. The payment. Le paiement. So here you're sure like 100%. for this one. But um, for the other ones, you're almost sure, like I would say more than 90%. So here you've got some examples. A child, un enfant, un enfant. 
So here I do the liaison. Un enfant. Or you can also say l'enfant. But here you don't, it's same than here. Like you don't see if it's masculine or feminine. So for these examples, those examples, I prefer to use un or une. So here you've got un. So un enfant. A-N-T. It's masculine. A-N-T. Next one is a glove. Un gant. Un gant. Un gant. A-N-T. Glove. Enfant, gant. Here, same, to, same ending. So, not much to say. So, here is another one. Un paysan, un chien. Paysan, A-N. Un chien, I-N. Here, you can see. En, paysan, chien. But here, the pronunciation is a bit different for chien. But um, here, you've got a masculine word. But one thing you can do in French is sometimes for like words, especially for animals and um, people, because here, un paysan, it means like peasant, and chien means dog. So here, it's an animal, and here, it's a person, like a peasant. For in those cases, in French, you can turn those words into a feminine one. If you add, usually, a specific mark. And usually, this specific mark is the feminine E. E is the mark of feminine noun. So here, if you add an E, you can do it. But with the A-N and E-N, when you do that, you need to double the N. So, une paysanne, une Chienne. So here you double the N and you add an E. So here you've got the feminine ending and a masculine ending. So that's why in most cases NA and EN are masculine, because if you want the feminine equivalent, you need to add NE at the end. So this one, EN, usually it's always. Um, masculine. Let's move on to the next one. Here it's un, the sound un. So here it's three different ways to, to write un, but it's the same un. Here it's silent T, and here it's the same un. I know it's quite hard. Maybe you don't hear the difference between en and un, but like it's really different for French speakers. Le pain, bread. Le pain. Le pain. It's a bit similar to chien here. Le pain, chien. Like E, E, N is a bit similar to A, A, I, N. So, yeah, you've got this one. And here you've got another example. Le chemin. Le chemin. Path. Here, I, N. And here another one, a funny one. Le pingouin, which is not like penguin, but oak. It's almost the same. But here you've got one uh, other words with I-N. But here you've got like a not common ending in French, O-U-I-N. But it's still I-N, so masculine. So here, masculine, 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 I-N, I-N, I-N. So here it's even A, A-I-N. So here, as you can see, it's masculine I-N, and here with an E, it's feminine, so it's it's not the equivalent. Like it's not like you cannot just add an e and make it and turn it into a feminine word. But you can notice that with an e, it's feminine, and without, it's masculine. So yeah, it's really important to remember that usually i n the song the sound un uh, is masculine. So you've got those two examples. Let's move on to the next one. Here. You've got different ways to say the sound O. O. This is almost 99%, almost 100% sure that the words that ends with one of these will be masculine. So here it's the same pronunciation O, 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 O. Like you've got many, many different ways to write it in French. But here it's a silent T, silent S, silent T, silent D. 
and here AU it's O in French and EAU is all it's also O. So here le crapaud, like a toad, toad in English, le crapaud, crapaud. Here AUD, so this one, it's masculine. Here is another one, snail, un escargot, un escargot, escargot. So here OT, same pronunciation, O, un escargot. Another one is le saut, like a jump, the jump. AUT, you don't say the T, so it's masculine, le saut. Un oiseau, like a bird. Here, E-A-U, E-A-U, so it's masculine. But there is one big exception, which is in fact not really an exception. This is l'eau. So here you cannot see if it's masculine or feminine, so you would say une eau. Here you can see that it's E-A-U, but in fact, the whole word is E-A-U. It's not an ending, because here it's like, um, grammatically speaking, um, this is uh, an ending. But here, the whole word is E-A-U, so it's not an ending. So be careful with this one. But we don't say a lot, une O. But it's important to know that E-A-U is uh, feminine when you use an adjective, like um, une eau claire, like clear water. Here, it's important for the E. So, be, but here I used une. But if you want to use l'eau, l'eau claire, here, you need to know for the E here. So, let's move on to the next one, which is on, the, son, the sound on. With on, un, on is probably one of the most difficult sounds for French learners. So here, like it's silent T, and silent D, and here like O-M, and O-N, it's same pronunciation in French. So here, le ballon, le ballon, like the ball, le ballon, masculine. Le dragon, dragon, same than in English, same. Le pont, like a bridge, bridge, O-N-T, T is silent, le pont. Here you've got le prénom like first name, but it's the case for like nickname, le surnom, or um, le nom, name. You've got OM here. M is like if it was an N. So here, masculine. And another one, an example with OND is le bon, like leap, it's a leap. So here, silent D, masculine. The next one is OU, again, X silent, T silent, so it's the same pronunciation for all those endings. This one, it's not 100% sure, but it's almost. Like those ones are um, really common. This one maybe a bit less, uh, same than this one, same for this one, but it's in almost, in a lot of cases, it's um, masculine. So here you've got an example, le pou, like laus, in the head, on the head. Le pou, O-U-X, O-U-X, like pronunciation ou, so it's not, uh, it's masculine. Le ragou, like stew, the stew, O-U-T, O-U-T. Here le caillou, people, people, le caillou, always pronunciation ou, so masculine. For all those cases. And be careful with this one, la roue. La roue, it's um, like a feminine word. But here it's not one of the three, um, one of the three endings that is written. Here it's with an E, O-U-E. So that's why it's not 100%. It's because uh, like all the way you can write OU in French, uh, only three of them are like almost always masculine. There is one ending that is feminine. It's when it's with an E. So again, as I told you, most of the words ending with E are feminine. And this 
is an example. The next one is al, like le cheval, horse, or animal, animal, un animal, l'animal, un animal, or hospital, un hôpital. Same, you see that a lot of words in English ends with al, and usually it's often the case that in French it's also with al, so in those cases it's masculine. So al, masculine. In many cases. It's not always the case, but in most cases. So this is all for um, the masculine endings, like the common ones. But there is also masculine endings which are E sometimes. I told you most of the words ending with E are feminine, but it's not always the case. So here you've got, like it's 100% sure that it's feminine, except for this one, le silence. But it's like almost always feminine. But there are some words that are always masculine. And then for the remaining ones, there is a high chance that it's feminine, but sometimes it's also masculine. So be careful. But usually, if you just remember those four endings without remembering those ones, you can guess that the word is feminine. If it's not one of these, it's probably feminine. But if you want really to like to be accurate, you should also learn those ones. That sounds feminine. And it's always feminine when you hear that. So here are the four ones that are always masculine. This one is really common. Isme. Like, it's like in English, ism. Like, le réalisme. Le réalisme. Realism. Like, humanism. L'humanisme. Like, feminism. Le féminisme. Here, always. Le. Le féminisme, le réalisme, realism. So I S M E, always masculine. Here is another one, like age. Like you can say l'âge, for example, the age, but it's not a terminism here. Uh, like it's same than O, because the full word is age. Here mar in mariage, like uh, wedding or also marriage because in French it's the same word, you've got uh, the A-G-E as, as, as an ending. So here, it's masculine. All the word with A-G-E are masculine in French. And here are two other ones, like scope in English. So scope in French, scope. Like telescope, telescope in English. Le telescope, like really similar. Le telescope. Le téléphone in French, le téléphone. In English, like telephone. So here, you can see like it's the same beginning of the word, like télé. And here you've got different ending, and those two endings are um, masculine. So all words with scope and like scope in French, scope in English, or phone, phone in English, and fun in French, fun, scope, fun. Like it's not really a O, it's like fun. A bit different. Maybe you cannot catch it, but it doesn't really matter. Le téléphone, le télescope. So that's all for the for the masculine e endings. Like it's in those cases, it's always masculine. So be careful with that. So let's sum that up: feminine endings and masculine endings. For feminine endings, there is i o n and t e. It's like almost feminine, in all cases feminine, like almost 100% sure that it's, it will be feminine. So those two only. I will talk about that later. For masculine endings, you've got this one, en, o, those two are like almost 100%, like 99%. For M, E, N, T, it's 100%. So for those two, it's almost always masculine. For those two as well, un and on, it's almost always masculine. Here, when you hear OU, it's always masculine, except if there is OUE, which, which means like it's, um, it's uh, feminine. By the way, I didn't translate this word. Roux is like the wheel. 
So this case, and also a last one, al, often masculine when you see al. And concerning the e endings, if you don't know, there is a high chance that it's feminine. If it's one of those, this is masculine. But in other cases, it's almost always feminine, as you can see here. But sometimes it's not the case. But for those ones, it's 100% sure that it's the case. So I hope with those endings, if you can remember that, like you don't need to learn that by heart, but if you can do it, like remember some of them, you will be able to guess the gender. And this is really helpful when you learn French. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hey guys, welcome back for more videos on French learning. It's Pierre from France. And today's video will be about verb endings and especially e and ir. I think those ones are the most common one and I will explain all in details how you can detect the words and the groups um, of these endings. So, without further ado, let's get started. You know, in French, there, there are three groups. First group, second group, and third group. The first group is er, always er. Only verbs with this ending are in this group. E. The second group is only for ich, I are, but the problem is the third group is for many different kind of verbs, but also for ir. So this is kind of annoying because this here, the third group is known to be like full of a lot of exceptions. And those with IR, you have a lot of exceptions. So we will explain how you can try to recognize verbs from the second group and from the third group, even if there is just the IR. And also I will explain how you can use ER verbs, because there is only one exception, the verb aller, which is also a third group, like the exception group. So all the verbs with ER are in the first group except aller. And all the verb with ER are from the second group or from the third group. Like I, you can say like half is in the second group and the other half is uh, in the third group. So let's start with the first group, ER. Here you've got some example to speak parler, parler, to eat, manger, manger, to walk, marcher, marcher. So as you can see here, you have always ER and you've got what we call a stem. All verbs from the first group are made of a stem and the ending, which is always ER. And then you've got, if you add the stem and the ending, you've got the infinitive form of the verb. It's like when you say to speak in, uh, in English, like in the dictionary, you can find verbs with this form, parler. So this is all you have to remember, like you remember, you ha have to know how to detect the stem and the ending. And then for uh, like the most common tenses, it's quite easy. So I'm going to explain just for the four mo co more common tenses, uh, for the verbs. I'm not going to explain all the conjugation or all, all the conjugation because um, it's not really important and it's not the purpose of this lesson and if you run to, if you want to know the, conju the conjugation you need to to learn uh, by yourself and I'm gonna just uh, repeat again the, um, the different endings for uh, the conjugation but what you have to remember is for Présent, which is like present, you need to use the stem, so here, and then you had the ending of the, conjug of the conjugaison. So here, e, you've got all the, the ending for all verbs of the first group. If you know them, you can use the correct form for every verb at the present, like every verb for the first group. So here, présent, you add, you take parle, for the, if you want to use the verb parler, you take parle, and then you add the correct conjugaison. 
So here, for example, if you want to say je parle, like um, I talk or I speak, um, you can use the first one, je, you take parle, parle, and then you add e, and you've got parle. So this is really easy. And it's the same for the, for the imparfait, which is like a bit like preterite, but the usage is a bit different. But anyway, we can say, roughly speaking, that it's like the preterite. So here, imparfait, you take the stem again, and you add the conjugaison, which is, this time, this list. And if you know this list, you can try, you can get the, good, the correct form for every verbs. And same for the future, but except that here, you don't need to add, you don't add the stem, you add the infinitive. So it's like the stem plus the ending. So for uh, manger, for example, you just take manger and then you add the correct ending. So if you want to say um, you or like uh, you, you eat, but you want to use fut future, so you want to say you will eat. So you take manger, infinitive, and then you add the correct ending. So I said tu, like you. So I take the second one. And then mangera, manger, a, mangera, tu, mangera. So here you've got the correct form. So just a quick, uh, like, quick summing up, like this is je, tu, il, nous, vous, il. Like I, you, he or she, we, you, like plural you, and then il or elle, which is like uh, de, like plural. And then you've got the last form, which is like what we call participe passé, which is used when you want to use something close to the past perf like the past uh, perfect in, in, in English. So here, you just take the stem, so here, parle, and you add e with an accent. And it's the same for all verbs from this group. So you've got parler. And this is like, uh, you know, the participe passé. It's like you use two verbs. You first use the verbs you want to, to express, so like manger. And then you add before the auxiliary. And, the, and then uh, all you need to, to change, depending on if you use I or you or, or there, it's like the auxiliary. And this never changed. That's why there is only one ending. Et. So here, uh, like if I want to say, I, he, he was like he ate, like past, I would say, il a mangé. Il a mangé. So here, a is like uh, the verb, it's the verb avoir, like to have, like auxiliary in French, and then manger. And this is just this participe passé, this form. So here, I'm going to show you some examples. Like if I, if I want to say, je parlais, je parlais. Here, try to guess what is um, the, um, the, the tense and the correct terminaison, like the correct ending. So here, you can try for those three verbs. And then I will give the answer. OK, did you try? OK. So here, parle, as you can see, it's the stem. So it's probably present or imparfait. And here you see AIS, AIS, and you see here AIS. So this is imparfait. So because it's je, like first, uh, first column, here, est. So, je parlais, you know that it's like imparfait, the stem, plus the ending, I, A -I -S, a -I -S. So, here, you, it's quite easy. Same for the next one, manger. Here, it's not the stem, but it's the infinitive. So, it's probably future, like it can only be future. So you've got the infinitive, and then you've got uh, the conjugation to find. You know it's new, so new like you to you take the third, like the fourth colon. So here on, and you see that on, it's here. So it's future. So here it's we, 
will eat, we will eat. And for this one, it was, um, I was speaking or I spoke, depending on the sentence. And then here, il marchait. Il marchait. Here, you've got the stem, marche. And here, you've got the, the ending, ending here. Here, you've got the stem. It's the verb marcher, without the ending, marcher, so to walk, and then it's future, like it's uh, the, the plural, sorry, and here, as you can see, it's imperfect, so you've got il marchait, like they were walking or uh, they, wo they, um, they walked. So it's quite easy for the first group. And remember, it's like that for every verb that ends with ER, really easy. And many, many verbs, like most of the French verbs are with ER at the end. So it's super easy. If you can remember that, you will know how to, to find the correct form for every verb. Let's now move on to the next one. Second group with a large part of IR verbs, IR. So here, the logic is really similar to the logic from this group. Here are some examples. To end, finir. To choose, choisir. And to whiten, blanchir. Many verbs, like first hints, first hint to get to, to manage to know if it's a second group or a third group. You've got a lot of verbs in English when you can add un at the end. It's mean like you want, to, you want something to get like a new state. So here, whiten, it's like you want something to get white. And you can do the same in French. So here you've got the adjective white in, in English, and you add en, and you've got uh, the verb, like to get white. Or the same with harden, to harden, like to get hard. And you can do the same in French. So here it's the translation for white, blanche, without the e, it's an adjective. And the, the en, in French, this ending is IR. So you've got here, like you want to make something white. And when you've got verbs like that, like you, if you recognize an adjective and then the IR, it's almost 100% sure that it's second group. So remember that if it, if it implies a new state, like you've got a new state, like you want to make something uh, make something different, like based on an adjective, like you want to make uh, it white or black or hard or something like that, it's probably like 100% sure that uh, it's ir, like second group. So remember that. Like for example, harden, to harden in French, you would say um, durcir, durcir. And as you can see here, you've can, you can see hard in French, which is dur, dur. And then you see IR, there is this C, but it's not what is important. As you can see here, you see the adjective, and here you see the IR, so you know it's a second group. So remember that. But then you've got also classic verbs like finir, like to end, or choisir, to choose, that are second group, and there is no specific rules. But this is a good hint if you don't know for verbs. So, as I said, it's quite similar to the first group. You've got the stem, the ending, which is this time IR, and then the infinitive form, which is the addition of the stem and the ending. So here, you've got fin, ir, finir, finir, to end. And then it's exactly the same here. That's why you can see, uh, like here, it's like for the two groups. If you know the ending associated to the second group, you know how to make the verb. You need to use the stem here, like you need to remember just this one, and then you add the correct form. So here, for uh, the present, the, the ending are a bit different than uh, for the first group, but if you remember just those six endings, you're good with all the second group for the present. So here it's is, is, it, ils sont, ils sont, is. So here, you just remember that and you can do it. 
uh, like for example, if I want to say choisir, je choisis, je choisis, like I choose, here you take the stem, like so here, the stem of here, you get rid of the ending, so it's choise, choix, with the S, and you add this, so you've got choisi, really easy. Like same for the imparfait, which is this time a bit easier, like as you can see here, it's the same ending that for the first group. So you just remember the same endings and you're good. What you can do is, what you have to do is just before this ending add I double S. I double S and you've got the form that uh, you know how to do it for uh, the imparfait. So here you take fin, like if you want to say nous, like I, I ended, I ended. So here you take uh, the verb to end, finir, you get rid of this, so we've got fin, you add I double S S, like double, double S, so you've got finis, and then you add, so I said I, so you add here A I S. So we've got je finissais, je finissais, I ended, je finissais. Quite easy. And for the future, it's even more easy. Same ending, same ending here, and you've got uh, infinitive, so you take this, stem plus ending, you've got finir, and you've got your ending, you've got all you need to do with the, um, with the future. So here, if I want to say je, um, let's choose a verb choisir, like uh, I will choose, so je choisirai, je choisirai, choise here, you've got You've got, sorry, you take the stem and the ending, so you take all the verb, infinitive, choisir, and you add here, so I choisirai, so you just say, je choisirai, quite easy. And for the participe passé, you just use the E at the end, so you take the stem and you add the E, so here you just, in a certain way, you can say, you just get rid of the R for this one. So let's check those examples. Nous finissons, nous finissons, vous choisissiez, vous choisissiez, and elles ont fini, elles ont fini. Try to translate that into English to see which tense is used and which ending. Did you find it? Okay. So here, nous finissons, as you can see here, You've got the stem, and as you can see, E double S. But maybe it's imparfait, but here you can see that you've got also two endings that are with E double S. So you need to be careful with that. So you check here, and you see that this and this, it's similar. So it's present, nous finissons. We finish, nous finissons like finish or end, we end, nous finissons. Then, the next one, vous choisissiez. So here you can see again the stem and again I double S. But here, if you check here, it's none of those. So it's probably imparfait, E double S. And then you check for this, I, E, Z, and you see here, it's I, E, Z. So it's like you were choosing, or like you chose, like the past form of choisir, to choose. So here it's like plural, it's le, the plural you in French. So it's past, a past tense, like imparfait. And then this one, elles ont fini, elles ont fini. Quite easy, because here you've got the the verb avoir, to have, so it's definitely participe passé, which is, this is present, and then you see here, there is nothing difficult, like the stem plus I. So it's really easy for the second group. You remember that for the second group, and if you know the first group, the rules are really similar and quite easy, but the thing is, a lot of verbs with IR at the end, 
or from the third group, and the rules are way different. So, so far, we've seen that you need to remember st the stem, but it's not something that you really need to remember because the stem is inside of the verb, like the infinitive form, parle, fin. So this is the case for first and second group. But for the third group, it's like the group of the all exceptions and you don't have one stem. Usually, you cannot guess the stem only based on the infinitive. So here, venir or, or tenir, like to hold or to come, it's not the stem is not like this or this. They are one of the stems of the verb, but it's not the only one. So for this third group, you need to remember all the stems. And it will, it will change depending on the present, imperfect, future, but also if it's plural or singular. This is kind of messy, so this you need to learn by heart. So I'm not going to explain all the usage of all the stems, but I'm going to show you some big, some big groups of verbs with IR and the stems associated to those groups. So first one is venir, like all verbs with E-N-I-R, venir, tenir. The, the, those two verbs are the most common one from this category. So here you've got four stems. The first one is this one, vient, then you've got vent, then you've got vienne, and then you've got viandre. Or viandre. You, you say it viandre. So here, the usage will depend on many things. So first, let's start with the easiest one. This one, vi viandre. In French, the mark of the future is the letter or. This letter is really, um, has a kind of meaning of the future. As you can see here, for the future form, you always have the R, because you take the infinitive. So this R is like future. Same here, finir, infinitive. So you use the R. And this is the case also for uh, verbs. So here, for verbs from this third group, so here you've got viandre. So you can see that on this stem there is the or. So since there is no or in uh, venir except the final or, and you see here it's a new form but with the or, you can say, okay, this is the stem for the future. And third, groups, ver third group verbs are annoying, but one thing that is cool is there is only, always only one stem for the future. And sometimes it's close to the, the infinitive. But here, you see that viandre. So this is the future. And those ones, you need to learn. If you remember those three ones, and then you learn, you see some tables of all the different forms of venir or tenir, or all those verbs in venir, you can have, you can, um, use all the verbs, all the different verbs. So this is future and then this is uh, the rest. You need to remember. I'm not going to explain it because it would be too long to explain, but what you need to remember is that you've got three, those three different stems. So next one is verbs with tir, partir, but it's also the same logic for the verb dormir, just dormir, like to sleep. Partir, it's like to leave. So here, you've got only two stems. One is just you get rid of the ending IR, and one you get rid of the T as well. So here and here. It's quite easy, and then you learn by heart. Uh, you can use the same logic for uh, everything. So then, you need to learn. I'm not going to explain again. You just remember that verbs with tir or not always uh, from the third group, but if they are from the third group, it's always the same logic, only two different stems, so quite easy. Then, you've got verbs with frir and vrir. Vrir, frir, like to open, ouvrir, to offer, offrir. So here, ouvre or ouvre. Two stems, you need to remember those stems, and then you need to know how to conjugate the verbs, but 
always two steps. Like you just one is you, you get rid of this, and one is you get rid of the or as well. So you remember those stems and then you check the, cor the correct endings and you know how to, to do it. And those verbs are always from the third groups. So here, vrir, frir, it's always from the third group. And then you've got ourir, like courir, to run. Two stems again, one is you just get rid of the ir and the other one is just you add an or and as you can see, there is an additional or here, which means it's like here, future. This is only for the future. You've got two or. So you remember the stems and then you know that it's, um, you know, if you remember the, the endings based on the different conjugaison, like it's not those ones, it's different. But if you remember them, you can do it. You can conjugate this verb. But be careful with mourir which is a bit different, the logic is a bit different. It's not like OUR. It's like quite similar except that you've got also one additional stem, which is MEUR. Like it's mainly for the present, it's only for the present. So here, be careful with MOURIR, which is a bit different. But otherwise, all the verbs, if you learn one ver the conjugation of one verb from this group, it's perfect, you know how to do it. And you've got also two others groups, which are verbs with querir and verbs with ir, like cueillir, to pick, like when you pick flowers, uh, cueillir. So be careful, those ones are really complicated. Uh, so I would advise you to check the conjugaison. And if you know the conjugaison of one verb with this, you know how to conjugate all the verbs with this ending. But be careful, those ones are always from the third group. So we've seen that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six different categories of verbs. If you see this category, there is a high chance that this verb is from the third group. It's the case for everything except for tir, where um, some of them are not from the third group, but some of them are from the second group. But remember, if you see this rule, like when you, to get something harder, to get something white, uh, you can guess if it's from the third group or second group. But it's not always the case. So if you remember just one way to conjugate the form for each group, you know how to do it for all the verbs from the groups. And you know how the stems. Don't, don't try really to remember the stems. It's not that important. Just try to remember that there is a similar logic when you use it. And uh, to end this, I would like to talk quickly about aller. Aller has, has, like, has three stems, vi, al, and ir. So here you see the, all the conjugaison of the verbs. Quickly, like je vais, tu vas, il va, nous allons, vous allez, ils vont, present, future. It's like you just use this and you add this, only this, not the, that, but here. And then you've got here again, I, R, IR, you, you add the future conjugaison, and you're good. And then here, like for the first group, participe passé with the accent. So, it was really fast for aller, but what you need to remember is, we've got three groups. All verbs with ER are from the first group, except aller, which is kind of different, you need to remember. Verbs with IR are either from the second group or from the third group. If it's from the third group, there is a high chance that the ending is one of those endings. It's 100% sure for this, 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 this endings. Those endings, it's always third group, except this one, like, sometimes it's uh, third group, sometimes it's second group, but if it's third group, it's always the same logic. So, you remember those categories and you can try to guess if it's the third group or not, and if it's a third group, you just need to remember the conjugation of one verb from this group, this subcategory, and you know how to do it for all the other ones. Don't focus too much on the stems. So, that's all for uh, this lesson about verbs verb endings. I know it's really complicated. I didn't put all the conjugaison you need to learn by yourself. The conjugaison I cannot just 
establish a list of everything, but here you've got a good overview of uh, the divisions of the verbs in, in French. So it was only for ER and IR, but next time we will see more endings. That's all for today. I hope you really enjoyed this video. Hey guys, it's Pierre from France and welcome back for more videos on French learning. We will talk about stems of verbs ending with voir in French today. Voir, sometimes there is an E, sometimes there is no E. So we will focus on all verbs that end with the sound, the sound voir, voir. Because even if there is an E, it's the same pronunciation. Voir, voir. Verb, verbs from the third group are infamous for one thing. It's that the stem is always changing. As you can see, we will see different stems. And it's annoying because you need to learn by heart all those stems. And sometimes you also need to learn the endings. But today we will not focus on the endings of uh, like when you change the form, like the conjugaison. We will not focus on the conjugaison, but on the stem, which is the most important thing. If you remember the stem, like the specific stem, you're all good and you will be able to use all those verbs with voir at the end. So, for, without further ado, let's get started with first category, avoir, which is like mainly, se voir or devoir. We've got two main verbs with that in French. It's like recevoir, like to receive, and devoir, like uh, I must or sometimes I shall. So here, you've got that. Also, note that when in English you've got a verb with uh, eve at the end, like in receive, like recevoir, receive. Sometimes in French the translation is with se voir, to receive, recevoir, to deceive, décevoir. You see, it's quite similar. So those verbs are uh, the same logic. So for all the verbs, I will define this table and you will see um, different things. Here you've got the tenses, présent, imparfait, futur, present, uh, imp imperfect and future. And here you've got um, the person, like if it's singular, je, tu, il, I, you, il, like he or she, like il or elle, if it's a feminine person, uh, like if it's feminine. Uh, here you've got the plural and I will distinguish two categories, like nouveau, like we and you, plural you, and il, like de, because sometimes, as you can see here, it's a bit different, it's not the same. So I do the distinction. But here you can see that it's the, you don't need to do the distinction. So, okay, you need to remember this and this, tenses and the person. So here with this, in the blue part, you see what is, the, like, what is uh, from the verb. So here, um, the blue part is something that is, we don't care. It's like the original stem of the verb. Like this is the infinitive form, this is the ending, and this is uh, like the original stem. So here you've got recevoir or devoir. It, but here I'm going to use the example of apercevoir, 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 which means like to, to see from a far distance. Like when you see something, like, oh, I, I see something. So you can use apercevoir. Like uh, um, j'aperçois quelqu'un dans la rue, or I see someone in the street. So you've got this. And for the present, you've got aperçois. The form for present and singular, je, tu, il, it's like aperçois. So here the blue part is from the verb. And then this is the modification of the form of the stem that you need to apply for this group. And then here you see three dots. It's like you need to add the correct ending. So usually it's like s, s, t. Like for many verbs, the ending, like from the third group, usually the ending is like S for je, S again for tu, 
and T for il. So if you want to say j'aperçois, je, j'aperçois, it's je, so S, if you want to use tu, tu aperçois, you add an S. And here if you want to say il aperçoit, il aperçoit, you add a T. So here you've got blue for, the blue part, which is from the verb, this, which is like for all the verbs from this category, and then you add the ending. So if you want to use the same logic with devoir, like I must, like you use, you take the D here, you add wa, so doa, D plus wa, so doa, and then you add the correct ending. But here you can see that I added something with C, you need to add something that, is, that you don't add with the D, you just need to add this, what we call cédille. This little thing is a specific C. It means that uh, you have to pronounce it as an S. And you do it only with um, when there is an O after that. So remember that for se voir, verbs with like that, you need to add this little thing with when there is an O after that. So it's on, it only concerns those two forms. So this is for the first category. Then you've got nous and vous, like we and you. It's this time you have to use apercevoir. So it means like apercevoir. So for the verb apercevoir or for the ver verb recevoir, to receive, you want to say nous recevons, we rece receive, you say nous, so you take this, nous res, and then you add of, so nous recevons, and then you add the ending, so basically for nous it's on, O-N-S, and for vous it's E-Z, it's always like that in French. So this is the three dots you see here, like depending on that, but you, like it's always O-N-S for nous and E-Z for uh, vous. And then you've got apercevons, nous apercevons, or here for recevoir, receive, we receive, nous recevons. So here, this, you take the E-V and then the ending. So another way to see that is like you just get rid of the oir and you've got your form for here. And for the last one, for plural, for de, it's the same than the first one. And the ending in, for present in French, it's ENT, like for like all the verbs, ENT. So aperçoit with ENT, de, de, like they must, il doit, il, plural i with an S at the end of il, il doit. So here you've got a V, a missing V. But the, the ending is still ENT, so aperçoivent. So here, de, like the must, you say, so D, it's the blue part, so you add just D instead of this. D, O, I, V, doivent, and then the ending. So ils doivent, the must, ils doivent, ENT for that. And then for the imperfect, it's the same, than for, the same form than for... Um, Present when you use nous or vous, it's aperceuve or dev or receive. So, for example, je recevais, je devais, tu devais. Here, it's always the same. You need to add, you, you take the blue part, you add ev, and then you add the ending. And the ending for imparfait, it's always the same in French. It's, uh, you can see that in the previous video, but it's like AIS, AIS, AIT. Uh, so this is for singular. Then you've got E, I, O, N, S, I, E, Z. And then you've got I, A, I, E, N, T for the last one. A, I, E, N, T. So basically you remember once the ending for imperfect and then you're all good. What you need to do in, is then to learn the stem. So here it's easy because the stem is always the same. And as you can see, it's always the same stem for imperfect. So you just remember the ending for all the verbs of imparfait, and then you remember the specific stem, and you're good. Then, future, future it's the same as you can see. You don't care about uh, the person, 
it's always just one stem that you need to remember. And here, it's apercevre. And as you can see, there is or, and or is the mark of the future in French. So here, apercevre, you just remember that. So with devoir, you want to say, um, I, w I will have to do, because in English you cannot say I will must, so I will have to do, je, um, je devrais, so you take the blue part, D, you add oeuvre, devrais, and then you add the, the ending of the future, so I guess you just remember the ending for the future, it's like imperfect, you just remember always the same ending, and if you know the stem, you can do everything with the future. So, three different stems, like four different stems that you need to remember here, aperçoit and aperçoive, aperceuve and apercevre. Those stems are quite similar, just like uh, the, the plural, the future or. So this is all for this one, for this category. The next one is with valoir. Like valoir itself is a verb and you've got a lot of verbs that are made with prefix. If you add a prefix in front of valoir, you've got a new verb. Like uh, if you add um, pré in, in front of valoir, prévaloir, prévaloir, it's mean like prévolt, and you've got uh, the same logic. So remember the logic for valoir. The logic is super easy, like in comparison with the first one. You just need to remember three different stems. One for the future, one for the imperfect, and it's the same for the plural for present, and the form of the present, the stem of the present for just singular person. So here, you just remember V I U, VO, and then you add the endings. So here, I said like this, uh, usually for the present, it's always like S S T, here, the ending for the present. It's almost always the case here, because since there is a vowel, it's not an S but an X. X and S are sometimes quite similar letters, it's just like S. X is like the S when there is a vowel before. So here there is a vowel, U, so you add just X. So here it's X, X, T. Here it was S, S, T for the ending. Here is X, X, T. But don't focus too much, it's not the purpose of this video. Here we care about the stem, not really the ending. But So here we've got vaut, je vaut, like um, you can use it for like it costs, I didn't translate it. Like valoir, it's, it means like to cost. Uh, like one of the translation, because you've got another verb you can say coûter, which is first group verb, er, coûter. But here you can also use valoir in French, which is uh, yeah, a possible translation for um, to cost. So here, uh, il vaut, like this car, uh, this car costs, uh, I don't care like how much. And you say in French, cette voiture, this car, cette voiture vaut, with a T. And then for the plural, it's just you, instead of the U, it's an L. And then it's the same ending. So like here, the ending is like ONS, EZ and ENT. Like if you know how to transform a verb for present, you know all these endings, those endings, so nothing special for that. Then imperfect, it's exactly the same. You remember uh, this, the endings of, um, of imparfait, imparfait. It's like E, 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 Ion, Ye, E. I'm not gonna spell it again, but you remember the stem, which is similar from the plural for present. And then you add the endings that you've learned by heart, and you've got your imperfect form of valoir. And for future, as you can see here, there is again an or, the future or, and it's vaudre, like ça vaudra, like um, it will cost, ça vaudra. So here you add the ending that again, it's always the same for the future. Future and imperfect are really easy. You just learn the endings once, and then if you know the stem, you can do everything. So for valoir, it's vaudre. You remember that. So this one was quite easy. Let's move on to two other ones, like vouloir and pouvoir, like really important verbs. Like vouloir, I want, like to want, and pouvoir, uh, to be able to, or um, can. But be careful, because in French, unlike can, 
Pouvoir is uh, not an auxiliary. So what you need to do is more to think that like it's to be able to. So here again, three stems. So P, so like you can see that as like the ouloir, ouloir category. When I say ouloir, I mean like this is ou and then war or ou and war. So here you've got different letters, but it's like ou, war. So for those verbs, again, for present and singular, you need to remember just the first letter, like V or P, and then you add EU. Like je veux, I want, je veux, you take the V and you add EU. And again, here it's like SST, but since this is like here, you've got the vowel, it's X, X, T. So here, you remember the, the endings, the correct endings, and you've got PE, JE PE, TU PE, IL PE, like same pronunciation except that here X, X, T. So here you've got the P from the first letter of pouvoir, but for uh, vouloir it's the same, you use the first letter vouloir, V, so veux, JE VEUX. And then for the plural, and the same for the imperfect, the form that you need to use, the stem, is pouv. So you just get rid of the war. So here it's, it would be for this one, vouloir, vouloir. So you take this, you take out of the war, voul. So the form here would be, the stem would be voul. And then you add the endings that are always the same, again, on, e, like e, z, and uh, e, i, e, uh, like ENT, sorry, here, ENT. And then for the imperfect, you know the endings, so you can do it. So pouv, you remember that, pouv or voul. And then for the future, like, the logic is a bit different from the two verbs, so you just need to remember. For the stem for future is like pour, pour, for uh, this one. Like to, uh, to, I will be able to. And then you add the ending, the classic ending of the future. And then you've got voudre, vouloir, voudre. Uh, like, I want, I will want. So you just remember voudre. And as you can see here, there is the R of the future. So here it's double R and here it's R. Let's move on to the next one, savoir. This one is kind of unique. Um, you need to remember, again, three stems. So the first one is C for this part of the table. S-I, S-A-I, je tu il. So here it's S, S, T. So last time I said that because there is a vowel before, it was an X, 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 T, X, X, T. But it's only true if it's a U. So be careful. I said that, but it's only with a U that you need to add X, X. Here it's um, an I. So it's, on, it's still S. So here it's S, S, T for the present, S, S, T. And then for the plural, it's still the same, on, e, e, like e, n, t. And you use the form sav, il, sav, like they know, the il, sav, with e, n, t at the end. For the imperfect, it's the same, here. And then for the future, it's like so. So you need to remember uh, that there is the u here. It's not a v, it's a u, so. So like, I will know, so, je saurai. Je saurai, I will know. So here again, the R of the future. So yeah, I didn't say, but savoir means like to know, to know. So this one is kind of unique. And another one which is unique is voir, like to see. So you need to remember uh, voir, V-O-I, and then you add the S, S-T. And then for the plural, you see that it's the same form so you hear V-O-I and you add E-N-T of that. But for nu and vu, and for the imperfect, the stem is the same, V-O-Y. So if you want to say, um, like, we were watching, like we watched, you, wanna, you can say, nous voyons, voyons, V-O-Y, and then, and then you add uh, the, 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 the ending of the imperfect nous, 
like first person plural, and it's yon. So here you've got voyons. So it would be V O Y E O N S. And be careful because it's quite similar to the form voyons, which is uh, the same person but for present. So be careful, voyons. If there is an E, it's imperfect. But the pronunciation is really similar. Voyons, nous voyons, nous voyons. Like for the second one, the E is a bit longer, but you don't really care about that. Like you can guess with the context, like when you hear it, based on the context, usually there is no, like it's the, you cannot miss it if you understand the rest of the sentence. Even for French people, sometimes you don't hear if it's the form. So don't really care about that. And then you've got the future, V-E-R-R. -R. This is the form that you need to remember. Again, the R of the future, but here it's double R. So this is all for this one. Then you've got two tricky verbs, falloir and pleuvoir. Falloir, it's like, it's difficult to translate in English, but you can translate it by uh, out to or uh, like must. But this verb is specific because there is only one person, it's il. You cannot use l, it's only il. And it's the same for pleuvoir, which means to rain. Only il. Like it's like in English, you don't say you rain, you say it rains. So here you've got um, the form for the plural, imperfect and future. So it's like faux, fal, faudre, and here pleu, pleuve. Pleuvre. So it's the same here and here, except that here there is an or. So this one, those ones are like kind of specific. You can remember it. I'm not going to explain. There is nothing to explain for those ones. But here is another verb, a really tricky one, asseoir, which is probably one of the only verb in French that you can, that have different stems for the same usage. So I'm going to just explain one usage. So here, instead of ASKI, this is one stem that you can use here. But another stem that is sometimes used is ASWA. I'm not going to explain it, but be careful. So here, I'm going to use um, one of the form, like the easiest one. So here, it's like ASYE, and then you add the S, you add the S, or you add nothing, because after a D, you add nothing. It's not T, it's like you add nothing after a D. So here, present. Then you've got the future, uh, the imperfect and the plural. The form is the same with EY. And then you've got F, acier, acier. So here, plural, uh, future with the R and then the accent. So this is uh, like, if you see only this table, it's not really tricky, but be careful because sometimes you can see other forms like a soi with O, I here instead of I, E, D. So be careful with that, but you should remember that just this table and you will be fine. And then I just talk about verbs with war at the end, but I want to talk about verbs with I, R at the end. So here, um, you've got boire and croire. So what you need to remember is like bois, bois, same here, like croix, croix. And then boire, croire, it's the same here for the future. It's like just you get rid of the E. Here you get rid of the RE, 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 RE. And the only difference is for the imperfect and the plural of nous and vous, where you need to learn by heart, it's a bit different. It's buv or quoi. So you've got um, the difference, the different endings, the different stems that you need to remember, but the logic is the same for the rest of it. And that's all for the verbs with war with a knee. So we've seen different categories, like some of them are not categories, like for this, savoir, voir, or asseoir, or even voir croire, it's a bit different. Uh, but those ones are quite similar. So what you need to remember is if like, you've got stems to remember. 
And if you remember those stems, like you need to learn them by heart, there is no logic, and you know the endings, everything will be fine and you will get it. So here, you've got the first category, avoir, then you've got valoir, and then you've got vouloir pouvoir, savoir, voir, croire, boire. I forgot to translate that, it's like to drink and this is to believe. And this is to sit. Um, so here you've got those categories. And one thing that I want to add, last thing, is if you want, if you use a verb that ends with voir, like for example, uh, prévoir, which means like to foresee, or uh, to forecast, like weather forecast, prévoir, prévoir la météo, la météo forecast. So here, prévoir, you use the same logic. So here, it's more a category of all verbs with voir, but it's not the same than this. Be careful. Well, that's all for today. I hope now you can better understand verbs with voir at the end. Hey everyone, this is Pierre from FrenchPond101.com. Today, you will learn how to pronunciate the letter OR in French like a native speaker. This is quite an annoying letter OR in French. R, R. After this lesson, you will be able to pronunciate OR like a perfect person. And you will not face this embarrassing situation where you try to say a word in, in French with OR, but you are not understand. You're not understood because you mispronounced the OR. So with this, you will be able to understand how to say OR. French OR is really different from the English OR. And this is a sound r, r, that doesn't exist in English. So this is a new consonant that you need to learn when you start learning English. This is a bit like in the word eradicate. In English, eradicate, er, ech. Er, eradicate, ech. So this is the same idea except that the or is more from the, is from the throat. So this is the big difference. We need to use our throat to use, to make this sound happen. So here are some tips for you to pronunciate that word, that letter. So this is vibrations coming from your throat and chest. Or is not something from like just your throat, like in English, or something like from your throat. It's more something like vibrating. You need to make your throat vibrate. Uh, this is something like that. Like when you do some gargling, like you put water in your mouth and you do This is the sound that you need to use. Like Try to make this sound. This is a good training for you. You can even try it with water if you want, but um, you can do it without. So try, try to understand that your throat is vibrating when you do this song. And in French, when you do angriness, like uh, an angry dog or when someone in a comic is uh, angry, we sh usually we use these letters. I guess we can also use that in English. And the pronunciation is like So we need to make this sound again the vibration of the throat, like this is the sound that a dog would make if he need to show his angriness. So this is and as you can see here, the sound G, the letter, the letter G is quite interesting to make this sound happen. Like this is the kind of the continuation of the sound G. So if you try to say G, 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 you start to feel that your mouth, your throat is vibrating. G, g, g. If you try to, to exaggerate, to force this sound, g, 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 you can make this sound happen, like the R. G, 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 g. This is like a kind of continuation of, of G. G, g. So you can, if you try to do that, you can have this sound happen in your mouth. Um, so here are four tips, like remember vibrations, this you need to make your throat vibrate, then this is a bit like goggling or when you're angry or the kind of continuation of the sound of the letter G, 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 G. 
So try to, to say that, to say uh, grr, or doing all those exercises in front of your computer. This is a good training. And here are some words. And you can try with these words. So I'm going to just pick one first. Raté, raté, raté. Raté, it's like to fail. Raté, rr, raté, raté. You can try to pronounce that. Raté, raté, to fail. Je rate, I fail. Raté, raté. So try, it's okay if you exaggerate. This is the first way to, to get used to the sound. Like, it's always exaggeration at first, and then you throw it, and you're, you will be uh, used to making this sound. So this is good. And here, let's take another example, the example of big. In French, it's grand, grand. So here you can see GR, that's why I'm taking this sound, because this is a bit like the continuation of the sound produced by the letter G. So here, it's like a kind of grr. So grand, grand. So try to say it, grand, grand. So sometimes people, when they are snoring, the sound that they make is grr. So this is like the letter R. So if you snore, maybe you are able to do this sound. Grr, grr. So here, let's have a look of all the consonants that are uh, mixed with R and the sound that is produced. So here, like this is the eight letters that can be combined with R to make a kind of sound. So we will train uh, for all these eight, those eight sounds. So first, so it's alphabetic or, or order. So here, bra, bra. This is arm. Bra, bra, bra. You need to feel the vibration here. Bra, bra, bra. So try to say it. Bra. Did you do it? You should do it. Crier, crier maintenant. Now crier, to shout, when I'm shouting. Crier, 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 crier. Okay? Next, next one is dr, droite. It means like right. Droit, 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 droit. Right. The next one is France. Like you're learning French, so you need to say uh, French, France, in English, in French. F or France, France, France. France. This is the sound that you need to remember. Then G, we've seen that before. Grr, grr, grand, grand. The next one, ready, when you're ready, prêt, you say prêt in French. Prêt, prêt, P or prêt, prêt, prêt. Vibrations. And then true, like vrai, vrai in French. Vrai, vrai, vr, vr. This is also the sound that we use in comics to, for uh, the noise made by car. Like a car that is, um, it is, a car is usually making this sound in French. I guess it's the same in English. Vr, 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 vrai, vrai, true, vrai, vrai. And the last one is tr, tr, très, like very, it's very good. Like if you're gonna say, it's very big, very big, you would say très grand, très grand, très grand, très. And sometimes, like, it's hard to differentiate dr and tr, dr, tr, dr, dr, tr. Droite, très, très droite, très droite. So try by yourself to say all those sounds. If you can manage like one by one to train that and you, if you do the sound by yourself, it's a super training for you, like you will be used to say all the common sounds with R. So this is a good training. So remember that and try to pronunciate those words. You can also find some other words that you've learned before with R and try to say it. The idea is to say it. You need to say it. You cannot just like watch a video of me saying that you need to do it yourself otherwise you will never remember your throat your mouth will never remember the sounds so you need to do that 
Here are some maybe easier sounds with vowels. Vowels. So here we've seen that before. Or a ra raté to fail. Raté raté ra. So you can try to say it. Raté raté. The next one is to redo. Refaire re re or e re re. So I know e is sometimes hard to say, but you have to say re, re, re. The next one is re, rester, to stay. So here you can see it's R E, but the pronunciation is like if there were an accent here. So it's re, re, re. So you have to say rester, re, re, re. The next one is rice, ri, ri, R E, ri. So here, be careful, the Z is silent, and here as well, the R is silent. This is only this R that is not silent. And here, so RI, 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 RI. An easy sound. And then ROCHER, like a rock. ROCHER, ROCHER, ROCHER. And then RU, RU, like street. RU, RU. So we've seen all the basic letters, all the, the basic vowels in French. But you know, in French, we've got some additional vowel sounds. Um, this is roi, rou, rang. And there are some others, but we will focus on those for now. Roi, roi. This is quite easy. If you have difficulties to say OI in French, you've got this technique. It's like ro plus A. So it's like when you say ro, A. So A in French, you know it's A, A. Like you don't say A, it's A. So if you want to read that, it's A. And this is ro, ro, a, roa, roa. So this is a way to say it, but like it's a bit different that from the way I'm saying it, roa, roa, because I'm using it uh, like I'm saying it more fluently, like roa, like it's smoother, roa, 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 like it's it means king, roa. Next one is ru, like will, ru, ru, ru. Rou, okay? And last one is rang, like it's the case for EN or AN. You know, EN and AN, it's exactly the same sound in French. Rentrer, rentrer, rentrer. So here you can see that we've got two R and even one more with, uh, but this one is silent because it's a verb. I will explain that later, silent R. So here, rentrer, rentrer, rentrer. If you can say this word, you're, it's really good because here you've got R, so this, this annoying R, but also this sound, en, which is quite hard to say, and also like a combination between one consonant, so T, with R. So if you can try this word, like this is kind of the word that if you can say it, you quite, like it means you can master, you mastered the, you've mastered the R, the R, R. So this is like some common vowels. We've got other sounds, but this is like kind of common. And if you know how to say one, you're supposed to know how to say the others if you know like another sound. So the last one, I would like you to show you three more examples. So you see here, you know how to say that in French? It's R, R, R. And this is like the letter. Because in French we don't say that R, it's R, R. So this is the sound R. And we've got words that are using this sound. So here, like when you want to say proud in French, you say fier, fier, fier. So the sound is like R. Fi, R, fi, R. And then two others, really common words, father and mother. Père, mère, père. Mer, per, mer. Again, vibrations. So here it's like the letter, the same pronunciation than when you just spell the letter. Er, per, er, per. The letter or, er, father, per. You can, can you do it? Can you try to make it? Mer, per. And you can try with other vowels if you want, like here it's P, but you can also try with T, ter. 
Ter. It means like to shut your mouth, like to be quiet. Ter, uh, ter. So this is quite interesting if you can master those examples as well. Like you should train with that. And here you've got one extra rule. Like, at, like this is concerning the silent or. Because or is sometimes silent when it's at the end of words. Only when it's at the end of words. And in two specific cases. The first one is when there is a verb from the premier group, first group. If you know what it is in French, first group. They're all ending with er. And those verbs ending with er. The or is always silent. So here, rester, to stay, rester. Or is silent, the last or. And here again, rentrer, here the or is silent. So this is the case, the first case, and the second case is premier, premier. This is, it means, it's an adjective and it means um, first. And this adjective is always silent here. And here you can see that you've got another or. So you can also train this word, premier, premier. It's like P, P, R. So premier. But you have to be careful because this silent er is like uh, there is the liaison that is used with this letter when when a letter is silent there is always this liaison this rule of the liaison it means that when there is a, vo a word starting with a vowel after a word ending with a silent or you've got to say the or so here when you want to say the first child le premier enfant Le premier enfant, you need to do that. Le premier enfant, le premier enfant. You know, this is the same sound, the same sound than here. Rang. Le premier enfant. It's like you get rid, like you get rid of this letter and you add an R here. Like you say the word premier, like if the R, the R was silent, le premier, and then you add an additional R sound here before the word. So it's like instead of saying enfant, you say renfant, renfant, here, le premier renfant. And here, this is a case where there is no vowel, le premier fils, le premier fils. So here you don't say it. So be careful, it's only when there is a vowel. Okay, so let's wrap it up. We've seen that or is some, a sound coming from your throat. This is vibrations, really important. You need to feel those vibrations. And with this, you can, like, if you want to try to mimic the sound, you can think of uh, gargling, like when you're gargling. This is the sound that you need to do. And also, like, this is the sound of angriness. And as you can see here, the continuation of the sound. The beginning of the vibration is, set, is made when you do G. And then gr, gr. And here we've seen a lot of examples like consonants with or. So br, kr, dr, fr, gr, pr, vr, tr. Okay. Can you try to do it? It's a good exercise if you can do it. And then we've seen some vowels. Ra, re, re, ri, ro, ru. But also some extra ones. Roi, rou, ran. Roi, rou, ran. And also r some words using uh, the letter or as if you were spelling it. Ech, ech, per, mer, fier. And don't forget that sometimes or is silent in two specific cases. Remember those cases. Ending of verbs, uh, verbs with um, e or at the end and premier. And with the premier in particular, there is sometimes this liaison when there is a vowel after the adjective. So, with this, you can master or. You can watch this video again if you're not sure, but also if you want to hear my accent, this is a good training, but also you can train uh, by yourself and say those words. This is really important. So that's all for these lessons. Do you have any questions? If you have questions, you can still ask on the comment section. This is really interesting for you to get answers. Mm -hmm.